そういう人いますえもしかしてみんなあの時に感じたかもしれないあ、まあ、この10年のこの10年っていうのは、まあ、一生懸命やってるじゃないですか、うん、だからその鎮魂の,そのなんだろう気持ちはあります、うん、やっぱりあの時の,さいあの災害っていうか、うん、時を思い出せばその絶望なんだけど、うん、でも10年かけてここまで来たと。うんうんでゼロだった町が三千人も住んでるんだよ。三千六百人住んでるんですよ。First, first, I was saying that, but of course, you did have those feelings at one point. You were sad, you were angry.、Um, you know, many other people are feeling angry. Some people do feel hopeless. But she's pointing out that. And that、um, sense of hopelessness is there directly after the、um, catastrophe. Um, everyone shared it, and I'm sure that everyone has this feeling still. But in these 10 years, we have come so far, and here, where there was nobody, where it was zero, now more than 3,000 people are living here. And we want to show this to everyone we are living forward、um, positively into the future. Then, what do they think? 最初の、まあ、検索からしたら誰も住まないよねっていうイメージ確かにあったと思うんです自分もでもこうやって10年経って戻って確かに死に場所に求めた人もいるしでも次の世代につなごうと思って頑張ってる人もいるし、うん、そういう場所だからあのぜひともその最初の計画を変えられるような力が欲しい。うん、全部ソー,ソーラーで埋め尽くされるのは確かに再生エネルギーって大事なんですけど、うん、エネルギーってじゃあどう,どうなのって私たちが使うエネルギーって、うん、あの日本には江戸時代っていう循環型の、ねうん、暮らし方あったじゃないですか。し<笑>かし私それもすごく、ね、大事なことで。全部なんか電気に変えなきゃいけないっていうことはないはずなの。Oh. Okay. ね、<laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure、um, directly after、um, Fukushima, everybody thought that here was, this was an unlivable place. And it's actually true that I myself also had thought so in the beginning. And yes, there were people who returned. And at the beginning, there are people who came back because they wanted to end their lives here. Um, but there are also now more and more people who are returning to、um, give it to the next generation、mm. so to、um, continue the life here.、Mm. And、um, I also think one thing I want to talk about is solar energy, and it is important to have this renewable energy, but it, it's not a solution to build solar panels all over this place. <laughs> <laughs> and,、um, as you might have heard,、um, The, in Japan, from the Edo period, there's this、um, idea of reusing and circulating energy. And I would like to suggest to think in that way and look back in our history what we can learn and reuse from our experiences. Yeah, <laughs> トピックを戻したいんですけど、yeah, the えー、でクリエイターの立場から言うと、先ほどの音楽はとても良かったと、そのイントロダクションとして。Yeah. So、to to to、um, とにかくそのスタンだったこと、悲しみをまず伝えたことは大事です。Yeah, for the first point to show、um, the sorrow,、um, despair and the feeling what people felt at that moment to show it, that is a very important thing. でも、あのトモコさんの言ったようなことも、もし最初からその、うん、希望のことを先に言ってしまうと、
but as mm. Tomoko san has said, this is not and this will not stay a place of despair. So I suggest that after um, you shouldn't start with the hope because we have to see at the reality what happened and know what people, how people here suffer. So it would be great if there could be um, a song after these three songs which expresses hope. Yes. yes. And that could be, um, I think, and that would make the message complete into a more powerful mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Um, Jaha, Sugashi comment. That's a really great comment. Um, I appreciate it. I think Katrina will appreciate it as well. Uh, and it also makes a difference if you are ever been here and met people. Koko ni kita koto aru ka nai ka wa daiji. And koni tachi aru ka wa nai ka wa daiji. And I go from this yoga. Go on. And then you are in the ね、ね、団体でいろんなやってるんだけど、本来一人一人がエネルギーをちゃんと考えてやるそのイメージ。そうなったら大規模なものが必要っていうわけじゃないはずなのね、エネルギー。自分たちがどうやったらそのエネル
more people come and visit and learn from this area, mm -hmm. from all over the world. If people use continue to use energy, yeah. we have to learn from Fukushima. Yeah. There um, are many, many so, so many things that yeah. people can learn from this uh, area. I totally agree. I'm saying I met a lot of very wise people in Fukushima. I, I think there is a lot other people can learn from many aspects of yes. people living in Fukushima, both how they lived in the past uh, and, and, and this precurrent period. <laughs> What do you want to see 10 years from now? What you're hoping for? One word, just one keyword. She's hoping for fun. She wants to see fun because she's a very fun person. Nature. 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 Yeah, and, and a wide meaning of, of nature, natural. Uh, some? Learning place. Global learning place. Learning place. Manabi no basho. 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 Manabi no Okay, great. Just so did that. Uh, well, so we're ready to hand over. Uh, Mina san ni taihen arigatousaimashita. Uh, and Katrina, let's say thanks to Katrina. Katrina san sen wa arigatousaimashita. Um, how is everything? Are we ready to hand over uh, to our uh, round table uh, over there uh, hosted in Europe? I see Ian Darby. I see Louise Elsto. I see some others. Um, I'm ready to hand over the baton. Hello. Coffee's <laughs> taken. Somebody yeah. say goodbye to the cameras. Uh huh. Say bye. Goodbye. See y'all later. See <laughs> y'all. Okay, so we're gonna. Hi on. everybody, and uh, welcome to the next part of this fantastic event. Welcome to the safe part. Can I ask everybody? <laughs> You can just ask everybody to go on mute. If you are not part of the round table, that would be fantastic. Hi, Louise. Hi. Everybody. Everybody. I'm going to say goodbye to the guys in Tokyo. Yes. Thank you for doing such a fantastic effort. Yeah. Louise, thank you so much. We're going to pass it on to you. And, you know, we're just closing the day. We're here with, you know, all the people that made it possible. And, you know, we're going to hang out. We're going to be around to, to help you, of course. But uh, we're going to going to play you. We're going to play the theme song now. Uh, make a <laughs> smile. Everybody, we're going, to, we're going to hand over to our friends in Europe. Can we all say make a smile? One, two, three. Make, make a smile. smile. It's such a good day. <laughs> Over to you, Louis. You. We're play the video, and then it's all up to you. And we'll we'll, we'll, we'll see you there. We'll see you tomorrow. Why would you send me an on this one? Moment. Just happening? Not yet. I have to share my screen. Moment. But <laughs> one second, guys. One, one second. second. Kelsey is making it happen. Kelsey has done an amazing job. She actually done the whole time. Everybody. Okay, share my screen. Yes. We're gonna share this one. We're gonna share the sound. sound we'll video clip. <laughs> and share. We're gonna hand over to our friends in Europe. Can we all say make a smile? One, two, three. Make, make a smile. smile. It's such a good like... <laughs> Over to you, Luis. Make a video. <laughs>
never can't communicate. So just make a smile and let them know that they can be happy too. If you can't help bring some not the despair to make them feel hopeful and show them that you care. Make a smile and goodness gracious. So I'm telling you, we shouldn't do that. I'm telling you, we should leave. We have to leave it here. Okay, let's do it. Sorry, everybody, we're just having some technical difficulties on the fantastic Make a Smile video. Let's keep on smiling. having some technical difficulties yes. on the fantastic make a smile video something else play. you know you go open up the preferences the and, and then go to, to the, the monitor okay peter can we try for maybe another 20 seconds? And then I'm going to suggest that we move on to the next element. I'm, I'm here, but you have to turn me on. Louise, Louise. Peter here. I, I think, for, uh, Louise, for whatever reason, please carry on. We're closing here. We would love. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you. Um, Keep on making you smile, and we'll try sometime later, maybe. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and good morning from the United Kingdom. My name is Louise Elstow. Um, and I'm a social science researcher and emergency management specialist based in the UK, along with Ian Darby, a physicist, who you can see on the screen below. Give us a good wave, Ian, please. Hello, morning. And so in typical Scottish fashion, he's crossed his arms. Um, based in Scotland, we'll be hosting the second part of this Safecast 10 event. Uh, today, we are commemorating um, both uh, sadly, the tragic events that took place in Japan 10 years ago, as well as the slightly happier emergence of SafeCast as a citizen science group who've spent the last 10 years trying to get as many people as possible to be involved with environmental um, monitoring in their own towns, cities, villages and backyards, and of course promoting the publication of open data. So I'd like to, at this point, however, take um, uh, ask everybody to invite you to take a moment to reflect in your own way about the events which led us here today 10 years ago in Japan. So if I can just um, ask for everybody to take a moment silence just to reflect on that please.
Thank you very much. We hope that you've enjoyed the uh, SafeCast ride, the event so far, and thank you so much, Asby. Um, you guys have had a sort of whistle-stop tour um, around Fukushima, visiting friends and colleagues uh, along the way. A huge thank you to um, the SafeCast team based in Japan, not only in Fukushima, you saw the team there, um, various musicians and, uh, and, and friends and colleagues based in Tokyo who've been doing a great job um, on the production so far. So we leave them uh, and uh, some of the colleagues in Fukushima enjoying a well-earned break as I know they had a very late night and a very early start this morning. Um, hopefully they'll be celebrating and having just a, a cold drink, but we'll be back to catch up with um, uh, Asby, who I can see is enjoying a cold drink on the side there, um, Asby and Peter and some of those guys at the end of our round table. So now our SafeCast Roundtable, um, we hope to have gathered together a range of fascinating guests, citizens, academics, scientists, engineers, advisors and industry professionals, just to name a few. Each have their own area of expertise um, and actually many of them hold many of those hats all together, so they might be anyone or any number of those, um, those things at the same time. So it's important to be able to get a wide range of uh, views and opinions on the different topics that we're going to cover. So we hope that um, our guests are going to help us explore some key issues and themes that have emerged globally around the broad theme of citizen science and radiation monitoring. And over the next few hours, we'll be co covering a host of topics which include how some organisations have become involved with SafeCast and radiation monitoring and citizen science in general, whilst others have not. Transparency and ethics in radiation monitoring radiation and mental health, SafeCast's impact on policy and other international discussions. And then we'll round it off thinking about what good might look like if this were to happen again, um, unfortunately elsewhere. So our first session is going to be shepherded by my co-host Ian Darby and with him at the SafeCast table. So um, if you're about to come on and I say your name, if I can ask you to turn your, um, your camera on. He has three guests, Dan Blumenthal, Peter Bossov, and Peter Kucha. They will be exploring over the course of the next uh, 50 minutes the topic of measurement and data from citizen science devices. Um, Ian, I'm going to hand over to you now, but I'll keep an eye on the questions. So I would encourage anybody who's watching on the uh, SafeCast YouTube channel, if you um, are engaged with the session and have a question, please do remember to um, ask that and put it in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on that. I know we also have some attendees um, and panelists um, in the audience on the Zoom call. You can, of course, um, use uh, the chat function here and the question and answer function um, on the SafeCast uh, Zoom. So please do that. Ian, I'll be back over to you um, just before the end of the session with any of the questions that have come through. Thank you, Louise. I see that we are having some slight Zoom difficulties, so we're just going to have to take a minute or two to wait for Peter, Dan and Peter to manage to get their videos and microphones up and running. And if we can then have the, the spotlight on myself and the panellists. So there's Dan. Hi, Dan. Let's spotlight. Get two. Uh, yep, there's Peter. Hello, Peter. We can't hear you yet. And we're just waiting on, on Peter, who I know is around. Hello. Do you hear me? Oh, yes. There we go. And um, ah, excellent. So, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Ian Darby. Uh, I've had uh, some interaction with SafeCast over the years, much more since 2018 when I became a technical volunteer. Uh, I'm just going to take a second just to uh, quickly say a few words about our, uh, the panel and then they can introduce themselves when, when they further if they need to, when the time comes for them to speak. So we have Dan Blumenthal, who is going to open the session for us. Dan is with USDOE and has got a really interesting history of interaction with uh, the events at Fukushima and thereafter. Uh, Peter uh, from the Czech National Radiation Protection Institute in Prague uh, has done, really done a, a, an extensive amount of uh, measurements with uh, the big eye and nanos and lots of data. So 
you look on the SafeCast map, which uh, Peta uh, has conveniently shown a zoomed in region uh, with lots of data. And you can see behind uh, both Dan and I, uh, the European map uh, and a rather funky layout showing so lots of the measurements that are made. So uh, the, the way that we're going to structure this conversation is the, the title is Measurement and Data for Citizen Science Devices. Uh, basically, this starts with a measurement device and then we go and collect some sort of trusted device. How do we collect the data? So the, the question in our mind as we're, as we're going to talk through this is uh, we would like to make better use of the data for official decisions. And therefore, what would it take for citizen science devices to collect data that could be used uh, in uh, an official capacity during emergencies and for other purposes. But before we get there, uh, as we're taking over from Japan, and just to kind of set the scene for the day entirely, uh, I've asked Dan if he would uh, you know, give us the, the, the origin of the story and maybe start with uh, why uh, the data that were, were in the beginning were somewhat inadequate and safe cast came into existence. So I'm going to start by handing over to Dan for the for the first period of time. So please, Dan. That, you're, you're very quiet, Dan. Quite quiet still. So we can just take a maybe well done. Maybe well done is a working out these technical difficulties. I could ask Peter and Peter to, to, to just quickly say a few words about themselves. So uh, Peter Bossu, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to, to for inviting me. Um, it's a great program. I really enjoyed it for the last hours. And well, it's up to Ian now to ask the question and steer the discussion actually. And uh, do you expect us to, pre to present ourselves or? Yeah, you can maybe just say a, a quick word or two about your history. We're, we're actually just waiting to see if Dan, uh, if Dan manages to resolve any technical problems. It's still very faint, Dan. Is it, is it faint for everybody else? Yes, it is from my end. No, no, not much, a little. Sure. So, uh, of course, this was thoroughly tested a good half an hour beforehand, but gremlins like to strike when, when things look at, you know, at the most opportune moment. Um, Peter, would you like to give a, a word or two of introduction about yourself? Uh, well, uh, I have been working in the field of, do you hear me? Yes, I can. You hear me? Yeah, fine. So uh, I have been working for almost 40 years in the branch of radiation protection and special emergency preparedness and response on developing, both developing methods and to, uh, recommending equipment measuring devices and so on, how to deal with them. Uh, five years ago, or maybe maybe even seven years ago, uh, when the safecast devices became public available, we decided to uh, start a, a national wide program of uh, say improving knowledge and uh, of the public of on radiation uh, and in general and especially radiation protection and uh, emergency preparedness. Because uh, we believe that what is the base is that uh, if, uh, if the people must, be, the public must believe you. And it's much better if the public believes you, not because you are, a, say, only authority, but they believe you because they understand what you are telling them and they know the consequences and they, then it's not only blind or obey, obey the orders, but understand and voluntarily obey the orders. 
Yep. Uh, so I, th I think, Dan, are you back with us now? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can We can hear okay, you now. Yeah. So can, can we just no spotlight way. Dan again, please? Okay, so sorry for the technical difficulties, and uh, over to Dan to give the, 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 uh, the set in the scene for us, please. Okay, so uh, we uh, I'm from the US Department of Energy, and we uh, sent a, a small team over to Japan. Uh, shortly after uh, March 11th, we arrived on the 16th of March, and our, our assignment was to make uh, wide area environmental measurements. Uh, we have specialized teams at the Department of Energy that can do uh, large scale aerial radiological surveys. So we, we mount large, very sensitive radiation detectors on aircraft. Uh, we used helicopters and airplanes in Fukushima that were from the United States Air Force that we worked closely with. And, and we set about uh, making detailed measurements because you could see the, where the, the tsunami went and you could see the effects of the, the wreckage, but you couldn't see where the radioactive material was that was uh, released from the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. Um, and you could make individual measurements with survey meters, but that's like taking an initial look uh, under a, a microscope or you know, a telescope, and, as opposed to just seeing the big picture. And we wanted to see the, the whole picture uh, quickly and, and safely. So I'll just show you, it's kind of like developing a picture. And initially we, um, this is the, after the first 3Ds of, of measurements, our teams were um, down south near Tokyo. And then you can see Fukushima is up here. And you can see where radio material was released and deposited on the ground uh, to the, the northwest of the power plant. So this, this uh, graphic was posted on the Department of Energy website on, on March 22nd. So it was the first snapshot and about crude snapshot of, of where the radioactive material was deposited uh, on the ground. And it was uh, initially um, used to refine the evacuation and, and relocation decisions uh, that the, the Japanese government was uh, you know, ha making. Um, so I said, it's kind of, this was the first picture and then over time, and this is a very large area. So you can see it, the, the most outer circle goes out to 80 kilometers. So over time, we could fill in the picture or you could say, you know, develop it more, I'll move over a little bit. Um, as we, we collected more and more data, we could fill in the picture and you could see the extent of where radio material was deposited on the ground. And our, our task was to determine where the material was, how much there was, so you could determine if it was a hazard if people had to relocate, um, and what kind of material, since different radioactive material um, is, is diff hazardous in different ways, uh, whether it's you know, cesium, iodine, different radioactive materials uh, have different health concerns for the public and for the environment. And so this was also uh, posted on the DOE website for all to see and, and share. And, and by this time, so this was, um, by the, the first week of April. And then we had uh, filled in the picture. This is kind of the, the final picture uh, that we did collectively with the Japanese government. So our counterparts, we both collected data. We had a joint team that collected and analyzed this data with uh, US technical teams of scientists and pilots, and then a Japanese technical team with their equipment and their aircraft. And we merged all the data into this map, which was then used to refine those uh, relocation decisions. And you can see up to the Northwest, uh, all the areas in yellow were determined to be where people had to uh, relocate and couldn't come back for at least uh, the first year. So after we uh, left, you know, measurements continued and uh, safe cast, uh, Continue, uh, there was, and you know, Ian and others will talk about when the, the timing of the safe cast measurements, but just to make a good segue into safe cast measurements, which were 
being developed in, in parallel and independently. But we took our data and, and shared it with the SafeCast team and they created it as a data layer in the SafeCast map. So this is just a screenshot from the SafeCast map today. You can go to the SafeCast website and there's a different layers of radiation measurements that you could see. And you can turn off the SafeCast data and turn on this uh, DOE aerial survey data. And it shows that fully developed wide area picture. So it's, it's coarse uh, because we are flying a thousand feet over the ground, um, but it gives you that wide area picture relatively quickly compared to making all those individual measurements. That kind of sets the stage on, on the initial measurements and how that picture was developed of the radiological environment. So thank, thanks very much, Dan. I think that's, that's really informative and especially the fact that the SafeCast map has got the DOE data, uh, data layer in it. So obviously official data can be used by other people, but the other way around is a, seems to be a bit more challenging. Uh, so maybe we can first that, you know, the, 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 are the devices really any different? So uh, perhaps I could ask Peter uh, if you would be, like to just uh, give some explanations into really what the difference between the big IG Nano that SafeCast used and what would otherwise be classed as an official measurement device. So uh, would you like to start off that conversation, please, Peter? Uh, <clears throat> well, the, the, dif the main difference is not in the device. The device uh, used uh, the same physical principles, the say, <clears throat> A very, a very similar detector, of course, the SafeCast, uh, as uh, is, it was being built for public use, so it cannot use the um, uh, high sophisticated selected electronics because it, was, it would be ter terribly expensive. But the SafeCast used the same Geiger Miller detectors as many of the <coughs> official detectors used uh, uh, and use very similar electronics. But what is important is the methods of measurement. In the official monitoring teams must have uh, approved uh, methods of measurement to get comparable results. But the SafeCast uh, or the citizen monitoring use, uh, say, basically similar methods of measurement, but not on the base. You must do it exactly how it is in the methods. But please try to do it as close to the recommended methods as possible. For example, the official measure, <laughs> method is measure one meter above the ground. The citizen monitoring method is measure uh, at, <laughs> as close as one meter above the ground as under local conditions possible. So the, this results into a much higher uncertainty of uh, the citizen monitoring results. Yeah. So, would, it, so, so, we, so, yeah, so would anyone say that that's wrong? Pardon? Would, why, why, why would somebody say that that's wrong? I mean, it, you know, that it no, sounds no, to me it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not saying it's wrong. It's only says that it's not as precise as the, uh, of, as the measurements based on approved methods. And the result for this, say, not hundred, not hundred percent comparable, is different conditions of measurement. So uh, the result is that you simply cannot uh, compare directly the numbers if the safe safe cast say twenty, uh, uh, and the official uh, monitor uh, measurements say fifteen or twenty five or maybe in ten or thirty. It means it's it's comparable. Yeah, because you, the safe cast say 20 plus minus, not negligible. It's not, uh, it's not, not, it's nothing against the safe cast. The safe cast can play, or the citizen measurement can play a very important role in the process of emergency preparedness because the capabilities of the monitoring, professional monitoring teams are limited. And the safe cast can collect a lot of data, which can help in effective management of the exploiting of the professional teams so that the professional teams will be sent to that places where it's really important to measure the data not and not to the places where there the where the safeguard measurements prove that there is almost nothing or the safeguard measurements can uh, find some 
uh, not expected higher values, which can be reason for sending them professional monitoring teams to approve it. Yeah? But basically, uh, only on the results of citizen monitoring, it's not possible to adopt any decision about protective measures, especially a real hard protective measures like relocation or and so on. So, okay. I, um, Peter, I was going to mention, I talked about the precision. Um, so the initial measurements that I showed, um, there, there was a, you know, un, a lot of uncertainty, uh, but we, we calibrated so we knew the uncertainty, even if it was plus or minus 50% in the, the beginning, but we knew what it was. And so we could, um, inform decision makers that here's the number and it may be bigger or smaller. The, the one thing about what, what Peter said is for the citizen measurements, they'll have some uncertainty, um, but we don't know what it is because there's both systematic and you know random un uncertainty. I mean, over time, it can probably be well understood. Uh, so what's the range of how people will use the citizen measurement devices. And so we can get a good understanding of that, but it's the, the sort of the uncertainty in the uncertainty is we don't know exactly how the measurements are, are made. So, I, I mean, you know, the way, the way the conversation goes there is it's the, the difference between the procedures and then, you know, Measurement science is easy when there's something to measure, but it's more difficult when there's not. So I'm just wondering if Peter, you know, because I know your background is in uh, working with norm and you know naturally occurring levels. So I mean, what what's really the good scenarios for using a device like Safecast? I mean, the, the emergency response scenario when there's something strong there to measure, you know, you can see why you know you'll get a response immediately from the device. But I mean, how far does this go? Is it the, the a lot of the data in the safe gas map is not from Japan, it's from other places. You are measuring what is effectively background levels. Is you know you, you want to share any thoughts you have on using the, the safe gas device and the data that's in the map for, for norm purposes. Uh well <coughs> uh, Peter Bosso, sorry. Uh, my, sorry, my bad pronunciation oh, of Peter oh, oh, and Peter. <laughs> yeah, fine. I, sorry, I was please, wondering please, please, uh, distinguish clearly Peter and Peter. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, thanks, Arne. Well, uh, just to introduce myself shortly, I'm coming from theoretical physics and mathematics and statistics, actually. So I have a dif different approach, actually. I'm not a practitioner in that sense. Um, what are, interests me in this context is data interpretation. Um, you, you, you get a reading from the, from, from the big IG. What is it? What does it stand for? How can you interpret it? Does it represent the objective situation at the point where you are standing or what is it? Uh, Pete, uh, Petr <laughs> and Dan al already addressed uh, the, the, the methods of precision. And Dan, Dan shortly spoke about accuracy, which is the systematic component, which is the nastier one actually, because the precision, uh, which is the uncertainty, you know, can be traced to, to, to the, the instrument, it's the behavior of the instrument itself, plus its usage. And the usage of the instrument by, let's call them lay people, not professionals, this is a, this is a real problem because we do not know how to use it. So uh, do they, how do they carry it? You know, if, they, if, if, if you take the, the peak IG, can you see it? No, not really. The, 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 the default, uh, orientation is this, but many people use it this way, where it has a very different response, for example, or somehow like this. So this is, uh, this, 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 this is a source of, of uncertainty, which comes from the, from the handling of the, of, of, of the device. And then you have the, 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 the accuracy issue, so the systematic component. Because, because um, uh, the, 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 unfortunately, the peak IG is not very well characterized metrologically. You know? So people measure, they get some, some values, but it's difficult to say what they are actually, because why we, we do not know about internal background, we do not know about cosmic response and things like this. 
calibration is not documented very well and so on. So, so we have a lot of sources of, 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 of um, systematic uh, uh, uncertainty, which we try, we, uh, Petra and myself and, and colleagues, we are performing uh, experiments with the people Picagi in order to, to to find out about these co components, but it's 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 a slow it's it's slow and it's difficult. It's not easy, you know, and and, and for because because the, the the components are not very well characterized, you know, and and that's why it's so, it's so, really so Peter. So you you're saying what, what limitations does that place on using the data from these devices in, a, in an official capacity? Yeah. So if, if someone wants to make it. An actionable decision based on safe gas data. No, I, I would. I would as, 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 no, as Petra said, that this is very difficult. You know, what are possible decisions? Because you know, one, one objective of measurement of, of using citizen science, citizen surveying, is to to confirm or to verify so-called official measurements. You know, so because there is, for good reasons, in some in some cases, there is distrust in mistrust in authorities, and people want to verify and confirm what what, what, what they get. Uh, and and this is in the end a decision. What I measure does it conform to this uh, so-called official measurements or not? And this is a decision, yes or no. And this decision is very very complicated. It's with, with the knowledge which we have about the behavior of the big IG, it's practically impossible. The second thing is if you if you do some measurements, as you see behind me, this is Berlin. This is a part of Berlin which is which you see behind me. Um, I used it for. Um, Three years now. When did you give it to me, Peter? I don't know. Three years or two years. I think ago. from three, 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 three years, years yeah. ago. And I have I, I've been performing a lot of experiments in low radiation areas, you know, in order to see what how it reacts really. And and you see patterns, you know, if, if you look into the safe cast map, except you know Chernobyl or, or Fukushima, the most part of the world is just blue or, or dark blue or, or light blue. But if you look closely, as, 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 in, as in not counting much, depends on your color scale. So what you mean is that there's a low count per second. All right, but 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 you see a pattern. But how to interpret the pattern? This is the real problem because because and 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 this is really connected to the behavior of the instrument, and 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 this and and the and the, 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 the concept of preciseness and accuracy. You know, and this is I am afraid to say it's unresolved really. So I, I, we've got a couple of interesting questions coming through to us from, uh, from, from YouTube. So please feel free to ask. Uh, there's a, uh, someone, Hubert Lalashi is, is asking, uh, Pe Peter from uh, Sudo is trying to, you know, so I, can you give advice to people who have got a, a safe cast detect, a big agar or, a, or a, a similar device to, to improve their way of using the device so that their measurements are, what, you know, in air quotes, which I won't do because it's, you know, it's silly. But to make them more usable, and you know, he's got a follow-on question: Is well, what's the difference between the you know what's the order of magnitude difference between the official devices and these home-built DIY devices? Just before you answer, I, I'll, I'll chip in myself. Remember, the components are the same. Where where the discussion so far, hope, I mean, hopefully, we'll go into a little bit more. Is it's as long as we understand the uncertainty, we can decide how we're using whether the data that we've collected is fit for a decision we want to make. Right. Uh, neither the map that I mean the map that's behind uh, Peter Bosu is is not wrong, but it depends on what you're choosing to do with that map to make that decision. So I, I'll, I'll come back to to Peter there just to um, to to respond to the kind of advice on using the instruments and and maybe I, I, after Peter's finished, Dan, you can jump in. I think you have a comment you want to make. So please, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, one of the, the main problem of uh, performing measurement on, by safe cast and norm, normal situation is that all uh, calibration we were able to find in the literature uh, do, do, not, do not use uh, those rates below some one or mostly two microsieverts per hour, which are values which is in normal situation uh, not reached, never. Of course, there are some special areas in, in the uh, <coughs> earth where there are some higher uh, natural background. But in Europe or even in Japan, uh, this, uh, not around Fukushima or not around Chernobyl, you will never meet more than about half microsievert per hour as, a, as the highest value. And we have no calibration data about uh, this low, low, dose, low dose rate region. 
So what we can do is only comparison of the safe cast with the uh, <coughs> professional with or with other other devices just in just in the field. Uh, we have no possibility to compare the calibration. Yeah, but nevertheless, if you have performed a, a uh, good amount of measurements, you can get uh, some idea about how the situation in the reason look like. And so based on this, you can uh, try to find some differences in, in case if, or if something happened. Well, uh, by, by the way, during the five years or maybe seven I mentioned for our project with the public, uh, yesterday we got uh, the, <coughs> the number of uh, six thousand uh, tracks provided to the safecast map just from the small country in the in the middle of the Europe. Well, so, uh, but uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, I am telling this because uh, what I feel as a um, main, uh, much important usage uh, of the safecast is for educa educating the public in the field of radiation and radiation protection. And because if the people uh, we provide the people uh, the devices to the people free of charge for a few months or so, they perform measurements, provide us data, and we always discuss. We have the basic idea: if you find anything, uh, in, say interesting or maybe not expected, just just first contact us, and we will discuss with every user and uh, try to explain him what can be the reason for such higher values, what it can mean for his personally when, when he was in the place where it, where it was measured, what it can, what consequences it can, it could, it could mean for, uh, for the area. And my, my feeling is that uh, this is uh, rather successful because the, for the people, uh, for the lay people, it uh, starts not to be only a one number, which say, I don't know if, if the official limit is 20, so then it, uh, they, they understand that it does not mean that 19999 is perfect and 20001 is terrible and will kill you immediately, uh, not only you and all your, all your family and, and so on and so on. So uh, I think that in this, in this field, the safe cast is really useful because the people can do can uh, get insight into the measurement, can see yes, okay, under normal situation, on the same place I can measure such values or such values or uh, other, other, other values if there are a sunny nice day, other values if there is uh, raining. They, uh, we, have, we have a map of say interesting so, points so in the better. they can higher those rate. So this, uh, I think that this is the goal, what we can get. And of course, if something happens. Uh, Pe Peter, I, I, I just want to catch, you, yeah, you, you I, said I, something there, but you, I just want to catch you so that, that, that it's, to, to, to just not move away from the use of the detectors right now. You, you said there's something that was interesting, and perhaps Dan will comment on it, is because it goes back to why Safecast originally it came about, is that you know someone goes to a particular location and makes a measurement, and they're going to compare that measurement with what somebody else is telling them. And this is this, you know, it's the same business. Can can the detector be used for official purposes? But the the citizens are using the are using the do it yourself detector to decide whether or not they believe that the official measurement is true. And, and you know, I, I think uh, can Dan can I ask you to, to jump in here because this is you you mentioned in the comments there, you know, just about the yeah. the, the the lower uncertainties where there's higher higher radiation readings. But I think yeah. you know this issue of individuals using their own detector. The other way around, so that they believe what the government, what the official source is saying, rather than us persuading the official them to use the, the citizen data. Right. So even in our measurements, and I put back to the initial map that we created, uh, the the rates were were relatively high, and so there were many effects that in normal environmental background surveys that we do, you have to worry about a lot of low level effects, whether it's you know radon or cosmic rays um, and all sorts of uh, minor corrections. But with the, the higher rates, those effects were small. So the, the picture that we were having, you know, gave a good representation. And same with the safe cast, like uh, Peter showed, you know, different orientation of the detector. When you have the 
the much higher uh, rates than I think the those efficiencies and uh, field of view uh, issues are are smaller, um, um, at least in a you know relative sense. So for these initial situations, you know, after emergency where there's um, you're worried about health, I think the the you know official measurements as you're calling them and the citizen measurements probably are just going to be closer because any differences in the, the systematics or other uncertainties will just be small compared to the absolute number that you're measuring. And then like for example, the safecast map that I showed earlier, the the DOE data and the safecast data, I mean they're they're very consistent. Uh, so that that's also a, a good takeaway message. I mean, so, uh, yeah. Peter, please. Yeah, this, this, this is of course true if, you, if, you, if you're talking about high dose rates, so as you have in the Fukushima zone or in Chernobyl. Following an emergency, yes. If, yeah, and, you know, in these situations, as you because as you correctly say that in the limit of high dose rates, right, you know, the systematic components, they, they disappear. But it's not so in, 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 in low dose rate right areas. And, and as right. a matter of fact, most of, of safe cast readings, they come from low dose areas, as, as you can see behind me, for example, you know. And people, that this is what I hear, people try to interpret this data. So, so and, and, and then I just can repeat my, I can only repeat my question. What does it, if you have a reading, say, 105 uh, micro sievert, uh, nano sievert per hour. This, this is what, what, what the instrument says. How does it relate to the objective true situation in the point where you are sitting? And this is a very non-trivial question because if you, if, you, if you do it very professional, you will find probably not 105, but you find 75. So which is correct? And, 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 and I mean, I, I'm not going into this uh, discussion because this would be a lecture of one week actually, but, 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 but so, so I, I, promise, <laughs> I promise to I am not, not going into physics here, but, 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 but I, I just want to say that it's not trivial, this, this question. So if you get, if, because people tend to believe if you have this nice instrument, they have a reading and they tend to think that what it says is, the, is, 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 is an accurate plus minus some, some statistical fluctuation of the, of the objective true dose rate. And this is not true. And, 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 and at the moment, unfortunately, we do not have any recipe about this. We can just say, be, be careful with this data. And, and, yeah, maybe it's not a very positive <laughs> well, you know, message, look, but it's it, 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 the fact, you know. I, I think, I mean, uh, you know, I, th I think it's certainly true. I can, you know, I, so just to participate is, is, is what my response would, to that would be is, is you know, I, 105 and 75, I say that's the same thing because, it's, you know, uh, I think what's really important yeah. is, and, and if any of my uh, colleagues, I, I I, I, I'm often called, you know, Mr. Uncertainty is I always like a number with an uncertainty because that tells me what I can use the number for. Uh, and I think some of these instruments are, 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 are valid for these purposes. I always come back to the fact that it's it's built in, you know, it's the same kit. It's it, we're, we're talking about the differences between the, the reproducibility of using it and, and people having confidence in it. But the, the, the basic components of the, of the safe cast detector are the same basic components of a number of different instruments that you can buy that have a pancake sensor probe in it. It's, it's you know, whether they're handled correctly and whether somebody else can pick up the instrument and go to the same place and measure the same thing in a reproducible manner that leads you to have confidence in, in the signal. The, this, you know, I like to be a physicist, come back to it. I want to measure something in the real world and I want it to tell me something about the real world. Um, I, we're, 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 we're cracking through time. So I, I'd like to, you know, the, uh, earlier at the very start of this, uh, and if anyone is not, you know, didn't, wasn't up, you know, very early in the morning to see the, the, the lovely announcement of the air note, um, you know, there's new devices coming out. Uh, the big Aggies getting to be, able, you know, it's, it's it's an older device now, and there's new electronics and different ways of doing things. So the, the question I've got is, you know, if we're doing, you know, like, you know, God forbid that anything this should happen like this again, but uh, if we wanted to create uh, maps and use the maps, pizza for the low, say the 
create collecting background. And I know Peter Kutcher talks about this. One of the advantages of the system is to can we collect the data before the emergency so that you you know you've got a large large well of data to be able to use. So what do we have to do with the citizen science approach to the data that we can tag it with a quality assurance process that says to the bigger audience, well, here you've got this resource and this is what you can use it for. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I open that up as a, as a for, for, for going forward to the future, you know, you know, Ray announced, uh, you know, AirNote and there's going to be a version of AirNote that's got a Geiger tube in it. So what, what do the citizen scientists want to do from the outset to get themselves a quality assurance process that means that they can hand that data over and we're going to touch on this several times during the day in different conversations. So uh, I, I, maybe Peter, I'll start with you as to, as to go back to it. What do you think a good quality assurance process for this data looks like? Which Peter? Yep. Yep. You, that, 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 uh, yes, you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I, I would say that the the. the um, actually, I, I mean, uh, because I, I was a little bit negative before, I like the peak Geiger because this is a great, uh, you know, it's, it's a great achievement, really, in spite of all its deficiencies, it, it, which it has. But it's 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 the best which is on the market actually for for on affordable options. But um, I, I think the first message is that the people should measure. Uh, according to some rules, which means, as Petr said before, one meter above ground and the instrument vertical, so the, 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 the axis of the, of the pancake horizontal. So this is the first thing. Uh, 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 I think this, this is the most important. The, the second thing, this is the data, the interpretation of what comes out. And we, we, we cannot give recipes because uh, um, first you, you, you cannot e easily correct the data to something which is objectively true. Because it depends on the altitude above sea level, it, it depends about air pressure, it depends on, 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 on I, I don't know what, you know, and, and the geomagnetic latitude and um, certain things. So, so we, we, we are working on this really. So maybe in a year or two, we will be able to, 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 to give some, some, some easy, simple formula. What can you do? How, how do you reduce this, this measured value? To some objective value, but at the moment we can't. I'm afraid. You're on mute, Ian. No, I know. Yes, I get the T-shirt. I'm on mute, and um, so I can see Louise chipping in from the side. A important thing I've, I forgot. So accuracy and uncertainty, but it's in reference to standards. You know, there are official guidance as to the decisions that can be made about uh, different pieces of data. So I mean, objectivity is is is, quote Louise is very is depends on the exact situation. Uh, we are we are almost out of time before, before we can kind of wrap up to move on. I'd just like to uh, quickly uh, flick over to Peter and to uh, Dan. You know, is that you know on the on the general theme of you know measurement uh, the measurement and the data from citizen science devices. You know, uh, what's your what's your what's your parting thoughts that you'd like people to leave this session with? I have a short note. Yeah, please. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it, it, it would maybe sound like advertising. Well, uh, in one of our projects, we are developing uh, something like a new ver Czech version of SafeCast, which will be used most of the basic principles of SafeCast, the similar detector, the same case, the same data format, but a bit improved uh, GPS module and a few other uh, few other. Uh, features. Uh, we expect that we will be able to produce some one, one, about 1,000 such units in next two or three years. And uh, uh, the, so we expect we will distribute them in the Czech, mostly in the Czech Republic to citizens, to say some volunteer fire, fire brigades, major of small villages, and so on and so on. So we will improve uh, the num number, number of measurements and maybe we will, we can you, you in this process we can uh, perform some work in the field of calibration and quality assurance with uh, on a say uh, a rather large basis of devices, not only one or two. 
Uh, by the way, I have heard some rumors from GitHub that the distribution of the Safecast Baby Nano will be almost, uh, almost stopped. Do you know something about it? I, I don't, but I suspect this was the right place to ask that question. There'll be a flurry of answers uh, on various uh, chat channels that are, I, I, I'm not going to look to my computer at the left. I'm sure it's, uh, it's lighting up on fire, but uh, I, I, in an interest of time, I think I, if, 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 it's very interesting to hear the, the, the project that you're talking about there, uh, Peter, but uh, can, I, can I just uh, throw over to Dan just to, to hear your uh, kind of, you know, remarks at the end, please? Sure. Um, you know, if we look at the, the map behind Peter, I mean, I think one of the strengths of the citizen measurements, if something were to happen, is I think from a response perspective, not the normal background measurements, um, but if something were to happen in a location, then it, you do have some existing background to compare to, but also if something were to happen, then you can have citizen measurements occurring immediately before any official measurements can be made. So official decisions can start you know, to get a decision makers can start to get a sense of what the environment looks like, you know, what they're up against, because our measurements were relatively rapid, but still took a lot long time to, to get that picture that you see behind me. So the citizen measurements can be there, you know, rapidly and also set the stage for, you know, comparing before and after is even if they do have uncertainty, as we've all talked about, um, presumably that if they, they measure some background and then they measure something afterwards, you know, you're, it's a comparison. So you'd be, uh, you know, maybe factoring out some of the systematic uncertainties. You're just looking at a ratio, like how much worse is it after an incident versus before? So they, they have, a, you know, a couple of good strengths, I think. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, 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 yeah, please, Peter. No, I, I, I agree with this, you know, and this is this is one of the strengths of citizen monitoring that you can produce lots and lots and lots of data, as also Petra said in the beginning, you know, which are, which, which an institution is never able to do, of, of course, you know, in this amount. But but uh, so so this this is really the, the the benefit of such system, and this is the the, the great achievement, really. So I appreciate that, um, and it can be used um, somehow as a comparison before and after, you know, because, you know, whether, because, the, 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 you know, in, in, in statistical language, this, this, this um, uh, amounts to signal detection, you know, whether you have a signal or not. And, 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 and deciding about the presence of a signal in a, in a data set, this is a quite, as you probably know, not so easy, unless the signal is so strong that it's ab above any doubt, it's beyond doubt, then it's easy. But but if you have weak signals, then 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 it's difficult. And if you, if you if you for example if you go into the the Safecast map and you zoom into Berlin or this is in particularly East Berlin, which is what you see behind me, you will will find a number of anomalies really, which I which I found when I I, I did this by bicycle actually. This is my my sport so to say. I I, I mounted on the bicycle and then I <laughs> during the during the lockdown. Uh, uh, season, I, I, I cycled to Berlin in order to just to map Berlin, and and I, I did find a lot of anomalies. And you will see it if you if you zoom into the map, you will, will see it. And we we we, we, we actually we, we were looking for what was happening there, and we found the reasons in in most cases. But but um, uh, still still I'm, I I would warn against uh, um, uh, interpreting the numbers. To to uh, as a truth in that sense, you know, it, it is a qualitative indication, but it's not a truth. In the, I mean, you, you would have to go really very much into statistics in order to 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 to, to explain this correctly, but which we cannot do. But uh, it's just a warning, really. I mean, maybe I I may add a, a, an almost trivial remark to Petro before. Uh, the big the big guy, unfortunately, it has no CE certificate, as you know. So therefore, formally, it is well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm in the UK now, so I'm not going to talk about CE certificates. So just, no, but careful. at least you know what it means <laughs> that it's formally illegal to import into the European Union, really, because there's no CE certificate. Yeah, um, yeah. So, 
Uh, so uh, so I, I, I'm going to I'm going to have to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to step in now because we're, we're, I've got I, I've been given the nod and I've, we've got a few minutes and we're going to we're, we're, we're going to keep this in time so we have a good chair. Um, so there was there was just kind of two things I I, I wanted to pick out. One thing we haven't really talked about uh, and actually somewhat remiss of us is the strength of so many measurements being made. I mean, I think one of the things that the Safecast map talks about is you know, it's 160 million plus measurements. But however you count this. Uh, one of the challenges that always came back to Safecast that I heard was, you know, malicious actors, misuse of data, someone, you know, t- measuring with a source or because they misuse the detector, you get a hotspot when none exists. I don't think there's particularly, you know, there are anomalies in the map, but the anomalies tend to show up something that's true, uh, true although Louise will tell me off for saying what is truth. You know, you see x-ray detectors, you see, uh, I think in the map, you can see where people go into museums and the, the, the detector is still left on and passes through an X-ray scanner. But in general, there's so many people and so many measurements being made that actually, the, while there may be noise on truth, uh, the true picture does emerge. It is, it, the signal is in there to see, and it can it can be extracted and used. Um, because we've got a chat channel going as well, I, have, I've got the, I can see the thing from, from Dan, and actually I think you should, you should say this out loud, Dan, is that, you know, uh, let's you know, thinking about uh, what, the, what the future is. So I, I will, I can see Louise, so that's my, my prompt, but I think I'm going to give the last word of this session to Dan and maybe you can uh, espouse the thought that you put in the chat channel there, please. Sure, I thought of it since someone asked if the, the VGAGI, you know, itself was going away. So, and, and Petr talked about building a new and improved system. So maybe the future of, you know, citizen science at, at the SafeCast level isn't the actual hardware. But you know, talk, the, the methods, the data management, quality control standards that we've been talking about here. So if we you know promulgate those worldwide, then anybody, it's just like you know, all cell phones, right? You know, talk to each other. It doesn't matter who made it. So we come up with some standard or, or guidance. Standard sounds too prescriptive for citizen science, but some guidance. So. We can all be interoperable and, and share whomever makes the the actual piece of hardware. So thanks, Dan. And you can see we're being ushered towards the door. So but, but, but I'm going to I'm going to claim my two and a half minutes. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Peter, uh, Peter and Dan very much for participating in this discussion. It's where you can t- you can probably tell we've enjoyed doing it. I hope everybody else uh, that observes it. If, there, if there's anybody out there and we're not just talking into the void, uh, also enjoyed it. Uh, you will notice from the programme, several of these themes will come back uh, again, particularly Dan and I will be back together at the end, thinking about what the future looks like uh, and thinking, you know, uh, uh, should such an incident happen again. And some of the some of these same themes on the use of the data and what it can be there will, will re-emerge. Uh, there were some questions, uh, particularly relating to education and uh, how people react to the detectors. What I would like to say is we have a particular session later on the citizen science where you hear from Marco Zanaro, I, and part of that we'll be talking about a really, you know, uh, I'm wearing the bad, this badge for it, uh, a fantastic school that was run uh, in 2017. And uh, throughout this afternoon, you'll see little snippets of things called Safecast Stories. Actually, those stories have been put together by the student participants of the ICTP school in the main. Uh, and so to the person who asked, you know, what was the reaction of, of students to getting hold of the detectors? Uh, I would like to say watch Marina's video from Armenia because she really shows, she, she gives it to a new bunch of students and you can see the kind of joy uh, uh, that they have at getting, at getting hold of a device and being able to go and make measurements from themselves. So as it says 11.59 and I must be less than 60 seconds from finishing, uh, thank you very much everyone for this session and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, and I think I hand over to Louise again now. So thank you and cheerio. Oh. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter, Peter, uh, Dan and Ian for some fantastic uh, conversation going on there. I can see we have one, one question in the Q&A on the Zoom. So actually, um, you guys are going to stay on as, as panellists for a short while, but I, I would ask if you can answer that using the Q&A function. That uh, would be fantastic. Um, thanks, Ian, for doing a fantastic job in terms of um, fielding the questions coming in, uh, that's quite a skill to weave them into the conversations as we're going along. So uh, we're now going to go straight into a video and I'm hoping that Mary has got this lined up. 
Um, we're going to listen to a conversation between Safecast Asby Brown and Genevieve uh, Beaumont, who was previously at the Institute for Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety, the IRSN in uh, France. Genevieve, uh, Genevieve spent the latter part of her career working on the societal aspects of nuclear incidents. And she joins us to talk about how she got involved in citizen radiation monitoring with Safecast relatively early on and really was quite a, an encouraging force um, in her part of the world trying to get universities and various organizations um, engaged in citizen science and uh, looking at how they could adopt similar things where they are. So I'm hoping at this point uh, we will be moving on. Fantastic, I can see it happening. I'm going to put myself on mute, so uh, enjoy the next. So hello, uh, we're talking with Genevieve Beaumont, recently retired from IRSN, uh, the French National uh, Nuclear Radiation Laboratory, uh, and she's based in Paris, and she's been a very good colleague and supporter of SafeCast since we first met in 2014. Hello, Genevieve. How are you? Hello. Fine. Uh, are you staying home a lot now because of COVID? Yes. No exhibition, no museum. It's a bit <laughs> sad. <laughs> no museum. Yeah. No workshops, nothing. Mm, I, uh, I continue to work with some student, engineer student, and uh, uh, next month, I have to speak about uh, nuclear accident, and, and I will speak about SafeCast. Oh, great. And this is all online? Uh, I don't think so. It's uh, in the classroom. and. Uh... OK. OK, great. Yeah, so uh, I'm thinking back, uh, and I want to say, Genevieve, that you were one of the first, I want to say, strong international professional supporters of SafeCast. And as you remember, we met at the um, uh, meeting, the expert meeting at the IAEA in February 2014. And yes. uh, I remember your presentation. I think you were talking about uh, psychosocial effects or social consequences uh, for people after Chernobyl in, in Scandinavia. Uh, and it was very passionate. And after my presentation, you came to me and said, can you give me your bigaigi? I will buy your bigaigi. Yes, <laughs> you were exactly. so enthusiastic about it. So tell me, why, why were you interested in the bigaigi? Because you know, I was uh, uh, for my uh, for IRSN, I support some uh, uh, um, ethos activities in Belarus, and I see what are the problem in Belarus when you don't know how much uh, radioactivity is, uh, is on the ground and uh, in the food and so on. And uh, uh, it was not easy to have uh, some uh, small sensor to measure it. And uh, when I hear you, I was absolutely immediately convinced that this tool could be very interesting in case of uh, post-accident situation. Great. So, uh, and uh, I continue to have uh, some uh, relationship with uh, Freund in Belarus, uh, meet, meet in, this, in, in this period. And uh, one of, one of these uh, girls measure Belarus, uh, in Belarus, the radioactivity in this village, in, in her village. And uh, she was convinced that uh, uh, it's, it's the radioactivity reduced a lot. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I, I was completely convinced and also because I have some uh, educational project about uh, what is a uh, nuclear risk and what are uh, accident, uh, what happened after accident uh, in a societal point of view. Uh, I have the feeling that people have very few information, even in France, where we have a lot of uh, nuclear reactors. We have uh, 58 nuclear reactors. So the risk to be in the same situation as in Japan is not zero. Perhaps it's very few, but yeah. it's not zero. So for me, it was very important to give education to people 
and uh, to, to, to see how much they know radioactivity and uh, the measurement, what is Becquerel, what is Siever, uh, first thing. And uh, after to understand what are the process in, uh, between uh, the contamination coming from the earth, then on the ground and then in food and then and so on, and then in the, in the people. And so I prepare a lot of uh, educational support to uh, to and to inform people to discuss with them to educate them and uh, uh, safe cast is, is very important because people can immediately measure in their uh, uh, in their area what are the natural risk with uh, uh, with uh, radioactivity and uh, they discover that the sensor never say zero. <laughs> right. You always never find something. <laughs> and after you have to compare to have threshold and so on. And uh, it's very, people understand very quickly if they can measure by themselves. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting because uh, actually two, two things that you sort of introduced or you started that were really interesting for us at SafeCast. One was your educational projects and another was uh, getting us involved with the open radiation project at IRS. And so for the radiation education, um, what was really impressive, you started a project with a environmental NPO, IFORME, mm -hmm. and you ended up buying, I think, 40 big Geiges and yes. giving them to high schools in France yes. Uh, yes. and many schools and they were building them and the students were using them. And I remember uh, the presentation from students uh, from Vichy, from Auvergne yes. Yes. Uh, and Yael, who ultimately, he was a student, a high school student and he went to university and he became our intern. So that was a yes. fascinating project. Um, yes. So t tell me about how was that? How did the teachers and the other students, how did they respond to that? Uh, 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 first, we, we meet this teacher, Mr. Uh, Valéry Bordois. Yeah. I, I congratulate him for what he do. Yeah. Uh, was interested about radon in house because uh, in, in the area of Vichy, it's a very radioactive area. It's As natural the, radiation, right? It's a, it's kind of a yes, high natural, natural radiation, background radiation yes. area in Vichy, uh, in the mountains, uh, in the center of France. Uh, yeah. And you can find radon in, in houses, yes. and sometimes the retina is very high. Mm. So it was the first approach uh, in Vichy is to measure radon. And after I suggest to use uh, SEFCAS in order to uh, make some measurement around Vichy, and perhaps we can share the measurement, the, 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 the paper uh, they, they wrote, uh, because in, in this period in uh, high school, they were obliged to make a personal uh, study about mm -hmm. what they want. Mm -hmm. And the three uh, boys uh, choose to use a safe cast to build mm -hmm. it and to measure. Mm -hmm. And they do very interesting uh, thing because they uh, we know very well where are uranium uh, granite with a yes. lot of uranium in this yeah. area. So the geological and compare... maps are very detailed for that area. The geology yes. and yeah, the, the substrate. So I, 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 perhaps you can share this uh, paper. I think we should share it. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. you have the address in the uh, Yeah, it's a internet. very interesting paper that describes comparing what the students did was they used the Bigaigi and traveled and measured and measured radiation and they overlaid that map with the geology map uh, yes. of the substrate to where the yes. radioactive granite was and it matched very closely. And yes. that was really yes. great to see. And the students did that themselves, high school students. Yes. That was great. Yeah. And they show also that when they, they arrive in a village, even it was not in a very granitic zone, the level was quite, was more uh, important that the map could say, the mm -hmm. geologic maps could say, mm -hmm. because uh, the houses were built in granite. Yes, that's true. So the homes, the building material is also granite. 
So that's yes. a good point. They discovered that on their own. Yes. Yeah. That's that's really great. And like I said, we stayed in touch with Yael and he spent six months or so in Japan on a wonderful internship and spent time in, in, in Fukushima. And um, I was happy to meet with him with you in Paris, I guess, two years ago already. It was great to see that. So yes. also, so then there was IRSN's own project for open radiation and developing, uh, IRSN was developing their own low cost radiation sensor and developing yes. an online uh, data map. And, yes. and you con uh, introduced us. So do you want to talk about that? How did that go? How, how, I mean, I got the sense you were a bit uh, frustrated by that. Uh, immediately after Fukushima accident, I wrote an, as an expert, senior expert about uh, societal aspect. Mm -hmm. I wrote a paper to our uh, director mm -hmm. saying, uh, now, citizens in Japan measure by themselves radioactivity and make mm -hmm. map, mm -hmm. so we can ignore it. Mm -hmm. We can cancel people to, uh, about the choice of the sensors, mm -hmm. and the, we can uh, uh, help to help them to make map, or we can collect all the measurement and uh, suggest them. them to on, on a map and discuss it. Right. And the director immediately say it's a good way. Mm -hmm. We have to do the best. And uh, um, uh, some colleagues in IRSN uh, was also interested by that. And But uh, they don't want to do the same map as you. Right. As they Safe want Cass, to they make want to do a, an interactive map. Map Maybe their only, own map only France, right? Only France. No, no, it's international, but oh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. more or less you have very few few data uh, outside of France, mm -hmm. and they want to collect all kind of measurement uh, coming from all the tools that you can find in the in the shops and uh, in internet, mm -hmm. and. Uh, let people to discuss themselves how robust and how reliable right. are this data. Right. right. So the map need to to permit exchange and uh, to collect data and so on. But unfortunately, the I I I, I am not completely convinced with this tool because you have only four hundred data. The mm -hmm. last one, mm -hmm. which appears which appear on on the map yes. so it's very few it look, yes. if you look now you have very few data hmm. so it didn't and really it's not the momentum. same it didn't Come really on. get the public interest right uh and and that was interesting because you have great experts and um it was a bit complicated with the university and irsn uh experts etc maybe a bit complicated so uh, Safecast, you know, it's a very small team, and at the time we could just do things very, very quickly. So that was interesting to watch the difference between when a, and actually you had some funding, you had a budget, but uh, it yes, took a long yes, time. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, um, it's interesting though um, because for us that was one of the strongest official recognitions of the value of citizen science and crowdsourcing for radiation. Uh, I think IRSN was the first agency to start that. And later, of course, Suro, our colleagues, yes. Jan Hellebrandt and others uh, began in, in, in their own projects. So this was important to have that kind of support. Yes, um, immediately we compare the, the data coming from uh, the SafeCast to the mm -hmm. more uh, professional sensors and the, yeah. the result was uh, quite good. So yeah. this was uh, very important for IRS and to yeah. test yeah. the robustness of this sensor. Yeah. And, and, and uh, hmm. of course, we, uh, uh, I built the first one for IRSN and after <laughs> we continue. And uh, now a lot of colleagues uh, in, in IRSN have these sensors and can use it. Some data on SafeCast mm -hmm. come from some colleagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 it was a great interest about that, perhaps because also we participate in a Belarus uh, mm -hmm. ethos activities and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. but now I have to say that uh, uh, it's very dependent of the director. Yes. And I have 
to say that now the, the interest about educational project, for example, is very reduced. Is it? Yes. Hmm. Uh, the, the person in the communication who's, who was very, uh, who's, who support me and support you, of course, uh, is no more the director of communication. It's uh -huh. another person and it's not at all the same. So it depends so much on some individuals, some yes, person within these agencies uh, to be yes. interested. And you were yes. the key person at IRS. And, and, and as you know, we have colleagues in other agencies who we're talking with uh, today as well. And, and we see that. It's very interesting. So if, if someone in the agency conv convinces, makes a persuasion to other people that this is worthwhile, mm -hmm. then they can be open to it. So I do yes. think, do, do you think now, uh, are you optimistic about the future of accepting citizen science data, let's say for a post-emergency situation or educational situation uh, for radiation now? Are you optimistic? Uh, I, I am not optimi optimistic about edu educational project, you know, because oh. uh, I, 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 I do a review about uh, what was uh, teach in the mm -hmm. high school in different oh. country in, uh, in Europe uh, about radioactivity, about nuclear risk and so on. And I discovered that in France, the program is very, very small. Even if we have uh, 58 reactors <laughs> and uh, the, 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 some, some books, for example, in Belgium, in the Flemish Belgium book was very great. Mm -hmm. Polish was very great Good. in Polish, mm -hmm. but uh, in France, it's a, it's a pity. Really, really. So it's need a, a lot to, 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 to have a better education program, but I am not, yeah. but I don't think that uh, we take this way. Okay. The um, second thing I hmm. think, I think that IRSN will be in, interested every time about this kind of uh, uh, practice, practice mm -hmm. of measurement, radioactivity measurement and uh, contact with uh, communities and mm -hmm. so on. But few people are involved in such uh, project. Right. And I have to say that we, uh, for me, what is important is to be very clear about logistic aspect what the will we do? Logistic aspect. Logistic. Oh, logistic aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What we will do practically uh, if an accident occurs tomorrow near your mm -hmm. French plant? Yes. What will we? What we will do? What Safcats can do? Mm -hmm. For example, I, I have not a list of people in France who have Safcast. I don't right. have it. Right. It should be nice, perhaps, if you have all the address of these people. Yes, in France, for example, and in other country, having yeah. some uh, nuclear reactor, yeah. to have a list of these people ready mm -hmm. in order of the the day of the accident to call them, say them, uh, are, are you ready to do yeah. something in this area? Yeah. Uh, I am ready to go and uh, have a small house in the area to sustain people. Right. Okay, and be, also to mm -hmm. have, uh, perhaps you could have uh, the address of people ready to send immediately mm -hmm. the safe cast to somebody mm -hmm. designed, be, uh, named before, yeah. to send them the, this uh, safe cast in mm -hmm. order to immediately train people interested by that make map, very precise map about how contaminated is the area. Mm -hmm. And in France also, because the problem is uh, uh, very, if you don't do that very quickly, very bad uh, and uh, uh, wrong images yes, about kind of, uh, what, misinformation how much is the, uh, the area. Uh, will come out. So if we can get yes. out very quickly with the right, with good data, That'll, that'll, yes. That should help, right? And we know from our experience at Fukushima that governments will not have enough manpower to do that. Uh, and they'll have yes. to focus on the most 
at risk, the most highly radioactive areas, but people will be very concerned uh, even at a great distance from any accident. So I agree. And, and we always hope that we would have a list of volunteers or be able to engage our volunteer community if there is another accident. And of course, the key word there is the volunteers and how can we build a volunteer network. But mainly because of your efforts, there's maybe 50, at least 50 B Geiges, safe cast B Geiges in France. That's a lot. That can do a lot of coverage. So, yes, but yeah. I am not sure that it should be the, that we could have this very quickly. Mm. And uh, uh, you have uh, not only the need of safe cast around the site, mm. but also other way. For example, uh, it was the same in, uh, in Rouen, in France. Mm -hmm. We have a big chemical accident yeah. with the loss of dust of chemical product. Mm -hmm not only around Rouen, but uh, 200, kilo, 200 kilometers uh, mm -hmm. to the north, mm -hmm. in north of France, in mm -hmm. Ardennes and so on. Mm -hmm. the, you, you, you have uh, some uh, uh, area contaminated mm -hmm. with this dust mm -hmm. because it rained, mm -hmm. and also perhaps in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So the, the process is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, if it, if you have some wind to sh to spe to 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 share <laughs> this uh, dust everywhere, and then if uh, the, uh, it's rain, yeah. you have a contaminated area far. Yes. So you need not only safe cast around the site, right. but also perhaps one on two by department in order to yes. uh, say it's safe. Yeah. Yeah, or, or if it's not safe. And of course, even yes. other countries will want to know. Well, you know, we're almost out of time. So um, I guess I just want to say again, you know, thank you so much for supporting uh, SafeCast and being a good friend and welcoming me to your home and introducing me to so many colleagues at IRSN and other agencies. Uh, it's been really and in good. Belgium too. And, uh... in Belgium and everywhere else. Uh, so that's <laughs> been a really good thing. So I hope we meet up again soon. Um, any last word um, for SafeCast after 10 years? Oh, continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So we'll continue. So take yes. care and my best to everyone. And uh, thank you very much. And we'll talk again soon. Bye. Thank you. So, uh, I think it's uh, me to take over. That was a really interesting conversation between Genevieve. I, I know from uh, various chat channels and people messaging me and other things that uh, the, 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 the comment was that she really hits the absolutely nail in the head of a few issues to, in terms of, you know, the interaction between uh, the official, official done, which we'll talk again later, and, uh, you know, the, the experience of students and young people. But it's now time to move on to the, the next session. So uh, this time I get to do the introductions to Louise and uh, I need to take a moment to embarrass her just to, to, so that everyone knows what an absolutely fantastic job she's done uh, in preparing for all of this. And uh, definitely uh, you would not be having the programme running as smoothly as you've got it now if, if she hadn't been doing this. Uh, so uh, I, I am a physicist, uh, but I have an interest in lots of things to do with the social sciences. So the next few sessions, I'm particularly looking forward to being in the audience rather than being, you know, uh, sitting on the panel or, or being the moderator. And uh, obviously I get involved with SafeCast by doing lots of travels and this event shows just how far SafeCast has traveled across the world. And that's the topic of this one. So uh, I'm gonna hand over to Louise and uh, Michelle. And since we've been having many debates on pronouncing your name and my wife is Flemish, I'll give it a go. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to Michelle van Uthusden and Louise to discuss how SafeCast travels, reflecting on the spread of data, devices, ideas, and people. So over to you, Louise. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Um, so as he kindly has pointed out, joining me at the table, we have um, Cambridge University researcher, Michel van uh, Oetshusten. He's currently joining us from Belgium. Um, he's wrapped up very warm there, Michel. You've got an excellent scarf going on. Uh, Michelle's research interest <laughs> is at the intersections of environmental sociology, policymaking, and digital participation. 
is currently part of a research project called GRACE, which stands for Grassroots Citizen Science, um, Citizen Science for Global Data Environments Project. He's fascinated by and promotes interactions between grassroots citizen science groups and formal institutions. And he's been involved in developing mutually responsive environmental governance approaches, particularly in relation to nuclear policy making. So welcome, Michiel. Thank you, thanks for having me. Our conversation today, you're welcome. Uh, our conversation today is going to focus around SafeCast as a thing or a collection of things that move around the world. Um, both Michiel and I are both uh, are social scientists and we're, uh, as a result, we're obsessed with things, particularly things and devices like the SafeCast Big Igy, which you can see on my rucksack there in Nepal just before lockdown, I, I snuck it in, um, and things like measuring uh, methods and practices. So we try to have a, a look at and understand what these things do to see where they go and how they travel. But we think that SafeCast is probably a lot more than that. We're drawn to um, particularly to small, often mundane things which might easily be overlooked for discussion when we're talking about radiation monitoring. So, Michiel, I wanted to start off our conversation by asking you about SafeCast stickers. Um, something which many of you watching uh, may have seen perhaps stuck on a window or on a laptop or on the back of a big guy if you have one um, around. So I wonder, surely something as mundane as a sticker can't really be doing that much. Where have you seen them and uh, what did they make you do and what do you think that they're doing as a result? Well, I do think they do things, right? I think you think the same. This is why we're having this conversation. I mean, we've heard so much now. Um, in the past sessions um, about the hard data, the technical data, and, and you know, there's questions of validity and accuracy and so on. Um, mm -hmm. But as you said, SafeCast is much more than that. So I think we should also be considering other data, um, for, for instance, stickers, you know, for, for, for social scientists and for ethnographers, those are equally data because they perform something, they do something. Um, but so just to give you some context, it was, um, I think it was in 2018 when I had traveled to Japan it was one of my trips where I, I met up with, with Asby Brown and he gave me some of these state SafeCast stickers. So the ones with the logo, right? They're all over, um, they're, all, they're on the, the screen, you've seen them today. Um, and I took them back with me. And um, it's, it's interesting because um, on, on the way back, I was having a, a conversation with, um, uh, yeah, so you see it there on, on Louise's screen. Uh, but so on, on the way back, I was having a conversation with colleagues, you know, like um, colleagues from uh, the Nuclear Research Center, where I was based at the time, um, about how do we display these stickers or do we even display them? Um, because they can be contentious, at least in, in the, the working environment where we were, um, where we were at the time, or where I was at the time. And so actually what the sticker already triggered was some kind of conversation about, um, you know, what what the citizen science represent, what the safecast represent, um, and about how it travels. It travels uh, on a laptop, on a cell phone, and, and, and so in often very mundane ways. Um, and at the center where I was, you know, people have mixed feelings. There's, there's those who are very um, uh, responsive to citizen science, are very eager to engage with it. And there's other people who are much more, you know, reluctant uh, or even opposed to it. So, um, I mean, and that has to do with, with, for instance, the idea that citizens cannot measure data reliably, you know, those discussions, I think we've heard some of that uh, earlier today. Um, but so in the end, the stickers went everywhere. I have one on my um, table tray in, in the living room, but that then sparked a conversation with my kids about what SafeCast is and, and you know, and so on. So they, they may seem trivial, but I think they actually do things. Uh, at the very least, they spark conversation. Um, and perhaps this is something you want to touch on, Louise, because you told you told me that you had a similar experience with with the the big IDs. Yeah. So uh, as with many people, I think uh, who are either watching or listening, and I've made videos, uh, I made my own big IG, uh, and I've I've taken it to various places. Um, but sometimes I was a bit sort of uh, reticent, I think, to show it. Other places, I was really proud of it and kind of wanted to show people that I was doing it and get them involved in why are you taking a radiation monitor to Seoul in Korea and um, showing my hosts where I was staying, the big IG and other places, particularly actually um, 
uh, formal institutions and, and government agencies, if I went to speak to them, I probably actually was slightly more circumspect because I know that there's this kind of tension between who's allowed to measure data, who's allowed to come up with acceptable devices and standards and ways of doing things, and who then is accepting of the things that it discusses. So by, by making that uh, a link between me and Safecast, um, during those discussions, I thought that sometimes it would uh, influence what our discussions would be about and how open people might be with me around their feelings about it. Yeah, so it has a lot to do with power as well. Yeah. Which absolutely. is what counts as, you know, as, as valid knowledge and what counts as data. Big questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I wonder if I can ask you a second question, which is um, around, uh, so I suppose radiation monitors and stickers as physical things are kind of relatively easy to th think about as things that move around. And we've certainly seen, um, seen that happening already, um, even during uh, throughout this session. Um, but I wonder whether there are other safe cast things that might travel around that are slightly less tangible, perhaps non-physical things. Can you... Uh, I just wondered if you had any ideas about that in particular. Well, I think certainly the ideas, right? There's certain concepts, even the notion of citizen science, right? That that means so many things. So again, that could spark uh, lots of debate. Uh, you know, it could be implicit or explicit where people are addressing the question of what is citizen science. That seems to pop up a, a lot in certain yeah. um, arenas, but also, you know, conversations that, um, uh, conferences. So, for instance, ASBI has been to many of the European uh, conferences. Um, so he's very much a Safecast traveler, you could say. Um, so he brings Safecast with him. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> this picture. is Rico in 2017, and actually, there's quite a few people who are on this uh, this discussion today, uh, uh, sort of somewhere in that photograph. Well, good luck figuring that out. <laughs> um, but so I think then um, another thing that well, or through these conversations, for instance, presentations being given at conferences, um, what becomes explicit are, are, are tensions. Um, and, and so tensions aren't always tangible, but it could be tensions between citizens and formal institutions. It could be tensions between ways of measuring and modes of reasoning. So that comes back to the question of what counts as evidence, what counts as real data, and, and what's discarded. Uh, and what are the data for, right? What, you know, so often these discussions may remain implicit, but I think that's one of like the added value or um, what Safecast has really contributed to is making these questions more explicit and putting them on the table. Um, and then I think for us, you know, social scientists, it would be really interesting to see, are these tensions productive? Because there's always gonna be tensions, uh, but are, can they be made to be productive or are they gonna be destructive, right? So for instance, when, when groups don't, don't even converse or don't even engage with each other in any, um, um, constructive way, you could say. Okay, great. And finally, um, I think we've kind of touched on Safecast being a number of different things. So it's it's people, it's devices, it's methods and ways of doing citizen science, it's ideas of um, what counts as acceptable ways of uh, challenging um, or validating other sources of information. And it has become an object of study for quite a number of social science researchers. Um, myself included, but also of themselves. So I know that Safecast have also published their own um, research. So um, why do you think Safecast potentially has become um, an object of social science research? So particularly, perhaps more so than other citizen science radiation monitoring groups, because there are many of those um, in Japan as well. Um, and I wonder why Safecast often sort of becomes the poster child slightly for uh, radiation monitoring. It would be great to get your response to this because, um, you know, this. I don't think anyone's really asking that question, so it's, it's actually quite uh, quite innovative. I mean, I could say that um, I think it's being studied because it's come to matter, right? So it's come to matter um, socially, culturally, scientifically, technically, and and politically, and that's when I think many social scientists start paying attention. So it's it's a real thing, but it you know to, to use that terminology. It, it, it travels, it, it's noticed, um, observed, praised, and criticized, and at the same time, it's not really clear what it is, right? It's, just, it's not one single entity. Um, but so in, in, you know, I could use this, this metaphor is 
coming back to the stickers, it's, like it's a very mundane object representing state gas, but I see it in my living room every day. It's a sticker on a, on a table tray. And so it's part of the furniture. Okay? I've become accustomed to it. It's, it's, it's there. And perhaps in the long run, but this is a big question, you know, um, safe cast could become part of the furniture of environmental monitoring and governance. I think that's a, a big question for the next 10 years. Well, what are your thoughts about social scientists paying attention? Uh, I'm going to make this one very quick because we're almost unfortunately out of time, although I think we've we've also observed that you and I could probably talk about this for hours and hours. Um, but my my feeling is probably I think SafeCast is quite international. There's a lot of English speakers, and I think that SafeCast has probably traveled more internationally, I would say almost than sometimes when I mentioned SafeCast to other people in Japan, it was less well known in Japan that I would and than I had imagined. And I think it's probably more well known outside of Japan, although I'm sure other people would disagree with me on that. But I think it makes it accessible in terms of um uh just the, the practicalities of getting things published in English is probably um, means that you have a wider audience and therefore um, people find it that they're very easy to get engaged in. That's how I, I got involved with SafeCast was just dropping Sean an email and then uh, they sort of welcome you with open arms and are always hosting various um, researchers. So I think they're a very open organization, very keen to sort of let people kind of get underneath what it is that they're doing and how they're doing it, which means they're very accessible for researchers. So yeah, at this point, point, I can see Sorry. that Ian Sorry. has um, come back on, so he's giving me the eye off screen. So um, I wanted to say thank you ever so much, Michael. That's been a, a great conversation. I'm, I'm only sorry we couldn't go on for longer, um, but we've got a packed schedule, so we've got to move on to um, some other guests. So. Um, uh, before we go, um, Ian, was there anything that you wanted to flag up for Michiel before we go? No, I, 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 it's, we've probably been too fast for people to sneak in in questions, but it's a really interesting discussion. I've got lots of stickers. I, I, I think I may be modifying one of my tea trees as, uh, to, to, to remind myself of SafeCast more often now. <laughs> well, thank you. But thank you, Michelle, and um, Thanks. please bye -bye. Uh, keep watching and uh, get involved in the discussion online if you can. Hi, my name is Akmal Safarov and I am from Uzbekistan. I work as a teaching assistant at the Department of Nuclear Physics and Astronomy of San Marcan State University. At the same time, I work as a researcher at Nuclear Physics Laboratory of the same university. Back in 2017, I attended a joint ICTP IEA workshop on environmental mapping, where I learned about SafeCast and its product called the Guide. Their mentors taught me how to assemble my own device. Moreover, they taught me how to analyze and map data. Right now, we are standing inside of the Nuclear Electronics Lab, which I have created together with my team within the IEA's Technical Cooperation Project. I very much like uh, e guide sensors because they allow me to re record data such as uh, coordinates, time, dose rates, with subsequent possibility of creating beautiful dose rate maps. Within my current IEA TC project, we are expecting to obtain two more safeguard devices. I'm planning to use uh, big ID sensors to create new lab exercises for my students. The most, the most uh, interesting research where I used uh, big ID sensors was when we did monitoring of construction site of first Central Asian nuclear power plant. Now we are standing in the room where we analyze and discuss data that was collected using big IG sensors. Behind me is a map of Uzbekistan with my measurements on it. I'm very happy that back in 2017 I was able to meet such wonderful people and I'm also happy that I was able to bring new knowledge and equipment to my laboratory and to my university. Today, big ID sensors are extensively used in my university, 
and obtain data is very useful part of master level and bachelor level students thesis work as well as articles. Thank you very much and happy 10th anniversary to SafeCast. Goodbye. So that was a great video from Uzbekistan uh, and Louise is back. So uh, I'll, I'll go off screen again. Thank you very much. Okay, we're just going to bring uh, Ben and Sophie onto the floor. So bear with me one second. Fantastic. I'm going to boot Ian off. So uh, welcome, Ben and Sophie. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I'm going to give you the challenge of keeping this to 15 minutes. Um, having just done it myself, it's very, very quick. So I'm not going to take up very much time at all. And just to say welcome to Ben, who's um, a medical anthropologist based at UCL in London, and Sophie, who is a journalist researcher um, based in Amsterdam. Ben and Sophie are going to um, have a 15 minute conversation and talk about mental health and uh, radiation. So uh, Ben and Sophie, over to you. Thanks, Louise. Yeah. Um, so as Louise said, I'm a journalist and researcher. And last year I wrote an article for Wired uh, UK magazine about the social and mental uh, health consequences of the Fukushima disaster. And I interviewed Ben for that article. Um, which is why we're back now and I'm re-interviewing Ben <laughs> because I think he had some really interesting things um, to say about the mental health impacts. Um, so Ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, so, uh, I'm, as you say, I'm a medical anthropologist. Um, I've worked for the last few years on forces of mental health issues in Japan. I did my field, a couple of years of field work in um, Shima, Miyagi and Iwate, uh, working with various mental health organizations that were set up after the disasters. And um, I think today I'm particularly interested in how perceptions of risk or pollution can translate into um, mental health fears. So you might think, for example, of parental anxiety um, or future children for their future uh, children's well-being and how that might be medicalized by mental health professionals when their responses could be said to be natural and the evidence for intervention on those fears might not really, uh, might not be there. Yeah. yeah. So. How about we go back 10 years, uh, just after the accident happened. Um, and back then, a lot of medical professionals um, in Japan, guided by the government, were really trying to reassure people that they were not in danger and that the amount of radiation release was safe. Um, so a lot of energy was expended on this reassurance rather than measurement. Um, and international experts, as well as some Japanese doctors, said that people would, were suffering from radiophobia or an irrational fear um, of radiation. But as we know, so little was known back then, a lot of people had genuine fears, um, but they were often dismissed by the government or other authority figures. Could you talk a little bit about that, Ben? Uh, about this idea that people who didn't agree with the government were ignorant or that they were irrational? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a contentious issue, I think, for, for a lot of people. Um, but we can definitely say, just looking at the data from at Chernobyl over the last 30 years, uh, many experts, the WHO included, have warned that the mental health uh, risks or the mental health risks of the crisis would far outweigh any of the physical risks from radiation. And you have to take that claim quite seriously, or, or what does it really mean um, to think about you know, the challenges of, of the disaster as a mental health problem. Uh, and also, you know, this might be accurate, um, but yeah, it needs some qualification. The next thing I would say is the problem, is the problem really about mental health in biomedical terms? So are we talking about PTSD? Or is it perhaps a more general kind of distress caused by social and economic change and, and certainly inequalities? And I think it's quite hard to say which one, and if it's not necessarily a question of either or, but um, certainly there, there are differences in the way that we can think of the causal nature of these problems. Um, but really what I'm interested in is how we deal with something like mental health, which is both invisible and very difficult to measure, uh, just like radiation is. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, I thought that was interesting how you know how you talked about the difference between, um, like you said, PTSD and then dealing with the fear of something and, and especially maybe something in the external environment. You know, so I think one thing we, we talked about last year and can agree on is that 
a lot of the mental health consequences are as a direct result of the accident. And yet people have the same diagnosis, anxiety, PTSD, or depression, for example, as maybe other people in, in non-disaster contexts. Could you talk a bit about the difference between those two? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, it's important to say that when, when we frame the question as, as a mental health problem, um, particularly in terms of radiation anxiety, it does two things, at least. It legitimizes people's suffering, but it puts it in the language of, of science, in a sense. It says that, you know, you're, you have a, a real problem. Um, but it also presents a, a problem to which the solution might not be in the hands of a professional, so particularly when it comes to the fear of radiation, um, which is, you know, a factor in contributing to people's decision to come home and to return to areas that are, um, you know, no longer that have, that have been decontaminated or near the radiation exposed areas. Um, but in terms of the comparison, I think it's very difficult for, for us to make sense of data taken from you know, mental health experts in Miyagi, for example, where there was no radiation exposure or, and data from Fukushima and trying to compare the two um, groups you know, as if they were equivalent in a way uh, to speak about mental health in that overall is, is actually quite difficult because there are so many different con contributing factors. Yeah, uh, of course, so, that's what they, they tried to do to some extent with the Fukushima uh, health questionnaire, right? The mental health component was about trying to quantify on this scale of like how anguished, how much anguish do you have and how much anguish do you not have? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When we think about radiophobia, I think it's very interesting because that, um, although it's not a term that it's like widely accepted and used necessarily, it is something that you hear people talk about and perhaps behind the, you know, behind the, behind closed doors, if you like. Um, but if you think about it, if you have an operation and you know that you're going to be worried about that operation, it doesn't make sense to speak about operation phobia or yatrophobia, um, yeah. in a clinical thing, right? So yeah. what would it mean to apply a label to, to something like the fear of, of anxiety or the fear or anxieties that you have about something can be quite, de quite stigmatizing and disempowering in a way. Um, but I think it also says the government doesn't have to act on this in a way because the problem is your problem you know, you're, you're the, in your mind um, yeah. you're anxious. and that can you know that has some, some i think that has some validity to it as how we frame the question um, but if people you know have legitimate reasons to be afraid um then it's not really an irrational fear in that case, it can't be considered radiophobia, at least in the strict sense of how I understand it. So the subtext is that people are actually ignorant. They don't understand the science properly. Um, and so there's a sense of, you know, pathologizing ignorance in a way. And ordinary people are portrayed as not understanding of what science tells them and how they should accept the risks or, or not. Um, you know, and at, at that level, the government is the ultimate source of truth about what is considered safe or not safe. Um, and of course, people might, lots of people disagree with that and find that there are, you know, risks that aren't contained within the particular measurements that the government is using. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's... That makes, that makes a lot of sense. It was very much, yeah, you guys have this individual problem and it's all in your head as well. Um, but on the subject of, maybe we could talk a bit about how different mental health care is in Japan and also the mental care response because I know that your work your research focuses a lot on Kokoro no Care which was the main organization set up to deal with mental health consequences could you talk yeah. a bit about the difference in their response to what you might expect in a western context yeah so I think starting from first principles we should say that essentially all post-disaster mental health care is, is, is similar in a way across the world you start with a pyramid of needs and that care is then framed in two complementary but distinct logic. So the first would be psychosocial support, and the second would be mental health care. And, it, and that can be you know, agglomerated under MHPSS, mental health and psychosocial support. Um, but the two things are actually not the same. They sound very similar, but they're not the same. Different actors are involved for each. So for mental health support, uh, or mental health care, sorry, we would have um, you know, professional mental health providers like psychiatrists and, uh, and psychiatric nurses and clinicians. And that, that type of support would be provided at a clinic or a hospital. And for psychosocial support, what you have generally is a much more loose definition of what mental health can be. Mm. And it translates to something which is called kokoro no care. Before I get onto kokoro no care, it's important to mention that 
psychosocial support tends to focus on the community at large rather than individuals, which is what you'd find in a mental health service. And uh, I think this, this word kokoro is quite interesting because when we call the center kokoro no care, care of the heart mind um, in Japan, in Japanese, it tells us something about what it is, how we conceptualize mental health really in a way, because kokoro is considered to be a lot less stigmatizing, a lot more, um, you know, a lot less clinical sounding. So for people, it's almost more accessible. I, I, they, they might rather prefer to go to a coronal care center um, and uh, receive you know, treatment or whatever type of interventions are available there, which we can get into, or rather than perhaps um, you know, going through the process of trying to actually see a mental health professional one-to-one. -one, mm -hmm. Ultimately, yeah, the context is very different between one and the other. Yeah. And so when you talk about treatment, because as we've also talked about, um, yeah, talk therapy is not very common in Japan. The idea that you might go and see a psychologist to talk about your problems or anguish or whatever. So how did Kokoro no Ke make it accessible to people? Because there's kind of a taboo, in fact, about psychological care to some extent. What kind of treatments or context did they offer for people to get involved in? Um. It really depends on the place. And like I say, because it's such a loose term, you know, almost anything can, can count as kokoro no care. Um, I know there are also salons, which, you know, salon, which are a type of kokoro no care activity, which is even more loose, which can be run by almost anyone. But again, you know, the focus is on the community aspect. So I think what really it's attractive to kokoro no care, of, what's it, to people of um, about kokoro no care, is the sense that, um, you know, as I said, it's not really seen in a, as a clinical in a clinical way, um, and also the interventions that you would get there don't actually represent or might not represent what we would expect expect of a traditional mental health support service. Yes. So um, you might have access to mental health providers like psychiatric nurses and counsellors, but you, you're not necessarily going there specifically for that. And what they tend to run activity, so things like people, that people will do as a group. Um, you know, they can also run things like alcohol dependence support group, or they can do more um, fun things like drama or music, music, um, you know, and that's, I think, a big attraction. And I think part of that is trying to bring in specifically elderly people who might be otherwise else, um, isolated. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine someone might come in to do a knitting class and with their friends, you know, someone who might otherwise be isolated, I'd say. And so they, they are the targets of this group might become a target for what might be called active listening. So a counselor might be present, might be listening to the conversations that are ha uh, happening. And if they think that something might be wrong, then they will, they will um, refer that person to the clinic. So it's not really a focused intervention as such. Yeah, people don't really feel like they're going for like a 10 week course of therapy or something like that. It's just a community, more of a community center kind of feel. Yeah, it's more, it's more yeah. monetary. Louise, do we have any questions? Oh, that's very quick. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> it's very quick. Um, <laughs> no, so um, apologies. We're actually going to have to move you on if that's all right. That's all right. Because we've come out, we've come out, I'm going to go on to the next video. But thank you so much. Okay. Um, I, I know there have been some comments on the side um, about how interesting it is. And um, I, I've got various <laughs> asks to um, put you in contact with different people. Um, from within the group. So thank you so much for your time and thank you in particular to Ben who um, has uh, abandoned his PhD thesis which is uh, <laughs> due any day to, to join us on this call so we really do appreciate the additional stress that coming on here will have, uh, will have <laughs> onto that. So thank you so much to, to both of you um, for your time and effort and we're going to go on to um, a short Safe Car Stories video now if that's all right. Hi, thanks. Hello to everyone, I'm Chris from Greece. I became a safe caster during my PhD studies. More specifically, I attended a workshop in the ICTP Center in Trieste, Italy, where I was introduced in the world of safe cast. I got interested in monitoring the environmental radioactivity using a simple, portable and user-friendly device, the Big Aigi. 
Since then, I carry everywhere my big eye during my research and my vacation. My favorite measurement was actually inside the campus of my university, where there was a difference in the level of radioactivity among the area around the deanery and the other areas of the campus. The granite that is around the deanery is actually the reason for this difference. I really like being a safe cast volunteer and I believe that more and more people will participate in these activities. SafeCast is a really important community as it provides access in open and accurate environmental data. Bye to everyone! So, that was very nice. Uh, uh, another stream from ICTP. I love to see, love to see Consola uh, and, and hear all these stories. So uh, what we have next is uh, what we're titling our keynote. Uh, the whole day is really important, uh, but we felt that this particular session uh, kind of answered the major question that we were discussing amongst ourselves, which is it's been 10 years. Uh, has anything changed? Have, has SafeCast had an effect uh, that we can we can tell as we look back. So I, I'm I'm really uh, very pleased. I wish I, I wish to be honest I could talk about this all the time. I wish I was always on it and doing it, but it's time to shut up and get out of the way. Um, so our host for this session is going to be uh, I'm very pleased to see it's Catronel Turkana. Uh, I I'm going to give uh, Catronel's introduction just so you, you you know a bit about her. She has a PhD and coordinates the program for integration of social and ethical aspects into the nuclear research within the Belgian Nuclear Research Centre, as you can uh, She has 25 years uh, experience research and training, nuclear emergency management, uh, notably decision support tools, public opinion, risk perception and behaviours and stakeholder engagement. Everything that we are talking about uh, and that we think about to do with SafeCast and what's going on. Uh, she coordinated the Horizon 2020 concert Engage on enhancing stakeholder engagement in the radiological protection and led the, the work package in social aspects of uncertainty management for concert confidence and she chairs the IEA's Maestri project on integrated environmental management. Uh, I will leave uh, Katrin now to introduce the rest of the panel who are equally as illustrious and have as much to say and with that uh, I may chip in a question or two from the sidelines uh, but I shall restrain myself but I, I'm really very much looking forward to this and, and, I, and I look forward to what you and the panel have to say. So over to you Katrin now. Thank you very much Ian for this really great uh, introduction. Um, I'll just kindly ask you to put the spotlights on all the uh, panelists. So a warm uh, welcome to all those who follow the session via Zoom or YouTube. Um, over the next 50 minutes, we'll talk with a multidisciplinary group of researchers and professionals in the field of radiation protection and emergency management. And we'll be trying to trace with them the footprints of SafeCast over the last 10 years, uh, the marks its members have left on research policies and practices in emergency management, radiation protection, and disaster response. Uh, by having citizens generate independent, openly available, and actionable data on the radioactive pollution, SafeCast filled a gap of information and trust in the, in the aftermath of the Fukushima accident. And that's wonderfully illustrated by previous speakers, SafeCast volunteers in Japan and around the globe have since gathered a vast amount of radiation measurement data in more than 60 countries. Radiation prof protection professionals and organizations have reacted in different ways to SafeCast and other grassroots radiation monitoring initiatives, from enthusiasm and recognition in some cases to cautious engagement or opposition in other cases. And we've heard about uh, example of, of those uh, in the previous talks. What we'll discuss now is how the reception of an attitude towards SafeCast and other citizen science initiatives has changed over the years, how organizations do or should engage with citizen scientists, and how to bring recommendations regarding such engagement into practice. Where are we now and what is still needed? And indeed, there have been many recommendations, not least by European projects such as Eagle, Confidence, or Engage, or by international organizations and associations, encouraging formal uh, organizations such as public authorities and research centers to listen to citizens' needs, 
to engage with citizen scientists and explore new ways of collaboration. But how are these put into practice? What are the challenges and opportunities for collaborations? What are the pitfalls? These are some of the questions for our panelists. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce the four panelists. Uh, Tania Perko, she is a vice president of SHARE, the European Platform for Social Sciences and Humanities Research in Ionizing Radiation. She coordinated the European uh, project Eagle, which tried to improve communication about ionizing radiation. Uh, she is a PA, she had, she's a social scientist with a PhD in risk perception and risk communication and currently a senior researcher at the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, SCKCN and University of Antwerp. She is also the main organizer of the RECOMED conferences that we'll be hearing about it in a moment. The second panelist um, is Jan Hellebrand. He's a senior researcher in the emergency preparedness section of the Czech National Radiation Protection Institute in Prague. He specializes in GIS and the processing of mapping and measure data and, the visual, and their visualization. And he participates in QGIS plugin developments. Uh, our third panelist is Raf Kaiser, professor of nuclear physics at the University of Glasgow and managing director of Linkios Technology, a startup company that uses cosmic ray muons to characterize radioactive waste containers. From 2010 to 2017, he was head of physics section at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And finally, last but not least, we have Astrid Leland. She's a nuclear chemist and director of the Emergency Preparedness and Response at the Norwegian Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority. She has long experience in the long-term follow-up of the Chernobyl and Fukushima accidents. So let's talk. Uh, I'll uh, uh, give the word first a bit to each panelist, and then we'd like to have an as interactive as possible discussion. And please feel free to drop questions at any moment. I'll try to spot them. And otherwise, uh, I will be asking Jan to let me know when we have some interesting points that we need to address. Um, so Tanya, you have been the main organizer of the Recomet conferences, and you have engaged with SafeCast from a very early on. Please tell us something about your experience and, uh, and uh, what you have observed throughout the years. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Katrineel, and thank you uh, to ASBI and to SafeCast for inviting me to this uh, nice event, which I follow from the early morning, and congratulations for this. Um, it was in 2014 when I got, when I was coordinator of Eagle uh, FP7 project, European Commission project, uh, with the name enhancing stakeholder participation in the governance of radiological risks for improved radiation protection and informed decision making. This project was supported by European Commission in order to improve communication and stakeholder engagement in new in, in ionizing radiation in general. And it was supported based on the Fukushima because the European uh, um, um, institutions, they recognize there is extremely low trust in the, in the authorities. Uh, there, is not, there is poor communication related to uh, ionizing radiation and something needs to be done because the world is changing, communication is changing and also institutions, they have to change. So we got this project and in 2000, uh, this project was, uh, we got it in 2013 and in 2014, I got a telephone call from Geneva who was just before participated in this uh, nice webinar. And she said, Tanya, we need to invite SafeCast. This is citizen science initiative from, from Japan and they need to come there. This may be our solution for improved uh, stakeholder engagement and informed decision-making. At this time, I, I'm sorry, I really didn't know what citizen science is, although if I was a coordinator of European project. So uh, Geneviere, she was trying to describe and, and so on, but I must say I was also uh, quite, um, how to say, I, I had my limitations about this into understanding this, but we said, okay, let's invite these SafeCast people to come to our first conference, Recomet in 2015, and Let's see what do they have to say. So one interesting guy came from Tokyo, Asvi, and he inspired all of us. There was in the room was uh, 150 people, representative of civil organizations, journalists, authorities, international authorities. And uh, with his presentation, the discussion started. 
it was so interesting because he was really uh, he was really controversial and the discussions they only after his presentation the discussion started and they continued during the breaks during the evening and they ended with a great party at the end. So this was the, the first meeting of the SafeCast and we continued our collaboration. We invited SafeCast to all Recomet conferences from 2015 on up till today. And uh, SafeCast people, especially Asby Brown, they participated in these conferences. So the, the, our collaboration with the SafeCast started with the intention to improve public communication. So it was really limited to the communication. And then uh, in 2015, we encouraged ASBI to, and the people from SafeCast to publish a scientific article because there was a lot of, um, uh, it was not such a huge understanding of what, what citizen science is. And we said, look, ASBI try to write a scientific article for the Radiological Protection Journal, where you explain what this is also to the scientific community. We also uh, contributed the resources that this, pub, uh, this article was uh, is open source article. And up till now, it's extremely well quoted article. So uh, it was published um, with the title Safecast, Successful Citizen Science for Radiation Measurement and Communication after Fukushima written by Asby Brown, Peter Franken, Sean Bonner, Nick Dolezal, and Joe Moros. So uh, really fantastic uh, breakthrough into the scientific publications uh, into the society. And then in 2016, we invited Asby to come to Europe again and to present SafeCast to radiation protection platforms. So to present SafeCast to uh, to the uh, Eurados, which is dosimetry radiation protection platform, to Alliance, to male Alliance's radio biology, to uh, low doses uh, uh, platform Melody, and so on. And he did again a great job. However, I noticed in the public that they were carefully listening, but they still didn't completely take it over. Huh? And he got a lot of uh, unpleasant questions as well. And then uh, it was um, end of this project, Eagle. And in the, in the end of the, this project, in the, our recommendations, we wrote into recommendation 17, we wrote, we wrote that the, we, uh, we, we, we um, suggested to European authorities to go towards the Mutteler understanding through contribution to citizen science project by organizing, promoting and supporting citizen science project, especially for instance, related to sh with the sharing information and verifying the results. And then it continued as we came to the, in 2017, first time to the International Atomic Energy Agency, also with our support, uh, with support of European Commission and uh, immediately got another invitation in 2017, also at International Atomic Energy, also on International Symposium on Communicating Nuclear and Radiological Emergencies to the Public. And this conference, they brought together approximately 400 experts from 47 member states and 13 international organizations. And again, okay, it was conference about the communicating, it was not, uh, communicating about ionizing radiation and risk, not about the research, which citizen science is, it's also a research. But however, this was some kind of breakthrough. And then uh, immediately after this, we found the word safecast in many European projects, in Platenso, in Confidence, in Engage, in Opera, and in many others, uh, for instance, Shamisen Sync project, uh, where where this project said that we should take that the, that the authorities, emergency and nuclear uh, emergency authorities, they should take steps to enable citizens to perform measurements and the support citizens to collect and share measurements data with authorities. So this was a huge step toward more, more informed um, society, but not only this, but contribution of citizens to the, to the scientific results. Uh, the main 
uh, also uh, a project uh, supported by DG Energy uh, in 2019 recommends to collaborate with citizen science scientists pre uh, before emergencies in preparedness phase during the emergency and also after the during the recovery and this was based on the on the safe costs input uh, and then the main, the, 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 the newest uh, result, the newest footstep, which is quite deep, is the International IRPA guide. Uh, IRPA is International Radiation Protection Association. They published in, two, uh, in 2020 practical guidance for engagement with the public on radiation and risk. And in Appendix 4, based on the safecast, it's a special appendix how to engage with uh, citizen scientists. So it's advice for the radiation, all the radiation protection associations, which they are worldwide to advise, they advise to, uh, they wrote experience has shown that such citizen science projects at Safecast will develop in various contexts, irrespective of any support from authorities or the radiation protection profession. It's therefore better for the profession to recognize this and to consider what role can we take to help bring these activities closer to our science community, to make the activities more useful and scientifically based with the outcomes more meaningful for the public. So it's recognized as an opportunity, not only for communicating with publics, but also collaborating and contributing to radiation protection and also to scientific results. So uh, all together, I think that in this, in this uh, sh short years, in 10 years, the SafeCast has a great uh, footprint, not only in Europe, but worldwide. And it has been taken up by different recommendations, different guidelines, and different scientific publications. Thanks a lot, uh, Tanya. I think for the future, it will be very interesting to see how these ERPA guidelines are being transposed into practice and come back to the radiation protection societies to see some, some examples of, of how they engage with citizens in general and the citizen scientists in, in, in particular. So now let's turn to Jan. Jan Hellebrand. So uh, your organization has been uh, involved since a long time in citizen science projects. So um, I'm curious also to know what motivated you personally to, to get engaged with this. And I also believe that you have a, a couple of slides you would like to show us. Uh, yes. Uh, I hope uh, everything uh, works now. Uh, I would like to invite uh, all, the, all the people uh, visiting the, uh, this unit. Uh, I, I started, uh, I, it, I discovered SafeCast uh, because uh, as, as, my, uh, as I'm working for the emerg uh, emergency preparedness section in Prague uh, for the National Radiation Protection Institute. So we were uh, watching the Fukushima uh, situation really in detail. Uh, and uh, soon we discovered uh, also safecast. So uh, just just one slide to show you uh, where we are from, from Europe, from Czech Republic. Uh, so uh, it's far from Japan, but uh, the people are very concerned about the situation and it's just our work. Uh, so uh, we, we bought some big IDs, something between 2014 and 15. And currently, we have much, much bigger fleet with something, something like 50 or 60 big IDs. Uh, we uh, recently reached uh, more than 6,000 big IG imports in the SafeCast API. Uh, and we have plenty of users uh, from, from the public, schools, uh, kids, students, uh, because we are borrowing our big IDs uh, within the Ramesses project. Um, we also have, uh, because of the big amount of the devices experience uh, related to servicing repairs, uh, we also have developed a complete processing workflow using the QGIS uh, software uh, and also performed several 
uh, testing in our laboratories. Uh, thanks to us, uh, also the uh, tile map uh, can now uh, use Czech language. Uh, we also think that the education is really important. So uh, we prepared uh, plenty of materials, including the uh, so-called accompanying document for uh, traveling with big uh, Some We have a uh, wiki for our users. Uh, we uh, published a lot of photos for public use and uh, also created uh, plenty of information graphics and so on. Uh, we, we also provide some uh, tips uh, for uh, traveling with big guy for, for trips, uh, some maps with uh, where you uh, can uh, measure something more than usual uh, national background. Uh, we also uh, organized some field workshops uh, with students uh, and so on. Uh, this is a nice example of one of those nature anomalies uh, you can discover uh, just uh, in a common walking trip. Uh, and uh, recently, as there were some issues with related uh, the big ID manufacturing and distribution, uh, we also uh, are developing a new device called Checkrad, which should uh, gradually replace our big IVs as some of the devices are, uh, uh, are uh, dying. Uh, we hope it uh, might be uh, better in some uh, some ways, uh, but uh, we are trying to keep it uh, as uh, as compatible as possible with uh, with the all safecast applications and uh, also with our uh, offline workflow using QGIS. So uh, we are not uh, going for uh, something completely different. Um, so I think. That's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you are interested, you can download this uh, presentation from this link. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jan. I'm sure we will come back to you uh, on, on some of the points you mentioned. Uh, let's go now to Ralph Kaiser. Uh, Ralph, you participated uh, and even led multiple missions to Fukushima following the accident. Uh, so what was your experience with, with uh, SafeCast? Okay, so maybe I can give you a couple of um, observations and thoughts that I've had um, on citizen science in general and SafeCast in particular. Um, I was on multiple missions to Fukushima and I took the opportunity to also talk to locals in Fukushima when, when I could. And um, I got the impression that uh, their trust to the official authorities and the credibility of the information that was, uh, you know, given to them wasn't really all that great all the time. And one one message that I got was, uh, "You're from the IAEA. Uh, we're really happy that you're here." And uh, I had the impression that because we were an outsider in that case, um, that was seen as a good thing, and that we had maybe a bit more trust and credibility credit uh, than, you know, than some other, than some other uh, Japanese organizations would have had. And um, if, one, if one thinks about it, how one creates ultimately credibility and trust, then it's probably the best thing to let people participate themselves in the collection and in the analysis and in the distribution of the data. And that's exactly what Safecast does. And um, I think that that's, a really, really important thing um, because credibility of the data and that the people believe that this is real and true is the only thing that then will also make them act on it. And, uh, and that's ultimately really important. Um, even one step further, just if I may generalize it a little bit, um, generally the collection and, and production uh, analysis and dissemination of data uh, has an important role to play in democracy. And uh, if one wants to have government by the people and for the people, then there should be an aspect of also access to the data, creation of the data, and dissemination of data 
by the people, for the people. Um, I think that therefore citizen science, like SafeCast, uh, is making a really important contribution to democracy as such. Um, maybe, maybe one, maybe one more observation. Um, I, I find that in today's world, uh, there's a little bit of a split between how much everything that we do is based on science and technology and the attitude that we often find, um, at least in parts of the public, to science and technology. Science is, is often seen as something that can only be done by scientists and is far removed from the everyday sphere. And in, in some respects, that's probably really true. Not everybody can go and you know, cook up a COVID vaccine in their basement. Um, it's probably a good thing that people don't try to do that. Um, but, but there are other areas, uh, for example, amateur astronomers looking for comets, um, where citizen science is playing a really important role. Like if you have a look at who found comets over the last 20 years, then a lot of them were found by amateur astronomers that, uh, that spent their time looking for comets. And SafeCast is like looking for comets, another excellent example where citizen scientists can do really good quality science and collect data that are valuable. Uh, and at the same time, um, you know, have the public basically create their own data. Um, I find that really important. Um, another, another observation that, I, that I'd like to talk about is how my students react. So I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a course in nuclear power reactors at the University of Glasgow. And part of the course is also uh, radiation protection and environmental radiation measurements and uh, the accident in Fukushima, the aftermath of the accident, etc. And uh, every time I introduce SafeCast, um, the thing that surprises me most is the lack of surprise. So the students are not surprised. They find that this is something that is normal and probably should exist. And they expect that something like SafeCast should be there. And I believe that's because it syncs so perfectly uh, with their experience of uh, the digital world. Information is on my smartphone. That's where I find things. I find things on a website and uh, that I can feed things, that I can feed information in myself as well, which then ends up there and is available for everybody. Um, I, I really am every time surprised that the students are not surprised by this. They, they totally take this as a given. And, and the fact that they are taking it so much as a given is, uh, uh, is a great thing. It just shows that SafeCast naturally should exist. Thank you very much for this uh, reflection, Ralph. Uh, it's interesting the remark you made that there is a change in attitudes across generations with respect to uh, uh, citizen science. Um, we have some, we've had some comments from, uh, before going to Astrid, we've had some comments from ASB appreciating the extensive program of SURO and also from Jan uh, mentioning that OpenStreetMap is also uh, a project that started from something hobby made. Uh, so now uh, we come to Astrid. Um, Astrid, tell us something about your experience. In 2014, you have been uh, participating to the technical meeting of the IAA where SafeCast, uh, I think, first um, described their project and you were uh, quite enthusiastic supporters from the early start. So what was your experience? Thank you, Katrina. Well, I've been to Japan for a number of uh, missions and I've seen how important it is for people with data and also personal data, whether they have a personal dosimeter or they are offered whole body counting or they have somebody in the local community showing them measurement data and explaining to them what numbers means. And uh, when I heard about the SafeCast, I thought that it, it was uh, just a great idea both for the citizens themselves to increase uh, their trust. But I also, as um, being head of the uh, uh, emergency preparedness and response management in our inst uh, authority, I see how uh, this kind of big data coming from the public can add to the sort of scarce resources that you have in the authority. We are a limited number of people. We have a limited number of uh, equipments to to do the surveillance and I feel that uh, it's a good way of having more data coming in 
uh, in an accident situation so that you could faster see where you need to go to do more detailed official um, monitoring uh, to be able to uh, implement the right protective actions in a, in, in a post-accident situation. And I find that it's very uh, interesting what Ralph was saying about that uh, data is important for democracy. Uh, and in Norway, there has been for many years now uh, a very strong official demand that all data that are, are um, produced should be made available to the public. And uh, you are not allowed to sort of uh, produce any data for public money and not uh, display it publicly for, for, uh, for everyone. So we are, of course, also working in uh, this manner. Uh, and the citizen science has not been used so, so far in Norway. Uh, I think we'll get there uh, as well, and uh, I, I certainly have an interest to, to see this develop also for us. But we see that uh, citizen science is being used, for instance, for air monitoring, for bird counting, for many types of environmental data, also for mental health uh, during this ongoing pandemic. So there is certainly an interest in the public to take part in this. And we will be part of a big European project on, uh, on uh, radon and norm, the radon norm project. And citizen science will be a component of that, where we'll be using uh, this um, uh, in a pilot project also in Norway. And moreover, I think that uh, what we see today is that there is a, an increasing distrust in science. There are a lot of fake news. And I think that if you bring people in so that they can actually uh, perform measurements themselves independent of authorities, that will increase the trust and then counteract this distrust that uh, we have, uh, that some people have in science. So I think it, it could be also good for democracy and uh, for people to be able to do their own measurements and, and to understand what it means and to use it independently of, of um, the authorities. Uh, and um, it's interesting to hear about when Ralph mentioned these amateurs, because amateurs are very appreciated in, in uh, many fields, but they are not in radiation. So you can ask why. I think that um, part of the radiation community has been very um, based on physics uh, and has been very conservative and that uh, they have had lots of views on only special people know really what it's all about and can say it accurately what it is. It is this and it's plus and minus one standard deviation. But in a real life situation with a huge fallout after a nuclear accident, that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is to implement action swiftly to protect people and, and the environment. And in that sense, you can then use all of this big data together to have a more uh, sound basis for taking your decisions. And whether it's uh, 75 nanosieverts per hour or 105, that is exactly the same. The point is that it isn't um, 50 microsieverts per hour, you know. So uh, the use of this in a post-accident situation uh, is, as was pointed out, easier than to use this in low uh, dose rate areas in normal life, let's say. But you can use um, uh, this as part of educating the people and then seeing also what is uh, the normal background in areas and compare that to a new fallout situation when you are then suddenly... Um, overwhelmed, let's say, at the authority side for getting as much data in as possible. Okay, thanks very much indeed, uh, Astrid, for these reflections. So now uh, let's open the discussion with everybody, including uh, all those who are attending. Please feel free to pop your questions up and we'll be very happy to take them on. So um, coming back maybe to something that Tanya and other panelists have already mentioned. Um, they argue that there has been change, that uh, safe cast and citizen science has had an effect um, on institutions, associ professional associations and radiation protection communities. But do you think we are beyond recommendations? Um, I mean, do we need, is there 
more need to put this into practice? How, wh what do you think if something happened now, would things be different than if they were 10 years ago? So what do you think? Mm, I, I think so. I think one should give Safecast a lot of credit for uh, actually making it into things like uh, EARPA reports and IAEA technical meetings. Uh, those are actually two really conservative organizations. Uh, they don't just let anybody walk in. Uh, and, and it is a process to actually be recognized and get in there that usually does take years. And it is a lot of, to the credit of Safecast, that Safecast is being recognized there, invited to meetings, speaking at meetings and mentioned in reports. Tanya, you wanted to intervene? Yes, uh, I completely agree with Ralph, but I would also like to add that uh, in if I look from communication point of view, uh, one of the most difficult thing is to communicate measures below the legal norms or the natural background and so on. And now with the safe cast measurements in Europe, we have these natural background measurements. And if something would happen, people can go to these measurements, although if we have also official measurements, huh, they can also cross check with the safe cast measurements and see what is the natural background and if there is something really going on. So this comparison before, during and after, it's extremely helpful and it is now here available, which was not before. And then moreover, I would like to, um, I would like to bring into attention also that uh, Safecast didn't open only a path forward for the nuclear and radiological emergencies, but in general for all radiation protection. For instance, like Astrid mentioned, uh, radon. This is also one of uh, great opportunities for the citizens or, or norm contaminations for the citizens to, to, to measure the radioactivity in the environment, in their homes or in their, uh, in their vicinity. And uh, this is going on. I must say that in the one European project, this uh, Radonorm project, we evaluated uh, the existence of citizen science project in the field of radon. And we identified based on these 10 principles of, of uh, European Citizen Science Association, we identified nine, nine uh, projects in the worldwide that are already could be seen as a citizen science projects and where people measure uh, uh, radiation due to the due to the radon. Two of these nine projects, they existed already before Safecasts. And uh, the rest of these projects, uh, they appeared after Safecast became really well known, and they also refer quite often to the to the Safecast as the as the project uh, where people citizens can measure radioactivity. So yes, of course, the things are changing, and they changed a lot since we have Safecast, and also, of course, since Fukushima happened. So we can be a bit optimistic about that then. Um, and Jan, uh, you are also involved in some activities with citizens measuring uh, uh, radiation. You have an interesting term, you call it radio catching. Can you tell us something about this? Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, based uh, on the map I showed uh, on one of the slides. Uh, I am uh, uh, I prepared some data uh, with positions on uh, uranium mining sites, which uh, might be uh, possible to uh, visit. Uh, some of them are after remediation, so uh, they are safe for the public to visit. And there are no, no holes to fall in and so. Uh, but you can measure uh, some higher uh, dose rates there. Uh, same with uh, some uh, some big granite rocks uh, and some parts. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, I, I think ma many people from the public f found this interesting uh, to uh, if they find some new new anomaly in in nature, uh, they often 
uh, inform us uh, about it. And uh, as, as it appears on the Safecast map, uh, often new, uh, new measurements uh, um, happen in a close time later as uh, other users uh, find this anomaly on the map and decide to visit it too. So. Okay, thank you, Jan. We have a question to Astrid from Genevieve. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, she asks, what could be a good uh, organization with SafeCast? What could be a good way to organize, uh, uh, I guess, emergency response uh, together with SafeCast? If uh, an accident occurs in Europe, how to coordinate the measurements, uh, the measurement organization with SafeCast or Suro tools? Do you have some thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> I don't really know how that uh, can be done as we see it now. Um, I've, I found it interesting to see how the DOE aerial survey data was used also in the SafeCast. Uh, if we think about Europe and, uh, and uh, monitoring data, we have, of course, the EURDEP, which is the European Commission data set for radiation monitoring. It's used in peacetime for all the stationary radiation stations that we have in Norway today and also for air filter data. Uh, but I'm not sure how um, this will be if we have a large accident uh, that uh, has uh, fallout in many European countries, uh, how SafeCast and the official data will be used together. Um, I mean, uh, to pool all the data in one place, let's say. So it's, and I'm not sure if that will be necessary either, that maybe uh, it's, it could be an advantage that SafeCast data um, are, uh, uh, that the SafeCast data only contain sort of citizen data and that the public data are, um, uh, are posted by the different authorities because then people themselves can see, you know, what is um, the official data and what are the, all the other measurements that have been done and, and do, do they match and can we then trust, you know, uh, what the gov uh, governmental data shows. And I was thinking also about uh, this, um, uh, this great work that Zero is doing. Um, and I, I actually have one question and- um, Go ahead. It, it, um, you are now producing your own devices that you will distribute to the public. Um, do you think the public uh, in an accident situation, let's say, will trust the measurements from your sort of official uh, devices as much as devices coming from an NGO? Ian, would you like to take this question? Uh, your microphone is mute. Uh, yeah, uh, I, um, um, so, so, so okay, I, uh, uh, I, I would leave it. Uh, um, yeah, there is, uh, I think there is, there is uh, uh, an area uh, which uh, should be kept for the professionals and uh, uh, another for the citizens, because uh, as uh, uh, yeah, there are some some things the citizens uh, probably would not like to uh, decide, uh, but uh, there is definitely the good thing with the possibility to cross-check the data to see it's. Uh, similar uh, to the official ones uh, and so but uh, uh, if if we if we need uh, advice uh, we, pro uh, we should usually f uh, ask some professional about it no matter which sort of uh, uh, area is that uh, if it is uh, medicine uh, radiation anything Okay, thank you for your uh, response, Ian. Um, 
there was a comment related to the radiation background mentioning the EURDEP system. Of course, countries have such networks in place, but we know that the resolution, I mean, the number of stations in different countries varies. Some countries have a very dense monitoring networks, other less so. Uh, Tanya, would you like to? Yes, of course, I, I, uh, we, we know this. And uh, especially in uh, Belgium, we have a Telerad system, which is really great. and it's publicly uh, accessed uh, information online, but uh, in, uh, from psychological point of view and sociological point of view, we people, we cross check different sources of information. And if you have official source of information and then citizen science source of information and both of them, they say the same, then you believe much more and you act according to the, to the advices that they are complementary to each other. Thank you. Um, Raph, um, yes, you wanted to... Yeah, I'd, I'd like to project a little bit into the future. So if one, if one looks at what the actual current impact right now is on official policy, then it's really just in the beginnings. I mean, as I said before, the SafeCast is there and SafeCast is recognized, but really uh, this is a big super tanker that is moving slowly. And uh, mostly radiation protection is done by radiation protection professionals. And uh, anything that comes in in addition is, is taken up slowly. However, if one projects it a bit into the future, and if one assumes that the number of sensors keeps increasing and there's more and more data being produced in the future, then at, at some point, um, quantity is a quality of its own. If there's more data there, that, that can be had by accessing, uh, you know, publicly created data through citizen science, then the data that is created by uh, radiation protection agencies themselves, um, they'll have to go there and use the data. It's really a matter of also how much is there and, uh, and, and can it be used. Uh, and let me give you an example of, um, you know, slightly related, but, but a bit different. Um, after the accident in Fukushima happened, uh, the official website of the IAA became inaccessible because too many people were, were going and wanting to look up information. And uh, the then head of public relations of the agency went and put the information on Facebook. And on Facebook, uh, the IAEA page on Facebook kept, uh, remained accessible all the way along. And, uh, and it, the traffic was a few percent of overall Facebook traffic. And uh, for me, that's a nice illustration that really quantity is a quality of its own. And if there is a lot, then then that's where one will move. Tanya, you wanted to react as well? Yes, I would like to uh, upgrade something what Ralph already said. In the future, uh, I would like to encourage uh, also citizen science initiatives like SafeCast as well, to also to contribute to science, not only to use the citizens as a, a, a crowdsourcing or maybe also interpretation of the results and understanding of the results, but also really to connect to the to the research organizations and contribute to the to the research questions. This would be really great also in the future, and it, I think it would help also for recognition of the of their work and uh, recognition of uh, and validation of their uh, of the results of the citizen scientists. You're mute, catch it out. Yeah, we have a big storm in Belgium, so I've just heard the big thunder, so I muted myself. Um, so uh, Asby was pointing out, and several other people pointed out, the importance of informal contacts. Um, so when when is there a time to switch from informal to formal and to have clear guidelines for the inclusion of, of uh, citizen science data in emergency response. So what's your thought on that? Maybe uh, Astrid or uh, Jan would like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I uh, just wanted to add uh, also one thing uh, which I uh, find great that the huge uh, SafeCast data set uh, also made it possible uh, Many, many student projects to happen as as I know 
there were no such data available before so uh, it can uh, as as it uh, as the data are uh, spatial with uh, some time in uh, date interval uh, time date information it can be used uh, for um, many uh, many gis visualization and web projects uh, and uh, i am also using it a lot uh, when we cooperate with the students as the, uh, as I always uh, take some part of the safeguard data set and provide it to the students to, let's say, play with it. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Astrid, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think that uh, we will certainly be uh, investigating more about how we can uh, work with the citizen science and, and, and safe in the safe cast system uh, if we have a new emergency. So this is certainly something that we will look into in the coming years. Um, you can never have enough data, <laughs> usually, uh, and the, the authorities uh, do not have enough equipment and resources uh, to, to map every single uh, street uh, in in Norway, although we have, of course, aerial monitoring, which can take larger parts, but then there's much coarser data. So I think that uh, for the reassurance of the public, uh, it will be important that they have measurement data from their own street, from their own garden, etc., uh, or at least someone in their neighborhood. So, um, and we know that also from the Chernobyl accident that people uh, were very uh, keen on getting uh, local data. That was the most important thing for them. So uh, we will certainly look into how uh, SafeCast uh, and uh, uh, and the authorities can, you know, benefit from each other uh, if there is a new accident. Uh, thank you. Yes, Arap. I think there's an additional angle here um, where developing countries are concerned. Um, so if you have a country like, let's say, Belgium, for example, where there is a radiation protection monitoring network, uh, the data are publicly available, and then you're adding some privately generated citizen science data, um, they're not really filling a gap. They're, they're additional, they, they lend additional credibility, but there isn't really a clear need where there wasn't something before. It's, it, it already is being monitored. Um, but I remember, for example, a conversation uh, with, with a colleague in Nepal uh, who, after the Fukushima accident, got a phone call from his prime minister and the prime minister said, OK, so are we in danger in Nepal? And he said, well, actually, we don't have a detector. We can't tell you. And at that moment in time, that really literally in, in Nepal was no way to measure environmental radioactivity. And that is a country that borders only on nuclear powers. Uh, so, you know, Pakistan, India, China, uh, so they did not have those means. And uh, if you've seen, uh, I was really happy to see Akmal half an hour ago or an hour ago, uh, who was talking about his project in, in Uzbekistan. Um, I, I think, uh, I think SafeCast can actually help fill gaps uh, in countries where the cost of equipment and setting up a you know, stationary monitoring network uh, is not an option, um, but having people be able to monitor things and feed them in themselves uh, is also a low cost option that replaces nothing. There was nothing before, and then there's information after, and that's a big qualitative difference. Hey, hi. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Jan, you would like to also react? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, it was a great point uh, by Ralph. Uh, we did some uh, some tries with uh, taxi drivers uh, and with the big ID. So we proved that uh, the we do not need uh, experienced users for the safecast uh, devices. So uh, we can in in such case use uh, after some short short advice some common people. Uh, that could be especially for the, for the developed countries uh, important as uh, we can send a guy on, on the motorcycle or some taxi driver to do the monitoring and uh, then uh, at some point just pick up the devices and pro process the data. So I think this is also great as you do not need uh, some uh, radiation uh, 
spe specialists for doing uh, doing the monitoring. Um, thank you, Ian. There was a, also another question for you that in the case of an accident, how would you imagine the distribution of the tools you have developed? Uh, which uh, which tools? Uh... Uh, so the question was, how does Suro imagine the distribution of the tools you are developing for uh, citizen science if there was an accident near the Czech Republic? Uh, we have already some cooperation uh, with the uh, emergency system with the f firefighters uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, so uh, this this could be done uh, with them. Uh, we have some uh, the f firefighters has stations uh, across the whole country. Uh, so they could uh, manage the monitoring and uh, they are also uh, we also uh, had uh, some other cooperation with the other parts for uh, of the first responders uh, in, in this country okay thank you um your colleague uh, Peter Kucha uh, was making the remark that the devices should be distributed before the, any incident. Well, this is, yes, uh, always a, a matter of discussion, I suppose. Um, we have five minutes to wrap up. Yes, Ralph, please. I think it should be clear that if there's actually an accident, nobody's going to say walk towards the accident and take some data, right? That's, that's not what anybody's going to do. Uh, if you have a device that measures data, then leave it somewhere where it can take data and, you know, stay inside and don't go out if there's an accident. Okay, so... Katrina, can, can, I, can I be cheeky and yes. exercise a, a little yes. bit of privilege? In, I, so yes. I'm terribly sorry, I'm not going to sneak in to ask the question I want to ask. So uh, I've been following this, you know, avidly really interesting in the We've set this section up looking back, you know, have, have SafeCast influenced it. I'd just like to ask the panel's opinion, to turn it around slightly. I want to pose the question, can, can governments, can officialdom ignore say, this anymore? The reality was that SafeCast came into existence because it needed to. I, we've just lived through 2020 uh, in, the, in the COVID years. There's a plethora of information and the population has shown that it will do what it wants to do do you think the point will come where if something happens, the trusted data source is not going to be the government. It's going to be uh, the citizen science and the government are actually going to have to turn, the boot's going to be on the other foot. They're going to need to persuade the citizen scientists to follow the policy rather than telling the citizens that they have to follow the policy because they say so. I, I, I think if the last year's taught me anything, it's like, it's, they only get locked down when everybody understands and agrees. And, I, and I, I would like to have the panels feel for whether we're kind of phrasing this wrong and actually the power let lies somewhere else, they just might not realize it. So let's uh, hear our panelists' opinion. Tanya, would you like to start? Yes, uh, I would like to say that citizen science, like also safecast, of course, they contribute to credibility and trust, like it was pointed just right now by Jan. And uh, in every nuclear or radiological emergencies, either with the radiological consequences or no radiological consequences, there is many voices, many opinions, many views and many standpoints. And uh, citizen scientists are one of those voices and they got, are more and more heard. For instance, ruthenium case uh, two years ago, increased of ruthenium in Europe. Uh, of course, uh, uh, safety, uh, nuclear safety authorities, they voiced their opinion with a bit of delay because they need to cross check and they need to get an approval from the all the hierarchy and so on. While citizens, they also voiced their uh, opinion uh, on this increased uh, ruthenium in the in the northern hemisphere, and uh, they were they were much faster, and their voice was heard much much more. For instance, Safecast published a blog that was uh, how to say studied by the European Commission. 
I must say they wanted to know what safecast set and what is the position of the safecast. So it okay. is uh, safecast became a recognized voice in the public and also authorities, they started to take into account the voice of citizen scientists. Yes, the scientists and authorities, they have more measurements, they are more scientific, they are better, they are, I don't know what, but still the citizen scientists networks, they, they can have, they can first express their opinion much faster. And uh, uh, second, they are they they contribute to credibility and trustworthiness. So the future is collaborate together, learn from each other, listen to each other, and exchange. That that Thanks. would be my advice. Thanks, Tanya. <laughs> I think this summarizes pretty well uh, the discussion. Anybody else would like to uh, comment shortly on this? Yeah. Raf, think, shortly. Shortly, quickly, we're all from countries where by and large our government generally can believe most of the time on most things. Uh, Western style democracies make up about a quarter of the countries in the world. That means that for actually the larger part of humanity, trusting their governments is maybe not always the normal thing that they do. And uh, knowledge by the people for the people is an important part of uh, freedom, government by the people, for the people, democracy, all of those things. And uh, citizen science like SafeCast can, can play a small role, but an important role in that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ian or Astrid, would you like to uh, give your thoughts very shortly on this? Uh, I think uh, that uh, ignoring SafeCast or other uh, citizen science projects uh, would be um, stupid, really. Uh, we know that people are very digital. They are searching, searching information everywhere. Uh, there are uh, different ways of using your mobile phone for measuring radiation, which is much poorer than the safe cost instruments that people believe in. Uh, so we need to uh, remember what, what was said about how students are not surprised that there is such a thing as safe cost. And we need to know that these are the young people growing up uh, and uh, they expect something different than old, uh, than, you know, us, the old uh, natural scientists. Uh, so uh, we need to incorporate that. I mean, the, the world is changing. People's uh, expectations are changing and we just have to follow up on that. Yeah. Thank you, Astrid. Jan, did you want to say anything else? Else will, yes? I think the most important points uh, were already said here. So Okay, so we'll maybe end with this positive message that the future is collaboration. And I'd like to thank very much uh, our uh, panelists, uh, also all the people behind the screens, um, Ian and uh, Luis and Merichel, who have helped with the technical organization, of course, also Asby and, and uh, Peter. And I'd like to thank uh, all, the pen all the attendees uh, via Zoom or via the YouTube. And I think uh, we can move forward to the next exciting events uh, planned. Next one, which is going to be a video. <laughs> Hugh Mary. Hello, dear Safecasters. Happy 10th anniversary. My name is Mirjana Ciovic. I am a researcher at the Vincha Institute of Nuclear Sciences, University of Belgrade in Serbia. In 2017, I had opportunity to attend the workshop in the field of environmental mapping in the International Center for Theoretical Physics in uh, Trieste, Italy. There I met uh, wonderful people all around the globe and I uh, built uh, my uh, first BGAIGI uh, device. Uh, since then I don't know how many uh, records I made and uh, I remember that at the beginning I carried uh, my uh, device everywhere I go. Uh, for me, it was interesting uh, to compare radiation dose rates uh, arising from soil 
uh, radiation uh, measured uh, in the laboratory with uh, big IG recorded uh, those rates. Also, I remember uh, the first time I was traveled by plane taking a uh, big IG with me. It was very exciting uh, to observe uh, changes in radiation measurements uh, with the change in uh, altitude. In the collaboration with my colleagues from the University of Novi Sad, Department of Physics, and via Observatory of the University of Seged, vertical ionization profile was measured using Big IG Nano lifted by meteorological balloon. In those measurements was registered anomaly in the atmospheric ionizing radiation in a very narrow altitude region and I hope that those results will be published soon. Personally, I think that citizen science can uh, serve as a pool of knowledge if it is interpreting properly. Wish you all the best, share your findings. Knowledge is unlimited and it belongs to everyone. Good luck. So welcome back, uh, everybody. What a fascinating conversation we've just had. Um, I know there was an awful lot of conversation going on in the, in the chat between the panelists, um, a lot of uh, differing views on, on some of the topics, and I'm sure that those will continue um, off screen. Um, we've spoken about citizen science now in terms of its place uh, potentially against official sources of data. Now we want to take a, a look and see how um, SafeCast could be used as a potential model for others looking to engage um, with members of the public or for members of the public to engage with science um, and scientific practice in, in other areas and potentially um, to look at other aspects. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Ian to look at citizen science and SafeCast um, with uh, Yoko, Akiba and Marco. So uh, over to you, Ian, as the moderator. Thank you very much, Louise. So I will hopefully uh, talk for a little bit while everybody else uh, please adds the spotlights for the other panelists. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to have Marco Zanaro, Akiba uh, from Freak Labs and Yoko Kevins, also from uh, SQSEN. Um, to discuss uh, citizen science and perspectives on SafeCast. And we're going to begin by, by going to Yorker. Uh, and I'll ask, rather than take up time so that we keep the flow going, perhaps uh, as I go to each person, you can maybe just give a brief friend to yourself rather than me doing it as a, as a whole. And we'll, there's kind of three questions we've got for this section. Yorker is going to take us back uh, to thinking about just actually what, what do we mean by citizen science? So I think it's one of these terms that means a lot of things to different people. So we'll get our answer from Yoke, at least for this session, and then we can debate it at the end, as I'm sure it will always be debatable. Uh, and then we'll, uh, Marcos, uh, I'm really glad he's here. To You've seen the Safecast stories and the interaction with lots of young people. Uh, a lot of that came from uh, the benefit of interacting with ICTP in 2017. So Marco will tell us a lot about his experiences uh, internationally, uh, going beyond, you know, the community in Europe and the community in Japan, uh, to much wider field uh, for the reach that ICTP and, and the IA has and in, in interacting with scientists from developing countries. And then to come back, you know, I, I'm a physicist, I like my gadgets and my gizmos and uh, Freak Labs, the keeper, uh, will tell us why, you know, why we're able to do this and, and maybe give us some, some tantalizing tastes of the, of the cool bits of kit to come. So it's uh, uh, and then we'll discuss it as we go in at the end, but uh, uh, now I, I'm going to shut up and hand over to Yoke to, to really get, you know, get, give us a definition of citizen science. Thank you, Ian. Um, so my name is Yoke Kienans. I'm a PhD student um, at the University of Leuven and SEK. And for the past four years, I've been uh, researching citizen science after Fukushima. I've also interviewed um, SafeCast members to contribute to my research. Um, and it might be during my um, talk that there are some special effects as there is some thunder and heavy rain here. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but I've been asked to um, go deeper into the question of what is citizen science, try to come up with a sort of def uh, definition and also um, discuss how it has uh, changed over the past decade. And I can say that um, giving a definition of citizen science has become increasingly difficult. Um, it's, it has actually become one of, uh, yeah, 
it has become a topic within citizen science research itself. I've also uh, researched um, about this in Japan. Um, and instead of coming up with a definition, uh, that would be a, too big of a challenge. I decided to give you four keywords, um, which I think summarize or at least give, a, a, give an idea of citizen science. So my four keywords are um, umbrella term, citizen, engagement, involvement or participation and science. And I will go into each of these keywords um, deeper as I go along. Um, so my first keyword was um, umbrella term. Um, over the past decade, there have been many typologies of citizen science indicating that citizen science is not one type of science or there is not one citizen science, but there are actually many types of citizen science. And um, also in the past five years, I would say that there, is, there has been increased attention given to the fact that citizen science also differs amongst countries within regions. Um, if I'm talking about burgerwetenschap in Dutch, it might mean something different than um, in Japanese, for example. Um, so there are these cultural and societal differences, which makes citizen science even more complex. And then there is also the question of um, who actually initiated uh, a citizen science project. For example, in Safecast's uh, case, it's citizens who really took, um, yeah, who developed um, devices on their own, who went out on the field, measured, um, also um, did uh, put these measurements online. But then there are also other uh, citizen science projects who are initiated by uh, research institutions. So instead of one citizen science, there are many kinds. Moving on to who is the citizen that we are talking about when, um, yeah, uh, within citizen science. Um, when I was doing research in Japan and I asked um, SafeCast members, are you citizen scientists? They would say yes. But in other cases, in, um, in other organizations in Fukushima, I also sometimes got the answer no. I'm not a citizen scientist because I'm not a professional scientist. Um, I don't have a degree in physics in, um, in, in science or whatsoever, so I cannot be a citizen scientist. And then, so this, this already indicates that citizen is sometimes debatable. And then if we look at who it gets actually involved as volunteers in citizen science projects these days, um, there is also a mix, but not all layers of society are always um, addressed. And this is a challenge that um, citizen science will have to address in the upcoming years, I think. And then in terms of engaging involvement and participation of science, there are many types of different uh, citizen science projects, as I've mentioned before. And um, sometimes this means that citizens are involved only in um, data collection, but are sometimes involved uh, setting up a research project, uh, gathering the data, also um, interpreting the data. So there is a via, um, yeah, there are various um, citizen science projects, and not one type of citizen science is not better than the others. It's exactly this mix of uh, projects that makes citizen science very interesting. And then um, question of science. Um, I think in the previous roundtable, this has been discussed uh, quite intensely already and um, also showcases that this is a, a topic of discussion or at least a discussion that could last for hours. Um, but I think uh, SafeCast has in the past decades um, challenged this notion of what is science, what do we understand as science and how should and uh, can um, citizens become involved in uh, scientific research. All this to say that I've given you four keywords um, and I really wanted to answer just one question, what is citizen science, but probably I've raised more questions than I, than I have answered. But this is also exactly the point I wanted to make. Um, in the past decades, citizen science has, um, has enabled us to ask all these questions, to discuss. And this is also what um, is yeah, valuable of, uh, about citizen science and also what keeps citizen science going and thriving. Thank you. 
I want me, I want me, so thank you very much, Yoke. Uh, and that's going to take us nicely into the discussion with Marco. I was just, I, I, I mean, before we before we dive into Marco's section, we'll get started. We, you know, we're on the clock, we've got time. I was really intrigued there with the notion of uh, I can't be it because I'm a I'm not a scientist. And you know, I, I always, you know, I, I kind of think back, you know, the, the 19th century stuff. What does it mean? It's you know, this science is a shorthand for scientific method. I mean, it's but now it's worn as a kind of cloak and you know, we get you're in the realms of uh, CP snows and two cultures and things like this. And this is something that, I mean, today's event, we've heard, we've got all sorts of music and different things coming together. I think this is, you know, if you if you wanted to answer that kind of two cultures question, you know, bridging the gap, actually community like Safecast is is something that says, well, that that's a, a, a fallacy. It's not true. People are both. And, and depending on what they're doing, and I am a, I am not a scientist, as, as colleagues of mine would say, I'm not a chemist. I'm really not a chemist. So, but I, I'm a scientist because I'm a physicist. But I'm not a scientist because I'm not a chemist. I, I, I wonder, you know, what heart or what lens, and and how people self-reflect and choose whether they're engaged or not. Do you do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think, um, yeah. In, in in case of Japan, it also has to do how science is perceived uh, in Japanese culture. I got a sense that science is something that is, um, yeah, of value. Um, that is considered for yeah as as rights something um, esteemed, and especially um, considering that many members that I've interviewed um, have yeah they have no background but they um, are for example mothers um, who became involved in um, in measuring radiation after Fukushima. Um, there is this um, image of what science should be and what they are doing, and that doesn't match up always. I think that's more or less the issue. So to to keep to keep us going, and it's especially as you, as you brought it back to the conversation of thinking about what is in Japan, uh, this seems like a perfect segue to talk to Marco and say, Marco, you know, you out of all of us, you're the ones that probably has the most contact with the most young people developing sciences scientists of anyone in the panel. Uh, I, I mean, I I worked with you for a good few years, but you've been to more places and met more young people than I have. So. I'd be, you know, why don't you tell us a bit about that school, but then maybe also, you know, all these people that you're meeting through ICTP, I mean, presumably they all think of themselves as scientists. Uh, I, I know your conversations during the schools, maybe you could share some of that with the audience. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, that looks like, you know, a previous life, right? <laughs> now, meeting people from all over the world, you know, physically, now it's, it's mostly virtual. So I, I do have some slides that I want to share, should be on now. So I would like to tell you a bit about this workshop that has been uh, mentioned today in a in, in few occasions. Um, it was organized by the ICTP and the Atomic Agency in 2017. So let me just tell you one slide why ICTP uh, is you know, interested in citizen science and what is the ICTP. ICTP stands for International Center for Theoretical Physics. It is a research organization funded more than 50 years ago by a Nobel laureate called Abdul Salam, coming from Pakistan. We're a category one in, uh, UNESCO institution, which means that we're a UN organization, and we work closely with the Atomic Agency. And the idea of the ICTP is to create a hub where people can meet people from all over the world. So this is not a center for developing countries. It's a center where people from developing countries and from industrialized countries can meet and carry out research together. Why are we interested in citizen science? So we have theoretical physics in our name, but the mission is to uh, support and to foster science in developing countries. And we do that in the framework of what is called open science. So Yoke just mentioned this umbrella concept. And if you look at the umbrella concept of open science, you see that one of the components, in fact, is citizen science. And the reason why we're interested in that at the CTP is, first of all, the lack of scientific measurements. We just heard that in, in the previous session from, from Ralph, mentioning that very often citizen science is the only option for many of the scientists. Second reason is that we're talking about big data, machine learning, and so on, but they all need data. So if you don't have data in the first place, there's very little you can do. Third point is that you know, scientists are citizens. So it's, you know, we might ask if you know, citizens are scientists, but without any doubt, scientists are citizens. So 
And finally, the, the last point is outreach. So we want to outreach, uh, you know, in the whole society. So working on citizen science is very interesting for, you know, that point of view as well. Looking back to the activity, it has, you know, an acronym, SMR 2858. SMR stands for seminar. It was three weeks long in March 2017. We had 28 particip participants from 25 different countries. So, uh, you know, alphabetically from Armenia to Zambia. So we had from A to Z. And there are some statistics here. You see that uh, most of the participants um, do come from, from developing countries. There is an e a even distribution, a third come from Africa, third from Asia, and a third from Latin America and, and Europe. There are young people that again was, uh, you know, mentioned today many times, and 70% were junior, so meaning less than 30 years old. Uh, gender is, you know, a kind of usual distribution of activities in, in the scientific world. So about 30% of participants were, were female. What was special about this activity, it was a hands-on activity. So again, we have theoretical physics in our name, but we really like this uh, philosophy. So with Ian, we agreed on, on, on working in, in, you know, along this line. So tell me and I forget, teach me and I might remember, but involve me and I learn. That is a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And we really believe that that's, that's important. So as one picture can mean more than a thousand worlds, I, 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 I added some, some pictures here. So the workshop was three weeks long. So the first week was devoted to building the Big Aigi. That was uh, with the help and support of Asby and, and Joe. Second week was about data. So what to do with the data that we collect with the Big Aigi. And third week was about dissemination or uh, about uh, you know, letting people know uh, what they can do with the data that we that we collect. So this was the environment. So again, first week was you know some lectures and then a lot of of hands. and people started by soldering, and that was in many cases their first time they ever soldered something. So in one week you go from soldering, uh, you know, learning about soldering to soldering a device that should be working properly. So that's you know a big, a big achievement. You've seen the first pictures. People look you know worried maybe and concentrated, and so they learn how to solder properly. We of course had support of Asby and and Joe in teaching them, and you know after they started working together. This is also quite interesting in in these sort of activities. You have this uh, you know peer to peer learning, so not just from the lectures or from the uh, you know, tutors, but from the peers uh, as well. So people that know how to solder teach to other people. And finally, the you know, happy faces, people that start uh, you know, getting uh, uh, working and you know, sharing their experience. So each participant would have one device, which would, they would then take. And finally, at the end of the first week, they had the working device which of course we tested, it worked properly. And so you see many, many happy faces. Um, of course, this wasn't, you know, soldering something they wouldn't understand. So it was not just, you know, repeating something that they would learn, but it was actually learning how the device. And again, you see very, very happy. The interesting aspect is that as the course was three weeks, they had the chance to travel from Trieste, which is in the Northeastern part of Italy, to other places. So during the first weekend, they brought the device with their uh, you know, peers. So this was people moving in, in for people going to Venice, to uh, you know, many European cities, carry the devices with them. So they would carry out some measurements while traveling, ready for the second week where they would learn how to make sense of this, of this data. And in fact, this is, is the second week where, you know, ASBI was uh, connecting to, uh, to set the, the, the results. There's Joe, uh, you know, helping participants in, in uh, finding access. And this is again, Joe in, in Venice, I believe, carrying out some measurements. It was extremely empowering because again, in three weeks you get from, you know, learning how to solder to building a device to carrying out some measurements 
and to measurement. People in people in nearby Slovenia, people in in Venice walking with their with their. And this is the second week, so you would see the the trace uh, from the GPS with the measurement. This I think is is from Venice, and you know discussing with their peers. Uh, you know what this data would would mean. So second and third week again, we had presentations, uh, study presentations, and then we had this very strong social networking aspect, which I think was really special about this event. I think it was unique and it lasted very long. So this was the new year in the Iranian uh, calendar. So we celebrated that as well. And then the third week was again about uh, uh, presenting the data and talking to the public. So learning how, you know, how to discuss with public, how to make uh, you know, decisions on what to say that you collected. Again, very strong people having fun. And third week was a discussions and you know, happy participants. Aspect is that we set up a Telegram group. And this has been running for four years now. This is a post from the, uh, last year where a participant from Dominican Republic shared his data uh, measure with the big eye game that was given to him uh, during the workshop. So it lasted you know, more than three years. So this really created a very strong community. That's all from my side for this first round. Thanks. Uh, so just uh, very, yeah, uh, I suppose. So I, just, I mean, I'm going to steal, we're, we're, we're a bit tight, but uh, just to come back, for those of you that were on earlier, the theme song for the event is called Make Me Smile. Uh, I have to confess, there's a few messages watching you put those pictures up. Uh, you know, uh, Peter was telling me off last night, he said, you're, you're a grumpy thoughts when you never smile. Well, you know, that was a great event, just just seeing those pictures coming back. And there was one thing that you that you you. You mentioned about the soldering. I think it's worth just bringing out. It's this business of getting buy-in. Um, the fact that the people uh, were had the opportunity to build their own device, they had a sense of ownership about the device, participation in it, and it translates. Well, not not that much data, but uploading the measurements obviously it, it, it tailed off later. And for me, I, I was just, as I was thinking about it as you were talking there, Marco. I mean, the, the very first let's say distributed science that I ever knew of was the kind of, you know, the SETI search where you could download a little program on your computer and it would analyze a bit of data. And it was kind of fun, but you got bored with it. Well, at least I got bored with it fairly quickly because it was just, you know, yes, you can use my computer, but I don't really do anything for it. But in this project, it's completely different. And I remember that, that sense over the three weeks where there was a, a very strong involvement in the activity. I wonder if you, if you if you, you want to just add a remark about you know this this the importance of this of getting the buy-in and then having the much longer lasting effect. I'll just say that all the videos you're seeing today are because I sent a message on the telegram. Um, and so that's how strong that community is, even after all this thing. So so Marco. Absolutely, yes, yes. That's really important. So in, in, in many of these countries, getting a you know scientific device or scientific instrument. It's something that is, you know, valued as super expensive and something you would never own. In fact, it does happen sometimes that in, in developing countries, devices are not used because people fear about, you know, breaking them. So what will happen if I break this device? I will have to, you know, pay for it. I don't really own it. It's owned by some organization in the North or in some rich country. So building the device from scratch, learning how to solder, putting it together, using it, you know, validating the data has been extremely empowering. I think it's it's really unique. And that segues us brilliantly on to the next phase of discussing hardware. So Akiva, uh, could, could maybe I can hand over to you and you can you can tell us about uh, the, the the evolution of of uh, electronics and you know devices that are that are making you know a nice bright rosy future. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, I'm so. I'm actually gonna, sh I have some slides. I'd like to share my screen really quickly. Um, so 
Hi, everyone. I'm Akiba from Freak Labs. Uh, I was one of the original designers of the SafeCast hardware in 2011, specifically the geotagging radiation sensors, aka BGAIGI, as well as the fixed radiation sensor network, aka NGAIGI. So today I'm here to talk about citizen science and what can happen in the next 10 years, especially in the context of technology. Uh, so if I look to the future of citizen science, I would say the toolkit is much broader than what we had available in 2011 when SafeCast started. This will have a profound impact in the types of projects people will undertake with more sophisticated projects undertaken as uh, civilian projects. I mean, um, it's just, you can't really even kind of contrast it, I think. So, and we'll get into that in a second. I think, um, there are a lot of things impacting the future of citizen science, but some that are having the most profound impact right now are the proliferation of low cost technology. The cost of computing hardware is dropping like a rock. So most notably, it's a, you can see it by the Raspberry Pi Pico, which was uh, recently announced. It's a dual core 32 bit processor board and costs $4, four US dollars. So these have more computing power than a VAX workstation, which cost nearly a million dollars in 1990. And that's approximately when I graduated from high school. So it's really just amazing right now. Um, also, there are really impressive things happening in the communications world too. The wireless sensor network world seems to be standardizing on LoRa, which stands for long range, as the protocol of choice. LoRa is quite amazing in the distances it can achieve and the fact that when not in use, it's extremely low power. So for me, um, deploying wildlife, like so I work in wildlife and environmental uh, monitoring and deploying wildlife environmental technology in remote places in the world, being able to have a battery life of six months to a year is huge. There's also a big change from when we ran SafeCast in 2011, um, and that's the availability of cellular and satellite communications. Um, like at the time it was also available, but it was much more difficult to use. So you had to have a special deal with the phone companies, like for cellular communications, you had to have a special uh, deal with the phone companies to get multiple SIM cards. And you had to have like, if you didn't have that deal, then you'd have to have like a special, some kind of, you have to buy a package plan for every uh, SIM card that you wanted. So today, most phone providers have IOT plans where you can get SIMs and cellular connectivity for around $2 a month, which is amazing. Um, satellite connectivity has also become more available, much cheaper and smaller. And so it's like, they've gotten so small that, uh, in bird tracking, people are attaching satellite uh, communications devices to birds to uh, track their migration. And there's also a lot of advanced technology available such as LIDAR, drones, uh, thermal imagers, particle counters, gas sensors, and spectral photometers. And that's just naming a few. I won't even get into cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and satellite imaging. Like that's, you know, that is exploding right now too. With these types of tools, it's really, it's really possible to create technology that couldn't have been imagined even just a few decades ago. So I think right now we are really living in the future. And I think within the next 10 years, these will just get more and more developed and also uh, ubiquitous. Um, what does this mean for citizen science? So although the cost of technology has decreased, it's still not a utopian situation. And we're seeing some cracks forming already. Um, one of the biggest issues are between the haves and have nots. So the digital divide is widening. Many of the platforms and devices are only accessible to engineers or technically advanced people. So I work in wildlife and environmental monitoring with extremely smart scientists but they don't have a background in technology, so they don't know what their options are and what options are available. And conversely, engineers know what options are available, but don't know what the big problems that need solving are. And we need to figure out how to bridge those gaps. Um, there's also a proliferation of computing platforms that if you're not in the tech industry are dizzying. When SafeCast started, 
most people just use the Arduino platform. The new kid on the block at that time was Raspberry Pi. Now there's kind of decision overload. So people have limited time and they don't know which platform to choose. And right now, like choosing a platform is like laying down chips at a roulette table. Like where would they invest their time? So in the projects that uh, we do, like as Freak Labs and the courses we teach, we standardize on the following three platforms, which is Python for application software, Arduino for embedded computing and device hardware, and uh, LoRa for wireless communications. And actually, so like, uh, and I'm also, I'm also personally watching Marco very closely because Marco, who's also on this panel, uh, like standardize, standardizes on Python, uh, and also MicroPython on embedded devices, which is uh, really interesting, and LoRa for wireless. And so that's, so the MicroPython is actually really exciting too, but uh, we're still kind of uh, wait, waiting and seeing on that. Um, so actually there's many other things to look forward to and also to watch out for, but I think we can save that for another talk. So in the meantime, thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, I will stop sharing now and. Thank you very much, Akiva. That was, that's, uh -huh. that's really interesting and a good, uh, and, a, and a very wide ranging summary. Um, so I, I, in fact, you, you, you threw me off there at the end. So, so, cause I had a question in mind and I kind of get, I kind of lost it a little bit, but uh, yes. So give, there we go. Right, it's back. Uh, Swiss cheese for brain when it catches up. <laughs> the, the way that these, the, these, the sessions are going today. I, I'm kind of intrigued there. We'll come back to hardware, and if you, you know, if you caught the end of the first talk, it was, you know, it's what Dan's final point was kind of like. Well, you know, actually, maybe the future looks like the methodology and the engagement, and and less like the hardware. But the hardware is really critical, and we're, and we're, you know, we've come back to that point here. We've discussed the buy-in, but in the previous session, we've been debating, you know, how. Will will official them use it? How does this get adopted? I think the end of it at this point, you know, in the day, not just this session. It's it's, it's a nice place to kind of have a look at it and going. Well, what's the experience of Safecast after the ten years on all of these things? There, we're now at a point where we've got to choose a future. So there's brilliant new hardware available, but some of the problems that were in 2011 are still problems. But the problems of people, and I think you were alluding to that actually the people issue is getting worse because there is separation of uh, the people with problems and people who are interested in solving the problem. So uh, I, I, I kinda, I'll throw, go back to you, Akiba, first, but then I think we just have an open conversation for the remaining uh, nine minutes before Louise comes in. So uh, please, Akiba, if you'd like to start. Um, I guess, like, so I think there are a couple of questions in there, but I think, I, I think you hit on a really important one, which is that people are probably the most critical in this. Like, I think, um, like, y you have engineers and technically savvy people, but they need, like, they need to, or I guess we need to work with domain specialists. And there needs to be that co cooperation or to bridge that uh, divide. Otherwise, like the people that I, the scientists I work with in environmental uh, monitoring, then they're like just complete experts of the field, but they don't know what options are avail available. And so, um, Whereas I think there's a lot of new options that are recently uh, possible, like especially like sat like satellite communications, right? So in very remote areas, that like it's like oh sure we can do that, and then I think they're just like stunned, and then but if it were up to me, then I'd be measuring the wrong things. Whereas they're like oh that's a solved problem. We know we know that's possible. This is what we're really interested in, and that's that's really important. Marco, are you okay? You want to jump in, or, or, or a more pointed question, or have you got something uh, to add? Yeah, sure. So just to point out that so now we have the engineers, we have the domain experts, and from the you know previous session, we need to have the policy experts as well, right? And when we're talking about you know wireless equipment like you know, satellite devices, I mean they're available on the market, but it might be really hard to get them in some specific countries. So you have that aspect of policy as well. And then, and then we have the citizens, right? What, well, you know, Joker uh, raised. So how, how do they play in this? So it's, it's I think, quite challenging and, 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 and quite interesting.
Um, you look like I, you want to say something, you okay? I'm not sure, yes? Yes, um, yeah, I wanted to say that um, I just feel that this technical device might also play a role, for example, for citizens who have no um, background in, um, yeah, and for example, computer science or, yeah, more natural sciences, um, which may also play a role uh, in, yeah, which may also increase the divide or, yeah. So there is also um, maybe a need to um, have some kind of equipment or sensors that can be readily, readily um, can be used um, by, by citizens who have no uh, background knowledge in or have no knowledge on how these sensors actually work, but can operate them. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, I think like uh, user interface design is actually really important because um, like ultimately, like, like the engineer is there just to kind of, kind of materialize the concept, but ultimately the engineer is probably not gonna be the one that operates the devices. Um, so to, to, to just ask a specific question, I, so I, I think the three of you probably have a, a good feel for other projects that are going out there. I know air, so Safecast is involved in, in air quality, but air quality has become a really important thing to many people. Uh, are there other groups in, coming out in the world that are looking to Safecast? And, you know, do you have a, have a sense of what they, what, what they're taking away from Safecast in terms of a mo as a model of being a citizen science organization, you know, a transparent, you know, Safecast, to take a specific example, Safecast has been very keen on the CC0 transparency of data, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this is a debate for some people. I, I'd be interested to know if you, if what your thoughts are about, are, are other people looking at what Safecast has done this last 10 years and thinking, yes, that that's the right model, we should do things like that, or do they see flaws in what Safecast have done and, and should Safecast be paying attention to uh, what other people uh, who, you know, the new kids in the block, you know, if you're, you get old and you stand still and you get kicked out of the way from behind. That's well, the I, if I might, yeah, if I might comment on that. So I, I, I work at ICTP, so I work for UNESCO. And this concept of open science, I think is quite interesting because it is an umbrella concept that has so many components. Uh, you know, there's open access, of you know, publications and of data. There's open data, there's citizen sciences, open hardware, there's open source. And so if I think about a project that you know, can tick all these components, I think that's Safecast. Very often projects you know, focus on one specific field, you know, the, or, you know, making data open, but then the hardware is not open or uh, you know the hardware is open but then you know the data is not that easy to download and i think again safecast if you consider all these open science components i think it has you know all of them of course including citizen science so i think it's a great example of open science i i do think i do think that um i i'm not really sure if there's like kind of a new kid on the block that's, you know, that's going to take over or whatever. But I do think that like things are constantly changing, new tools are available. And um, I think it's important uh, for any any organization involved in any kind of, you know, activity and especially like kind of like, um, like environmental monitoring, radiation monitoring and scientific activity is really just like, there's this constant evolution. So, and I think there's always this you know, like I think open open data and open source is is great, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't mean anything to the people if they don't know how to use that. Like, I can ha I can put out all my hardware schematics and all my software files, but if they don't understand what it means, then it doesn't. Then there's no purpose. And so I think that you know, and so you know, perhaps the next generation, the next iteration of organizations might be fo more focused on teaching lay people how to use the data to create something that's custom custom for them. So anyways. I actually would add on, would like to add on uh, Akiva and also Marco, um, because I think what Safecast has also demonstrated is how to create an international community 
um, and how to engage various uh, citizens, but also institutions um, into citizen science. And I think that is also a lesson for, for Safegas futures, uh, future projects, but also for other citizen science projects. So, um, to, you know, I like to stray into, into other places, but Marco, you know, one of the things we were very concerned about, um, and this was kind of, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, Ralph Kaiser brought this up, you know, in terms of this free, free societies and democracies, but there are also other places where, uh, we, you know, we've interacted with people and they're very grateful for the device and it's very useful, but they're very careful of, you know, they're not going to be able to submit or use this. So Safecast really is very international. It's, it's brilliant. It's very Northern Hemisphere, uh, and it's got a, a particular subset of a community. What is missing from the um, the uh, uh, what, what? Not missing. Let's uh, let's not sit caging for you. But what could uh, an organisation like Safecast, focused on the the citizen science side of it, do to broaden out actually beyond the kind of very well established democracies, but I think if you look at the map of Safecast data, you can kind of see in you by one lens, you could almost interpret it as a map of political freedom. So for uh, where's the role uh, of the citizen science in supporting people uh, where there's dark spots in that map? Hmm, that's a very interesting point. I think there comes the role of outreach and of dissemination. So while we're now tackling, you know, the community of scientists, which is, you know, excellent, of course, and excellent that, I mean, a community that had no access to data in their own environment. And again, there is a number of examples, right? If you look at earthquakes, it's exactly the same. In many of these countries, you do get sensors coming from, you know, industrialized countries for, you know, a couple of years, and then they go, they are, you know, sent back to, you know, rich countries. So local scientists, they don't own the devices. So that's, you know, great about Safecast. On the other hand, I think there's kind of an awareness, uh, you know, need. So you need to create an awareness about the utility, I mean, the usefulness of this, of this data. So, in, and that's a different community. That's a community of, you know, decision makers. And if you want of, you know, political level, in some way. So we try to do that at ICTP in some of the events. So creating like a short kind of awareness workshop about, you know, the needs and then, you know, getting to the kind of more technical and, and, and scientific level. But I think that that awareness level is very useful. I, I would also say like, um, because like, uh, I, I don't, I think instead of saying democratic, I'd say like there there are political implications to data, because in the early days of Safecast, then um, the government actually forbade anybody to publish data, and like anybody that would publish data would you know had were threatened with kind of being arrested, um, and at that time actually Safecast like uh, Safecast had lost a lot of its sponsorships because of that because organizations didn't want to be associated with um, with uh, kind of somebody like an, an organization that's kind of defying the government. Um, so I do think that there are like kind of political ramifications with uh, data collection and publication. And I think that, um, so I, I don't like truthfully though, I don't know what the right answer is because I don't know if you want to endanger your life in order to publish the data, but maybe in some cases it's important, so. Yeah. Like we we were kind of we were a little bit pissed off, so we just kind of put the data out there, and then, and luckily nothing happened. So. <laughs> you okay? You look like you have something to add. Um. Yeah. I, I maybe I wanted to add um that it's yeah I think Akiba's story and also um, uh yeah that the fact that um Safecast is mostly um, you know, volunteers, uh, volunteers for Safecast mostly come from the northern part of the world. Also has to do with um, paying attention to the local context and trying to see um, where or how Safecast can uh, contribute 
and that may yeah differ from context to context um but yeah it's finding those gaps i, I think as well as adapting to that context I, i'm going to try and sneak in one one last question uh, based on you know what's what's transpired in the last year you know in terms of um social media and you know i, I dislike the term fake news but marco during our school we were we were talking about how to how to equip people to, to question it my my question is if it, when people when, they, when it's quite obvious that sometimes people are willing to just put blinkers on and they're in a tribe and they're going to stick with that point of view can you give it a re, you know only a minute left do you what's your opinion on a, a positive happy outlook for the future of a growing international citizen science community I would again again point out to this open science umbrella concept so I, I I think that would end you know social media and awareness and uh, outreach is included there there is even you know uh, indigenous knowledge so knowledge from the community itself so I think if you stick with you know all these different components, I think that's a good uh, way to be successful. I hope that answered your question, Ian. I'm looking for optimism, so yes. Akiba, and then the last word to Jochen. Um, I think, because I heard there were, in the previous conversations, there's a lot of discussion about the professionals need to uh, do the science, but truthfully, I think, because we're looking at climate change, um, a lot of uh, environmental, like kind of catastrophes and things like that, that I do think that actually it's not just the scientists uh, that can do this. So I think everybody can play a role and you know it's becoming cheaper. You can get all your instruction on YouTube. And I think that truthfully, it's gonna be important to have a lot of participation by non-scientists to augment the science scientists effort as well. Thank you for using the word climate change. I can't believe we've gone the whole day where I haven't <laughs> said that. Just ridiculous. You okay, last word to you before we, we cut to the video. Yes. Um, so I think um, as radiation, but also air pollution, those are topics that really touch upon people's lives and people's health. So there's also the question of the, the right to contribute, the right to um, provide data or to measure um, and I think this needs to be discussed further within the scientific community, but also um, with citizens and authorities involved. And maybe there is also um, a role left for, uh, for example, the European Association of Citizen Science or um, the Citizen Science Asia group. So I think there are many, yeah, the, there's still many discussions left, I think, but it's also exciting to see how citizen science will further develop. I, as everyone could tell, I could keep talking about this, but unfortunately, well, we've got more interesting things in the program. So can I thank uh, Akiba, Marco and Yoke very much, and uh, we'll move on to the next item. So Mary, uh, cue the video, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Ian Kanyo from Kenya. And I'm a scientist, a physics lecturer at the University of Nairobi, and a registered environmental impact assessment and audit expert with the Kenyan National Environmental Management Authority. I became a safe caster in 2017 through a joint workshop organized by ICTP and IEA on environmental mapping, uh, mobilizing trust in measurements, and engaging scientific uh, citizenry. Uh, I and uh, my colleagues from around the world were instructed on how to build the SafeCast nano radiation detector and thereafter uh, I gained competence on how to do this on my own and uh, I became uh, officially uh, a SafeCaster uh, thereafter and started collecting measurements in Kenya as you can see from the illustrations. Uh, back home, uh, we undertake radioactivity research, uh, pre uh, targeting the high background radiation areas, and the green stars uh, shown on the map there uh, indicate these areas which were previously identified uh, through geological and mineral exploration surveys. 
uh, we have also done quite some work in the southern uh, coast of Kenya and um, the safecast uh, detector has been quite handy because uh, unlike in the past where we had just to go and collect samples from the field uh, we have now a detector that, ha that has got uh, GPS and now we are able to collect uh, high resolution and more dense data as you can see from the uh, safecast map uh, shown there and this is what we have been able to achieve in the past uh, two years or so um, uh, we take uh, ground continuous measurements uh, and also uh, in the field measurements and uh, the picture illustrated there is one of my, that of my student collecting data on a river channel it is quite unconventional <laughs> while on a motorbike and therefore this uh, this device has been quite quite of use to our work uh, one of the favorite measurements I may want to talk about is that of Nairobi city and its environs because this is where I reside and therefore I've had a chance to collect uh, so much data in the past and uh, out of this we've been able to establish the background uh, levels and also um, highlight the areas with uh, radiation anomalies as indicated in, on the map there. This is uh, the industrial part of the city where I sent a student to go and do a more uh, detailed survey and out of this now we were able to make a decision on where to collect samples uh, for laboratory investigations to identify the isotopes that may be responsible for these anomalies. So to conclude by saying that the future citizen uh, science projects will likely be influenced by new IoT technologies. Open science will continue to play an important role in engaging non-traditional audiences, uh, aid in decision making and support collaborative research. Thank you Safecast for providing a platform to practice open citizen science. And lastly, I wish to thank you all for giving me your attention. So, welcome back. Uh, lovely video with my former student, in Kanye. Really, really great to see him, and I, I just love seeing these videos. So, uh, the next session is uh, one that uh, really interests me. Uh, I have uh, the subject's going to be transparency, and uh, we're going to discuss ethics, ethics, and social responsibility. Can citizen science foster transparency and where does its responsibility lie? Uh, I'm hoping Claire is there as well. I see Gaston and Nadia. And it, it, Claire is there. Excellent. So uh, yes. Claire is going to be the, 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 the moderator for this. Uh, I'm just going to introduce Claire and then maybe I'll sneak in my comment. Uh, so Claire is a social psychologist specialised in risk governance and communication, an American and longtime French resident. I shan't try my terrible French accent. She has worked as a community or action researcher in almost every country, Europe and Japan and India. Claire has designed and facilitates programs and platforms to support government and civil society organisations, helping them to identify and move toward their goals to understand and govern risk and to create agreed recommendations to improve shared quality of life. I must say, I'm really, uh, you know, I, I wish I could be in every session. Um, I, I'm just going to tout a European project that I've got. Hi to CERN and Lisa. I'm lucky enough to sit on the ethics board of that project, which is looking at use of radioisotopes. So I, I shall be get my notepad out of things that I have to pay attention to, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion on ethics. And uh, with that, over to Claire and the panel. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, yes, so we're going to be talking about transparency, ethics, and social responsibility uh, with my two panelists, Nadia and, and Gaston. Mm -hmm. We're old friends. I think that we may be uh, brought here in our 25 minutes or so to talk about perhaps the impact of information and the impact of access to information and the societal meaning of different types of information and, and uh, information delivery. So the two of you have a, a kaleidoscopic experience. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. And uh, I'll be asking throughout our time together, um, I'll ask Nadia to ground us, if you can, in stakeholder views and needs. And I'll be asking Gaston to maybe lift us up from time to time into perhaps a more abstract reflection. 
So uh, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but uh, my perception of you, dear friends and colleagues, is that uh, uh, you you started out or, or you were strongly in what we could say was the heart of the nuclear establishment in, uh, in Slovenia, Nadja, or in Belgium for Gaston. And, uh, you know, at some time in the past, you started taking some steps left and some steps forward and uh, found yourselves each a new positioning, maybe closer to your, your own spirit. Uh, and it's focused by ethical reflection and, and especially by the notion of transparency. So please, Nadia and then Gaston, would you just uh, introduce yourself in a few words and, and tell about this uh, pathway and this positioning? Yes, thank Nadia. you. I'm very, uh, I'm very happy that I'm with you. Um, basically, uh, I'm coming from Slovenia. I'm physicist, reactor physics, and but I have also a degree in uh, psychology, and uh, I am working in the nuclear sector thirty plus years, in different positions from research institutions, civil servant, uh, the regulatory authority, then uh, at the agency for Earth waste management, which is a national waste management organization. Then uh, now currently I am at the uh, technical support organization. But besides, I'm also the uh, chair of the Nuclear Transparency Watch, which is an international association uh, combining many different uh, non-governmental organizations and other institutions or individuals who are uh, trying to improve the safety in transparency in nuclear area in general. So basically, as you said, Claire, I was doing with the uh, nuclear as a scientist from the beginning and then uh, adopt to the through the to the interaction with the stakeholders uh, completely different to you. And now I think that we 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 in nuclear sector people in nuclear sector really need to to change. And this is already ongoing. And perhaps I will say something more. Thank you. Thanks, Nadja. Gaston. Thank you, Claire. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the I want to thank Safecast for inviting me in this event and to congratulate them with the great work they have been doing the last ten years, and also, of course, with this very interesting and enter entertaining event celebrating these uh, ten years. Well, yeah, backgrounds of well, I graduated as a theoretical physicist and, and a nuclear engineer. And then I, well, almost, well, no, more than 20 years ago, I co-founded the PISA program at the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, the uh, program, the integration of social aspects into nuclear research, uh, because we want to, like, sketch a broader picture of the complexity of dealing with technologies such as nuclear. And then since then, I mainly uh, work as a researcher in ethics of science and technology, half time with the Belgian Nuclear Research Center and half time with the University of Ghent Faculty of Philosophy. And I've been involved, as uh, Claire said, in many European projects exploring the dimensions of, of uh, social science and, and, uh, and humanities applied to a real policy, like, uh, for instance, in waste governance uh, and, uh, and also in communication. Mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps I'll uh, uh, step in here for a moment just to, to uh, say to our friends listening uh, where we where we met. It was 20 years ago. And I'm going to try to share my screen uh, in a, a European sponsored uh, action research called COAM, Communities and Waste Management. And then this is the third edition COAM in practice. And we were working uh, to build a, a platform where citizens and um, institutional representatives could come together and try to find out how to achieve inclusive governance of radioactive waste, waste management. Um, Twelve countries in Europe, at least, and, and here are some of the conditions that we found that would be necessary to uh, achieve an inclusive governance. Uh, we also worked together, the three of us, in the Eagle Project, uh, and we met ASBI uh, at the famous RICOMET conference in 2015, which uh, Tanya described about an hour ago, and uh, she described how ASBI's uh, news of SafeCast um, transformed the, the conversation there. So uh, I'd like to ask each of you, um, 
uh, first of all, have you have you been to Japan? Here we are over in Europe. We were in uh, Japan all night uh, with the Safe Cast 10 uh, celebration. And uh, here we are in Europe. Uh, has either of you been to Japan? And what is your special memory? Nadia? Well, I was in Japan. Uh, there was even one event. We uh, held the, 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 some presentation and lectures with ASBI. Uh, and of course, it's a different society completely for me. Um, but it's, it's extremely interesting, and uh, I, I had just nice memories to that. Gaston. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, maybe, and, and uh, to draw us maybe with my memory right into the, the discussion on the topic, I remember a very important experience uh, from the uh, a conference in, uh, at Fukushima Medical University in 2015. It was the second Asian workshop of the ICRP on the ethical dimension of the system of radiological protection. And uh, I was, we were, there was a, an expert panel uh, with radiation experts. And the discussion was about whether or not to return to the evacuated area where there was still like 20 millisievert uh, a year when you would live there. And, um, and there was one NGO representative, a Japanese NGO representative, asking these radiation experts, would you go back? Would you actually yourself return to that area to live there again? And the first said, I would go back, I'm 65, whatever. And the second said, after some thinking, no. And I think that was a very, very interesting eye-opener for citizens and for NGO people there in Japan, and namely the fact that a scientist who knows the science about radiation and health effects would also be judged, be influenced by his own gut feeling on the situation as such, which means that he was, they were like in unveiling the uncertainties around it and at the same time empowering paradoxically by creating uncertainties, by unveiling uncertainties, they were at the same time empowering the citizens, giving them insight on how they can decide themselves on these situations. So that, that was my uh, most memorable experience in Japan in the context of the Fukushima disaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, bringing, bringing a strong light for you on the many dimensions of decision, the many factors that can enter into decision. And uh, perhaps, uh, you know, those of us who study risk perception, risk communication, all of that, uh, you know, we, we, we can encounter uh, societal actors who, who feel that, you know, good decisions will always be taken if just the correct information is uh, transmitted. And if we look at uh, the Fukushima context over the years and uh, many other contexts, we see that it's uh, much, more, much more complicated than that. And there are individual decisions to be made and collective decisions to be made. Um, I wanted to share my own uh, uh, beautiful memory of, uh, of uh, going to Japan, which was in November 2012 for a, a joint uh, seminar, uh, connected a little bit, Gaston, with the one that you mentioned. Um, and it was called Science and Values, trying to look at how these different dimensions of decision information you know, uh, enter into individual and collective and, and, and larger societal decision-making. And my very special memory is working there with uh, the principal of the Tominari Elementary School in Date City, uh, Satsuki Katsumi-san, uh, who told of how she led her community when they felt that they didn't want to be helpless in the face of what had just happened. Uh, they wanted to improve their conditions. And the friendship, the friendship that uh, uh, she gave me is, is my great memory of uh, Fukushima and of Japan. So we have been talking um, throughout this event about, about SafeCast and especially about open science, citizen science. I would like to ask you, how does citizen science, open science fit your understanding and your definition of transparency. And maybe you can re reflect on the idea of can transparency be achieved? And what does SafeCast contribute to that? Gaston, I'll ask you to go first. Okay, so transparency, I was asked to, to give some 
a little of theoretical background, uh, whether of course I want to apply it to the practices in general and also to the, uh, the, the concrete case of Fukushima post-accident situation. Okay, transparency, we know the traditional understandings, it's uh, showing there are no double agendas. It's making public the liaisons between power holders and stakeholders with the general public and civil society as the most important stakeholders in that sense from a democracy, from a, from a democracy perspective. These uh, liaisons can be inter internal political relations, relations with the private sector and with civil society as such. Another traditional meaning is giving insight in how decisions are made. And then of course, last but not least, giving in transparency can also mean giving insight into how information and data is used. Now, I think it's, mo it's very important to understand that even in these traditional understandings, caring for transparency can still have two essential meanings. Um, the first one would be caring for transparency by giving outsiders, the stakeholders, uh, insights into the working of the power structures. These could be political authorities or private sector. And the second, I think, is more essential. It's caring for transparency by inviting these stakeholders into the powerhouse to participate in the generation of knowledge and decision making. And of course, this is where citizen science comes in. It's a move from caring for transparency to caring for participation. And it is very important to, 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 uh, to see that that invitation is not a privilege for citizens. It's a principle right, as also Joker said in the previous uh, session. So, and when it comes to taking responsibility in the interest of transparency, uh, you may notice that in both cases, responsibility will still be with the power holders because they have to take the initiatives. In the case of citizen science, taking responsibility comes down to inviting citizens to contribute to official knowledge generation initiatives, or at least take their own, the initiatives of the citizens serious. And, and we, know that, right. we know that for in the, in the case of safe costs, uh, it was, I mean, because it was so well organized, the authorities started to take the initiative serious. And in the end, they started to cooperate in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Gaston, I perceived that as you spoke, um, you, you have a, a very um, high principled concept of this invitation made to citizens. But of course, citizens don't always wait for an invitation. Citizens are, are living outside that door. They're not waiting for that door to be graciously opened. Citizens, we are here. And uh, I think that Safecast is, is, you know, we've learned a, really a wonderful story. If, if you know, you were able to watch uh, during the night and, and the morning of Europe, we've we've seen the great story of of how how this uh, this life outside the powerhouse is uh, full of of power and and agency. And you know, I'm going to put, I'm going to build something to put on my car to drive around and learn what I need to know to help my family. Any comment before we go to Nadia? Well, of course, this is true. It's a, but because of that, I precisely use the concept of the powerhouse uh, because mm. um, citizen science, um, all these bottom-up initiatives are wonderful. They're needed, but they are when when they are powerless in in, in, <laughs> in influencing <laughs> when they are powerless in influencing concrete policy, then then mm. it's really a sad situation. That's what I mean. Okay. Nadja, this is a great time to let you and, and also maybe ask you to make the link closely with what Nuclear Transparency Watch is defining as transparency and how to achieve it. But please frame it as you like. Thank you. Uh, I just want to reflect on one thing uh, I experience in, uh, in the case of the repository site selection. Uh, it was organized uh, by the waste management organization very well, you know, open all the doors, you know, uh, providing all different information, participation, building trust and so on. But at the end, when the site was selected, it was just stopped with operation. And it was so disappointing for the local representatives and local population. So they are still having a kind of, uh, you know, uh, problems with anything <laughs> related to the repository. Yes, and the, in the Nuclear Transparency Watch, uh, we are also a member of the uh, new uh, Association of Technical Support Organization. 
and uh, we see the the safety aspect uh, and uh, and uh, uh, citizens so citizens were is one part of the safety assuring safety function so beside the uh, regulatory authority beside the technical support organization and of course the license holders whoever it is for nuclear power plant or for the waste uh, uh, management facility or whatever uh, uh, it is it is a new concept that the citizens and the non-governmental organizations are part to assure safety function in saying that uh, i think that this is quite a novel concept of understanding and of course um, by saying that citizen does it has it has a very generic uh, interpretation so it has uh, uh, inside the non-governmental organization, the activists, the different uh, uh, residents, if you want, or those who are interested. And uh, uh, quite uh, recently, also Nuclear Tra Transparency Watch is now involved in uh, one activity, although uh, supported by technical support organization called Open Radiation, and we will also measure the data very very similar in very similar way and contribute to the mapping of the of the uh, ionizing radiation around the the world so this kind of uh, possibility to involve people really uh, build on the trust and also enable um, the knowledge sharing and as you said you know um, uh, whether a top-down or bottom-up approach, uh, whatever you know, people are there, and they are they are if they are interested, they would do by themselves the activities. You cannot stop them. Mm -hmm. So I think that each of you does have a systemic view. You know, you don't have a linear view of, you know, the, 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 the empowered people on the top and the less empowered people on the bottom. You have an understanding that we're all in society. We have different roles. Yeah, Nadja? I just want to add here because now we are as NTW involved also in one uh, Europe, European level uh, uh, re research uh, program called EURAT. It's a huge program with, I don't know, 100 plus uh, organizations involved. And Nuclear Transparency Watch is now there also to interact with civil society. And in the beginning, it was very hard to go in this, so let's say, nuclear club. Huh? But now we can see changes in the attitude, in the perception, in the reactions, in the discussions. You know, it is changing. It's yes, hard, so but it's changing. This, uh, uh, before I give you the word, uh, uh, Gaston, this idea of, of system means that, uh, you know, everything is, is, is connected in sometimes subtle ways and that there's, there's feedback. There, a change in one part of the system creates a change in another part of the system. And Nadia, you were portraying a, a, a context in which um, maybe all parts of the system are sharing a particular goal or objective, and that is safety or nuclear safety. Um, uh, Gaston, do you have a word to say before I bring us forward? Yes, I want to say something more about uh, transparency, um, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think, and especially in the case of uh, Fukushima as a good example, as an, and as a hard reality, it can have a different meaning still. It is, I think there is a need to create more transparency around uh, the, the existence and the use of scientific uncertainties on how they are perceived and dealt with, not only by scientists, but also by policymakers and activists. And I think the best example in that sense is a case we have been studying in, in within uh, the circles around the ICRP, but also within our own uh, research projects, is the case of thyroid cancer in children. Uh, we know that uh, systematic screening uh, of children leads to detection of cancers that would otherwise remain undetected. This is not only the case in Fukushima, but you would get the same result in any area in the world. We know that. So paradoxically, by trying to do good science, so the systematic screening, you create so much noise on the signal you want to measure that you can't hardly measure anything at all. So 
in these cases, it looks as if science remains perplexed when it needs to advise policy. So especially under pressure to deliver evidence, science has to deal with uncertainties that it possibly cannot clear out within reasonable time frames. So and uh, it cannot really answer the, the simple yes, no questions. In this case, the, the question, is there more thyroid cancer in children because of the accident or not? But that doesn't mean that science cannot contribute. I think it's, it, it, it really it gets a new role. In these cases, science together with the authorities should open up the method and invite citizens and civil society to jointly construct these hypotheses on what is actually the case on possible health effects in this. And I think this is the best way to generate social trust and I think this is perhaps the most advanced form of citizen science one can imagine. Hmm. So you're talking a, about a, a, a learning process and it's a, a joint a learning mutual, A mutual, a joint and a mutual learning process because also the scientists and the authorities will learn uh, in, from dialogues with the citizens, from their own assessments on what these health effects are and could be and from, uh, they're talking from out of their own situations. We know that there was a lot of, of distrust around this uh, thyroid cancer case uh, in Fukushima. And, and by opening up science and inviting citizens and civil society to participate, I think you can really restore this trust, especially around this case. And of course, trust is not an objective in and of itself. Trust is one of the elements of that safety system that we've been talking about. Yeah, <laughs> we're not, uh, no one is looking for trust or if they are looking for trust as a free pass to do whatever they want, uh, that's not trust, that's not uh, going to build confidence in, in the safety system. Um, I'm, I'm also appreciative, uh, Gaston, of what you said that in this mutual learning process, which is done through interaction, through dialogue, through joint work on a third object, that uh, the, the, there's a need to, to learn together about uncertainty, about how we measure uncertainty, about how we deal with uncertainty, how we perceive and become aware of uncertainty and, and work around it. And I think that uh, in, in the last few sessions of the SafeCast 10 event, we've, we've heard a, a, a lot about how uncertainty is, is going on, is being... Um, addressed, known, understood. I want to, to bring um, our conversation in, in just the few minutes we have left uh, toward uh, the uh, what in French we might say the perverse effects of information maybe. And, and here's how, how I'll, I'll be framing it. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of reflection in, in the SafeCast 10 event about how more information revealing what we did not know or what we could not know before about radiological levels. Uh, it can help reframe understanding. It can help reframe decisions, whether they be individual, family, community, or national decisions. Um, and I was really appreciative of um, Peter, Peter Franken's uh, opening uh, reflections uh, last night for me, uh, where he said that the emphasis of SafeCast has not been on measuring, for example, indoor air uh, in my house as an individual, but the, the SafeCast idea is together measuring our common good, the air of our environment, our shared environment outside. I want to uh, say that, you know, okay, more information can reveal what we didn't know and, and help us make better decisions about things that are important to us. But more information also can destabilize our systems of belief. And here I, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, another, another reference, another book. This is something that you can find online. You can find this in, in PDF, Chernobyl, a policy response study. Um, published by IASA, the Institutional International Institute for Systems Anal Applied Systems Analysis, IASA, um, years ago. It's, uh, and, and my husband, Marc Poumadère, has a chapter in this book on how it's called the credibility crisis, but it's about how the bad news of the Chernobyl accident broke a social contract because it suddenly removed the distances between uh, yesterday and today, and between, uh, for example, the safe consumer and the risky world of energy production. And 
we found, you know, years later, we all find that this same kind of rupture of a social contract, of a belief system, of the, the way we, uh, you know, face the world together, uh, the same kind of disruption was found, um, as the Japanese diet report said, when a Fukushima Daiichi accident uh, threw away the safety myth, uh, the legend of safety. So I want to talk now about responsibility. I'm not at all suggesting that, okay, oops, ooh, you know, be careful, too much information. What, what they don't know won't hurt them. Uh, if they do know, it will hurt us. But I do want to ask you now, each of you, about responsibility, thinking about the effects of information and access to information. Mm -hmm. What are the ethical implications of measuring and of communicating radiation levels, whether it be done by governments or by citizens? And is transparency, I'm thinking about your definitions, is transparency always the right thing to aim for? And is there any argument against transparency as we think of this complex uh, world of effects of information? Please go ahead and this will be our, our ending reflection. Who wants to go first? Gaston, will you? <laughs> Gaston, well, <it's> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Well, too much information. I, I don't think there can be too much information. It is. Mm -hmm. uh, it really depends on what the content of the information is. And and we all know. We, we, I mean, we we have. We are now in the era of fake news, as we say. So we can't trust anything anymore. What's said, said on the media. So there is more mediation, more moderation necessary on 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 really distinct from. What is right from what is wrong, and and of and of course I give the best example uh, to show that this distinction is not only not always easy to make. Uh, so precisely because of that, because of that, because of um, well, experts today operate from out of their own uh, social constructs, and experts can so disagree with each other in public. Also, for instance, this happened in Fukushima. It also happens now every day with the with the COVID crisis. When experts disagree in public, the general public will think that one of the two is lying, which is in most cases not true. Both experts will really build their own preferred hypothesis on the same set of inconsistent data they have or incomplete data. This is how it works. And, and precisely because of that, the public should get more insight into how construction of knowledge influenced by values works. And, and, and this is why I say, uh, for instance, in the case of thyroid cancer in children, but with many other cases, uh, the scientific method should be opened up by inviting citizens to participate. Uh, and and the, 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 the idea that experts can disagree, the public, for the first time, got confronted with that fact, now with the COVID crisis. It never got confronted with that so much in the case of nuclear energy or post-accident situations. And the, the authorities, um, and I don't want to deviate too much to the COVID crisis, but the authorities have a huge responsibility to really showing that science is what it is, that experts can disagree based on reasonable arguments. And it is not happening now. I mean, they're, they're losing again a nice opportunity to do it. And they lost it also in Fukushima, except for good initiatives like the ICRP conferences and, of course, uh, the work of SafeCast itself. I'd like to, to comment that we all, we all do know in our private lives and in our social lives, uh, we know all about disagreement. We know all about controversy. We know all about, uh, you know, conflict over facts and values. And um, it, I've noticed that uh, amongst my STEM scientist friends, you know, my hard scientist friends, uh, uh, there's a growing concern with uh, how, how, as you say, Gaston, understanding, well, this isn't exactly what you said, but you brought up the scientific method and asked that it, that it be opened up to have more actors contributing. Um, but the, the idea that uh, uh, a, a certain uh, attitude and a certain habit of relationship to both facts and values uh, lets us cope better with violent disagreement, whether it be over the dinner table 
or in terms of a, a, a controversial uh, fact important for our safety. Can, can, Nadja, I, can I add one, yeah. one small mole? Please, one small and then mole, it'll be all for Nadja. Please, Gaston. Yeah, yeah okay, and then yeah. Nadja. Well, mm -hmm. I've been watching, uh, well, of course, there were several conferences of the 10 years of Fukushima, and I've been watching some industry-led conferences, and I was really disappointed, and that comes back to what you said, Claire, to, uh, to see that there still exists this paternalist understandings of public understanding of science. With radiation levels, even there, the idea was still that the people don't have the knowledge to really understand what's happening there. And that is, of course, like right against the work what SafeCost is doing. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was also, I was also disturbed by seeing um, the industry people being very self-confident in, in how they assessed what happened. I mean, they don't have to apologize in a way, mm -hmm. um, but, but it, some, some form of modesty would have been very, very, very good in that sense. Um, there were no expressions of apology. And what is even worse, there was no reflection on how Fukushima might eventually influence evaluations of the societal justification of nuclear energy as such for the future. There's the assessment really sounded as if Fukushima was just bad luck with some, less, with some lessons learned about technical improvements. There was no modesty, only self-confidence and self-praise with regard to how great they have been in tackling the technical issues. And I really found that very disappointing. Well, so again, there you see, let, again, yeah. the gap between the industry ratios on what happened and what we are doing here now in this event. Safecast, safecast volunteers, keep raising your voice, keep uh, proposing a, a different kind of conversation. Nadia, you're going to uh, take the floor for a couple of minutes and it will be the end of our session. Yes, please. Thank I'm you. afraid I, I, have to, I have to keep you on just slightly. I will be very short. I would just want to mm. reflect two things about the information. Uh, two things are that there are too much information. I noticed that some uh, um, regulatory authorities even are providing too much information, meaning 2,000 more pages of the very complex text, and that they have in mind that, well, we, we provided all the information and now we will see how they will handle it. And mm. the, the, the other thing is that the private sector is not obliged to provide any information. So therefore, the, the only pathway to get information is through the regulatory authorities. And this is, again, very big problem. And I think that everything what is uh, financed but by the public money should be public, whatever, you know. And with this, I would like to, to finish. Uh, really, uh, involvement of people in the safety issues of any of this decision is most important. And when the nuclear uh, uh, industry will open the floor, uh, it will be much better. Over to you, Ian. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. A really interesting discussion. Thank you. I, I, I definitely don't think anyone can accuse Safecast of not having a very big tent. It's really been it's eye opening and it was a really interesting conversation. And we have uh, to move on to the next thing, which is another video. So if I could ask Mary for the cue, please. Bye bye. They are my students, they are come to Armenia, and uh, now we are together doing uh, some measurements with the Big Aiki. I take Big Aiki everywhere where I'm going, and I hope that uh, this uh, Big Aiki will be helpful for, for them, and uh, they will be informed about our, uh, uh, the, our environment in, in Armenia and also about the radiation level in the Armenia. I, uh, told, I learned about the Big IG in Italy when uh, I was learned there. I took participation in short course uh, and the detail of Marco Zenaro, Jan Derby, uh, Joe Morris and Asby Brown. Uh, I get knowledge uh, and uh, build this uh, equipment uh, and uh, I 
I hope that I will be somehow uh, the kind of the lectures that uh, my students will remember me like uh, I am remembering you and uh, have a good meeting, interesting meeting and I want to pass the, uh, the, war, uh, the speech to my students uh, so they uh, continue uh, about uh, to impress their feelings about uh, measuring the radiation. So, Bia, can you talk? Hi, I'm Bia Matthew. I study well, under Miss Marine. Uh, she has given me so much interest into radiology. Big ID is, uh, this is my first time actually working with this equipment, and I'm so excited to be working with this. <laughs> and uh, thanks, for, hopefully, I can work more time with Miss Marine with this equipment, and someday I can be like her. So, thank you. So, <laughs> So I'm Tojin, and uh, I'm a student of um, Dr. Maria in traditional university. This uh, equipment, it was uh, really interesting to see, and she introduced us to this, uh, this uh, instrument and all of this. And uh, we measure all the places uh, by radio, and we deliver the transition of the equipment like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Agrita. I'm a student of Dr. Marie. We are very happy that uh, she made us a part of this. Uh, and like uh, everywhere we are going, uh, it's, uh, the amount is changing. And this is the first time that I am knowing that it's uh, too radiation in some place, it's some in some is low. And I hope she will include us in our, her future, uh, like these projects. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anaina. I'm a student of Marina, Dr. Marina. And uh, before this, we don't know about radiation and all. But right now, I think some acknowledgement about this we got all, all got us. Then I think uh, this equipment is really nice and interesting. I think we all have fun with it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gopika. I'm also a student of Dr. Marina. I'm so really very excited to see this. And uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this. And <clears throat> thank you so much. And this was very interesting because we never know how much radiation is um, around us because uh, daily we are traveling around. And by this uh, equipment, we were able to know how much radiation is around us and all. So it's really very interesting. And I'm so happy to work, uh, study with her. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, in the end, uh, I'm sure that citizen science is the future. Uh, of uh, the science and uh, to know better about our environment. Uh, it's uh, one solution uh, to be involved in citizen science. And I cannot imagine environment to know, uh, to uh, make, uh, to raise the awareness about the environment of the uh, citizen science. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. So, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully Louise is coming on, uh, or am I solo? Uh, no, not solo. Excellent. There we go. And we need Mary as well. So we have to we, we have to give a, a, a massive thanks to uh, it says technical help. Uh, let's let's see technical guru wizard in the back office uh, with it, uh, who all these wonderful smooth. Uh, uh, transitions would not happen at all. I have said the number of conferences I've been at, and it goes twenty-five minutes behind. We've been running one minute behind. I can I, I would never have believed it. So, Mary, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much for your help. It's just been amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's okay. Thanks a lot. Rest. <laughs> yeah, that will be. Thanks a lot. Continue well. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Okay. Thank you so much for Mary and her help. I'm going to remove the spotlight from her there. So next up, we've got um, a great session, which is sort of uh, drawing us towards the other end. So we're going to um, start to think now about um, the sort of bigger question about if it were to happen again, um, what would a good response look like? So at the table, we've got Sanjoy, Sean, Dan is back again, and um, Ian is going to be guiding us through the conversation, uh, keeping us to time, 
And then after that, we've just got a couple of things and we're nearing the end of the um, session as a whole. So um, welcome everybody back to the table if you've been here before. Um, welcome for the first time if you're here for the first time. And Ian, over to you. Thank you very much, Louise. So uh, at least, uh, hopefully people have seen Dan before on at least their session. Uh, Sean has re-emerged having uh, gone for a well-earned rest in between the Japanese and European time zones. And welcome to Sandra, who's joining us for this in session. Um, we're going to touch on many of the things that have been said throughout the course of the day. I did just notice in the ethics conversation, I, made some, I was making some notes, uh, the conversation is going to continue. They were discussing trust. Uh, and I think this is, you know, the, my notes to introduce this session say we discussed two themes in our preparatory discussions, transparency and trust. So hopefully there's some semblance of continuity going through uh, our thoughts here. So what I would like to do is uh, I'll, I'll start by posing the questions, you know, how do we get to a position of transparency at multiple levels, data and organisationally? And just to give Sanjoy an opportunity to introduce himself, I'd like to go to Sanjoy first. Perhaps you could say a few words about yourself and then uh, lead us into the discussion on how, how do we get the, the data and the organisations to a position of transparency? So Sanjoy, please. Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? Uh, could you give me a heads up? Yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Sanjay Mukhopadhyay. Um, I work at uh, Remote Sensing Laboratory at um, uh, in Maryland at Andrews Air Force Base. I work for the um, National Nuclear Security Administration. That's the part of US Department of Energy. Um, uh, my involvement with uh, Fukushima was I was um, feverishly downloading speedy data the uh, you know those projection data and sort of trying to put it on our own database in in terms of mapping um i have some experience with um, uh, radiation monitoring database um i sort of understand what's going on with that um european command uh udip udip system the european radiological um, data exchange platform and I worked on the International Radiation Monitoring Information System that's called ERMIS, that's maintained by IAEA. Um, so I'm very happy that I got a chance to join this uh, esteemed uh, uh, colleagues um, to talk about very important things. Uh, 10 years, uh, it has been 10 years, but uh, the repercussions are still understood. I was there in 2017 in Fukushima and there were uh, you could measure three, up to 300 microsieverts per hour uh, in the um, water duct, you know, the things that are covered with cement and all, but there are a uh, cluster of uh, leaves and things still there, and they are still hot, 300 microsieverts per hour. Um, so with that, I'll um, stop for now. Thank you very much, Sandra. So uh, I, I know Sean is burning to, 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 to lead us off in this one. So uh, Sean, I'm not, maybe you can give yourself a quick reintroduction, although hopefully most people know you, and then just uh, I, I'll let you off the leash and tie you on to how we get to this position of transparency. So Sean, please. Yes, uh, so I'm Sean Bonner. I'm one of the co-founders of SafeCast um, and was around in the you know very early minutes of all of this 10 years ago when we were frantically calling around and seeing who had information and, and what we could do, you know, trying to go forward if there was any way we could help. Um, you know, some would argue this was always what we hoped for, but I think that, you know, if we're honest, we never really knew that it was going to go, you know, as, as far as it did and, and all of this. And, you know, we've accomplished a lot, but I think there's still still a lot more to do. And this is, this is the perfect topic to sort of wrap up, you know, this, this incredible event so far. And I think that, you know, we'll talk more about this but you know our point and my point and all of this you know from the beginning and and still the drum that we have to keep banging is is there has to be more transparency there has to be more openness that's what trust in all of this comes from and without it you know it doesn't matter what anybody is saying because nobody believes it you know and especially if the if the people are losing trust in the information that's being provided um then it's a complete disaster, you know? And uh, the only way that, that that trust is built and the community can understand what's going on is with, with that open sharing of information from the very beginning. Dan, Dan I, I, so obviously we've been talking 
before, but I, I remember you were giving me an interesting story about the, you know, this tran and, and transparency. It's not just the transparency, you know, from say officialdom to to the public, but it's even compart. You know, the, there's the culture of the it's compartmentalized uh, internally. Uh, you you were telling us a story about uh, how you know the path that you had to use. I think you mentioned it at the beginning as well today on publishing the data. Do you, do you want maybe it's worth uh, revisiting that if you wouldn't mind? Hmm, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when we were, uh, you know, as Sanjay said, we were downloading data from Japanese sources, but we were also collecting data, uh, and we were working closely with the Japanese government, and we weren't sure, you know, who owned the data, with whom could we share it. So we, um, I think, in, in hindsight, and we'll talk more about this, but at the time we erred on the side of not sharing as, as widely even at home and you know within the federal government as maybe we would as we would definitely do nowadays. And you know that had, had repercussions. People you know wanted transparency, they wanted to see it and they didn't know why we couldn't share. Um, but then you know once we you know thought about it, um, for example, they took all the data the, I mean the, the reason that we have the data on the safecast uh, website as a layer was we took all of our raw collected data and posted it publicly on the U.S. official website called data.gov, where people could analyze it to their heart's content and do whatever comparisons they wanted. But we did learn the hard way that, you know, if you don't share and you talked about trust, it's, it's very hard to gain trust. And we'll probably talk about this more, but it's really easy to lose trust. And then once you lose it, it's extra hard to, to get it back. So I think we have a good opportunity here. There's certainly a lot of trust in, you know, Safecast and I think we're building trust in citizen, you know, science. So we have to figure out how to keep that momentum going and uh, make it more just part of steady state life. So if I can add you know, just, oh, yep, please. <laughs> um, you know, like in, in this conversation so far, like, you know, over the last few hours, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, what government agencies and, and these, you know, sort of institutional, uh, you know, people should be doing and everything. But I think that an important piece of this discussion of transparency is, is all parties involved, right? And, and I think that uh, there's just as much sort of constructive criticism that can be applied to, you know, uh, activist groups and, and everything in this as well, who uh, selectively publish data, right? In 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 uh, in the guise of of being transparent, right? And and this is this is as much of a problem as not publishing anything, right? If you only publish data that supports the story you're trying to tell, um, that also doesn't build trust, and that also you know makes everything else you do questionable, right? So it, it really is about, um, as Dan said, being able to compare these different data sources, right? Publish good stuff, bad stuff, things that confirms your stuff, things that contradicts your stuff, and put it all together so that uh, the public can look at this and understand what's happening in the bigger picture. And this is where the sort of building blocks of trust come from. The, I mean, the, the, the thought of custom, you know, it's this business of people have their own, you know, my opinions are facts, your facts and opinions, and, you know, I'm just gonna, gonna believe what I want to believe. I'm not gonna go into the realm of politics, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, I just want to bring it back to the question. So, if 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 uh, you know something were to happen again tomorrow, what what would the good risk? What, what would a you know what's our, our good plan? You know, our, our, the document we give to the the government respond where the, it's happening and say this is what a good response will look like. Will you do it? What 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 would we be asking for? What would we be holding them against and wanting to see them do? Is that for me? That's to all of you. That's for, well, that's for everyone. Whoever wants to go first. Go on, Sean. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think I think that what we would say is we want to know what's going on, right? I mean, I think that that everything kind of boils back down to that. Uh, the problems that we've seen or that we saw ten years ago, and that we've unfortunately seen again and again and again since then, even even as recently with you know the COVID response around the world, right? Is uh, governments sort of defaulting to secrecy on things, right? And, uh, you know, just telling people, just trust us, don't worry, we're taking care of it, everything's under control, uh, without providing any information on that. And so I think that uh, 
you know, the most important thing that we can just repeat again and again and again is that the information has to be shared. The plans have to be shared. People have to understand, you know, what they should be expecting to happen, uh, what's happening at the moment, because even if the news, you know, is bad, that at least gives people a context of, of what they should be doing or what they should be thinking as next steps. You know, if, if there's nothing but this kind of rosy story of everything's fine, don't worry about it. We got it under control. When people know it's not, right? That just adds stress and confusion. Yeah, this is Dan. So definitely from sharing everything from the beginning and writing your plan so things are shared. I've visited different countries and, and some have their you know, real-time radiation monitors around power plants live on the internet and some don't because they think if it's live, people will be able to misuse it. But I think the opposite is true. If it's not live, then it just leads to, you know, fear and, and things like that. So planning for how you would share and everything from procedures to how do you connect all the systems? And Sanjay could talk about that forever because one of his big tasks was how do you take information from disparate countries and make them show up in one place and all look seamless together. Yes, yeah, so uh, actually, it's, uh, yes, please enjoy. Yeah, I, I picked up a, a common theme between what Sean and, and Dan said, and that's the uh, this um, uh, whatever we are presenting should support during the accident or pre accident situation should support the plan. So, so the plan of action. So to tie these two together, it makes sense to have some the data on a common platform in in terms of the what we are looking at. So uh, when I was working at, uh, for ERMIS, the International Radiation Monitoring Information System, um, um, we uh, used to claim, and it is true, that these data are born um, harmonized, meaning they're all, all already, the dose rates are already presented in terms of the operational intervention levels of the oils. So having that common understanding that whenever you see red on the map, that is thousand uh, micro sievert per above or uh, thousand micro sieverts per hour, then you need to evacuate. So that also ties that, that data makes sense that it is like Dan previously, the other day mentioned actionable intelligence. What do I do? Data in itself presented on a map doesn't tell us much, but unless we guide people that these, um, uh, at this stage, you have to take some action. We do that routinely also in the US EPA, we have the um, Environmental Protection Agency guidance. And that tells us at this um, stage, you, have, uh, you do, uh, can do relocation. At this stage, you can do sheltering. So the presenting data in that format makes it very apparent. So things jumps at you. Um, that one thing I wanted to bring up. The other thing I wanted to, uh, in terms of gaining trust, um, we don't talk this uh, much about, but in, in this common uh, citizen generated data, there has to be some sense of a column of validated data and a column of non-validated data so that people gain uh, more confidence from the validated data. And then there's a lot to be done um, by, uh, you know, that a lot of work will go behind validation. And the other okay, thing- so can, I, can, I, can I jump in there exactly at that point? So who, you know, who watches the watchers? Yeah. So we, we, we've, we've just introduced the concept of a, validate, of a validation field uh, in, the, in the presentation of a transparency of data. So who gets to say valid or invalid? What, what, what's the answer to that, Sandra? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, in my mind, I'm, and it's open to discussion, that uh, if you generate the data, you, you should be able to validate it. I mean... If not validate, at least uh, caveat it. Like, you know, these data were taken at 30 meters uh, or 10 meters above ground uh, from fire stations or something. This was automated system. These are the things that was measured. Um, so 
Uh, I think it's the uh, validation depends on the generator. Otherwise, it becomes an untractable uh, problem. And also, if if you're validating, it has to be against some, you know, well documented guidance. Is if if you have let's say one group, let's say you have some official organization trying to validate some citizen science data, and they say oh, a lot of it's invalid. And then you probably have the people who collected it are saying, oh, they're just trying to hide our data and sweep things under the rug. But if we all agree upon, here's some criteria for validation. Mm -hmm. and, and we've done this on the official side. I know, I mean, SafeGas has you know, some, some guidance on uh, what, do, what data are valid. There's obvious things that might make you wanna throw out data. If, you know, the GPS is wrong. It shows up in the middle of the ocean. So there's simple things and there's a little more complex things, but as long as it's you're talking about transparency, as your validation steps are transparent, then you know any trained person can apply them. Yeah, I think Dan Dan makes an excellent point. You know, we try to publish what are what are what we think are best practices. What criteria are we using to say whether something is is trustworthy or legitimate or or invalid for some reason? If it has a flag on it, that's a concern. But we still publish everything, right? So we say here's here's everything, and here's the chunk that you know, we have a question about one way or the other, and then here's the criteria of why we have a question about that. We're not doing that behind closed doors and then just telling people after the fact, oh, okay, here's the final stuff. Because again, you know, hiding that bit of the discussion opens the door for, you know, all kinds of conspiracy about what's happening behind that door, right? So we're, right. we're just, you know, we're, we're moving through time. I do want, we, we had a second thought in our, in our conversations, which was, you know, how to build the trust in the data and the organization. And it was the concept in the discussions was that the data needs to be actionable. And we mentioned it at some point in time, saying so if the data, if you can't do anything with the data, basically what's the point of it? So uh, what I'd like to ask is, well, what, what do we do with, you know, we've discussed this all day, the entire process, collecting the data, it's got quality assurance with it, it's, collect, it's, it's handled, it's transparent. You know, what, what is it that this, this, this golden package of uh, an actionable data item, what, you know, how, do we, how does it get there? It, 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 in well, the hands of a decision maker. So, I mean, besides the, the, the management of it and, and how do you visualize it, one thing that I've noticed in the radiological field is that people, you know, don't necessarily understand what they're looking at. Um, even if we do, as Sanjoy said, let's make, you know, red is always the same thing. But if somehow, or if, and I, I think this is not in the, the physicist side, but in some in other specialties, but how do you present it in a way so it's no different from other technical information that people are familiar with? I mean, a lot of people have talked at talked about looking at, you know, hurricane path plots. Um, I mean, those people look at all the time and they don't actually understand them, but, um, or weather maps. If you can make it so that radiation isn't this arcane thing that's treated and displayed separately from everything else. I mean, it's a hazard and people have to take protective actions. So it's the, the human interface. If we could work on that, I think it can become more actionable. I, I've I've never heard that point of the weather map before. I have to think about that. That's that that's that that intrigues me. That one, Sh Sean, you 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 look like you have a. Oh, I safety. just I mean I, I agree with that, right? And and I think that that one of the one of the issues is um, there's there's a little bit of a you know a sort of default position of trying to do everything, which kind of creates some of these conflicts sometimes. And I think that. Uh, you know, maybe what we what we need to do is, you know, encourage these kind of different, um, you know, sort of practices with different groups and different organizations and things, you know, like, not everyone has to collect, publish, analyze, and, you know, everything, everything all together, right? Like, maybe there is a value in, in distinguishing, here's collection, here's analysis, Here's commentary, you know, like different different things, so that those pieces again are open. People can look at them and understand what's happening, and not think that um, you know someone's sort of trying to do the thinking for them. In some cases, it's like the weatherman on the nightly news doesn't run the weather models. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Is speaking of weather models, I mean, you know, these days the saying goes, like your database is only as good as the metadata it contains. So it does, I mean, yeah, Depta is to do that, to have the, you know, little bit of weather data incorporated on the back layer of the radiation monitoring data. I mean, then you can, uh, you know, and that goes a long way in educating um, citizen in terms of common traits of uh, environmental radiation. Um, like you can show the radon was measured high when there was a rainfall. And, you know, looking over a large uh, area of regions in Europe, um, we could actually follow the weather moving in um, by uh, uh, correlated gamma, elevation of gamma to straight. So um, I think incorporating a layer of uh, weather data now, a lot of discussion has to go on in, you know, what averaging has to take place and how often you will freshen the weather data. Um, may explain the data better and gain trust in return uh, on, the, on your database. That's just my thoughts. No, it's good. It's very good. So I'm, I'm going to sneak some, it's something in from left field because it's occurred to me during this. So. And it, and it comes to me in the map, you know, we've got dark spots in the map. So I don't, I don't think we can, you know, we kind of know what we want. We want transparency. But let's, let, let's rephrase the question slightly. What if it were to happen in a place where it, it was dark in our map? So Safecast want to help a new group from something bad happens. Uh, what would be the kind of, uh, you know, rapid advice to the, the Sean, Asby, Peter of, Ten, you know, and Dan, 10 years ago, and you can pick up the phone and say to them, right, here's a quick brain dump of everything that we did wrong and that you could do better than we did. I, I, welcome, I welcome that. <laughs> somebody, somebody tell me. <laughs> we're still trying to figure it out, right? I mean, I think that that's a huge piece, right, is that we're still learning as we go, right? I mean, I think every, every bit of this we're fine tuning and revising and, and trying to take a better step tomorrow than we took yesterday, right? You know, one thing we don't consider in emergency response is the human ingenuity. I mean, uh, a lot of criticism were made that um, when the power was down and, um, you know, they had to um, bring the coolant up somehow. People tried to run out to the parking lot and try to get the car batteries to power uh, generate power to get the coolant going again. So that will stand. That's that's humanity, and that's going to always be with us. And uh, in in the spark of the moment, the best thing you can hope for is that somebody make a, you know, I mean, you cannot depend on it, but that kind of force in action will take place. Um, and I hope that, you know, the next time it happens, I mean, we would be definitely more uh, ready. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I think there'll be huge application of drones and robotics so that um, you don't directly involve people in the process and expose them. Dan, as it, as it happens, I, I gave you the first word at the beginning. I'm going to give you the last word at the end. So if, if it happened again tomorrow, what's the good, what, what's the, so the good if, advice? Yeah, if you say what we have done differently 10 years ago that we should do, yeah. Um, I think if you go into it, knowing that you're going to, to share data and share it quickly, then you'd have systems and procedures in place so that you know you're collecting it and validating it and you know, while you're analyzing it and trying to think of all the complex protective action decisions, you know, your validated data is already being shared and, and posted. Um, so, you know, when we were sharing data and thinking about it after the fact, there are some things that, you know, if we'd done ahead of time, we could have done the fast, like, who do we consider the official owner of the data? If it was our data or Japanese data or US military data, if we go in knowing that, you know, it was when you, Get the data from someone you ask the question up front can we share it yes or no and that actually becomes you know a, a data field shareable yes no just like validated yes no 
So that's one thing I would do, at least on the transparency sharing side, I'd do differently. Yeah, I think one one thing that we, that we've learned, you know, a lot in the last ten years is that it's much easier for all of these steps to happen if it starts open. You can start open and then close something along the way, but it's it's very difficult to open things up if they start off closed. Uh, I'm going to let be the end of that session. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for 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 doing that. I, it's been you know. We think about it all the time, but it's it's lovely to have a, a conversation, and uh, I think it just brings the threads of lots of discussions together uh, that have happened throughout the day. Thinking about the data, but at the end of at the end of it, the point is uh, the organisation thinks about uh, the transparency of data, and as Sean rightly said, there start from the premise of trying to share what you can, rather than deciding to start close and share it afterwards. You get a different outcome. Um, so we're going to sneak in a, a, a piece of music. Asby, I hope you're you're ready to go. Um, if I could have a, 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 a just a wee confirm from somebody that Asby's get ready to queue up the video. Yes, we uh, This is a, a piece of music that was commissioned uh, as it happens by my uh, daughter's uh, clarinet teacher. Uh, she's a very gifted composer uh, based up in uh, the north of Scotland, and uh, I don't know if you follow the videos, but Sean has got a very interesting music project related to the Safecast, Safecast.live, I believe, Sean. No idea if I'm wrong. If I'm, yep. So this music has been a really big part of, of the event today. And uh, when we knew we were doing this, uh, I, I asked uh, for, uh, Christina if she would be interested or willing to uh, compose a piece. And she said yes, and has got three extremely talented musicians to uh, perform for her. I will just say one word about her. You can read the bio, but she calls herself the, a, a nuclear child, uh, and it, it, you know the, this piece of music is uh, you know in solidarity um, uh, from her point of view with the community where uh, I live up in the north coast of Scotland now, uh, with the people uh, uh, who experience the, these tragedies. Uh, and I should emphasise uh, that she, uh, Christina, says that the last piece, uh, the piece of Koriyama. As the, as the data has got better, because she's been inspired by the data, there is an optimistic note towards the end of the piece of music. So Asby, if I could ask you to uh, play the piece, I'd be great. Um, I think we just, I just want to add that, yes, this music was composed based on a set of data that I sent her from uh, different locations around the world, uh, uh, demonstrating changes over time. Uh, I will share the video now.
So I, I really appreciate that, and uh, I hope you you all enjoyed it. And I hope I know Katrina's online, so I hope Katrina enjoyed seeing it. So uh, we do have a few more safecast stories. So I'm just going to go straight to one more story before we, we get into our, our wrap up. And there's a, there might be a couple more during during the last half hour. Or so so we are we are very unfortunately had to leave. So we are now on my slightly ropey um, internet connection in Northern Scotland. So wish me luck as I try to share one of these videos. So here we go. Hi everybody, my name is Jesus Peña Rodriguez from Colombia. I am doing my PhD in physics in the area of myography. I became a site caster in 2017 when I traveled to Trieste to take part of the workshop on environmental mapping. In this workshop, we learned to construct the big Kagan nano detector and analyze the data. One of my favorite instruments using this detector is the study of cosmic radiation in air clouds. We carry out an experiment in two folds. One measurement from Munich to New York and another one from New York to Bogota. We found a direct correlation between the latitude changes and the cosmic radiation. I think city size plays an important role in our communities because encourage people to analyze data in order to understand the environmental behavior. In the same way, we need to release more data to people and teach them how they can analyze and interpret it. Thanks SACAS and ICTP to give me the opportunity to share you in 2017 to know new people, new colleagues and make new friends. Bye. So uh, it worked, I hope. Yes. Excellent. Um, we have we have two more. Would you like to do them at the end, or do you want to sneak another one in? It's good to see. Let's. Uh, I think let's go for. We'll have one question because I have two questions for everybody on the call. Uh, so I'm going to go for one question, then we'll have a video, and then we can do the last question, and we can end it there. So uh, I'm actually going to spotlight myself so you can see me. That's probably helpful. Um, so thank you so much, um, everybody, for joining. I'll do proper thank yous at the end there, but um, I just want to get uh, the sort of original Safecast team together. Um, they're all in front of you at the moment, or most of them. Um, and I just wanted to have your final thoughts before we go into the next video, um, just on, uh, you get one line each, I'm going to be mean here to you because I know you guys are chatters, so one line each on your final thoughts of how the event has been for you today. 
So if I go to um, Peter first. I, One line, I, would, Peter. I would say it's, it's been very inspirational. Um, and uh, uh, in, in many ways, we started this 10 years ago as individuals coming together. And today I saw so much inspirational talks where people have taken our, you know, individual thoughts and taking them to the next level. Uh, I, I thought it was just fantastic. And uh, yeah, I've been, you know, I, I woke up this morning very early and, uh, and we have been running around and I've seen, you know, of course, we have been watching the car driving around. We had a lot of guests. We had all the wonderful discussions that we just went through and familiar faces and new faces. And I, and, and you know, when we, when I personally started this, there was no other objective as I think in, a, you know, there's some moments ago we talked about, you know, it's really about your personal personal concerns, but you can broadcast that to 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 many others around you. And I'm not sure why Joe is laughing, but because there's probably sticking something out of my head that shouldn't be sticking out of my head. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there later. Are you guys are back channeling or what? 